Mr Dawson. Good morning, my lady. Today's witness is the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. I do solemnly, I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare, sincerely and truly declare, and affirm that the evidence I shall give, and affirm that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Nicola Sturgeon. I am. You very helpfully provided two statements to this module of the inquiry, as well as a number of other prior statements. Uh, the statements you provided to this module are uh, under reference INQ 000 339033. Uh, this is a statement dated the 6th of November 2023. Is that your statement? It is. Have you signed the statement? I have. Do the contents of the statement remain true and accurate as at today's date? Yes. You also provided a further statement to us under reference INQ 00273980. This was a further statement dated the 16th of November 2023. Is that your further statement? Yes. Have you signed that? Yes. Do the contents of that statement remain true and accurate as at today's date? Yes, I provided some further information to the inquiry last week, uh, which would usually be read alongside that statement, but yes. Thank you. Some additional documentation rather than changing the text of the statement, I think. Indeed. Thank you. You were the First Minister of Scotland between the 20th of November 2014 and the 28th of March 2023. I was. Uh, you held office as First Minister throughout the period from January 2020 to April 2022. I did. Uh, that is, of course, the period of time with which this module is primarily concerned. As First Minister during that period, you were head of the Scottish Government and so had overall responsibility for Scotland's pandemic response and for engagement with the UK government and other devolved administrations. I did. Could I ask you uh, some questions, please, uh, about uh, the way in which you and others within the Scottish government uh, used informal methods of communication uh, in order to discuss uh, matters uh, connected to the pandemic? Uh, in your statement dated the 16th of November, that's INQ 00273980, at paragraph 48, you say, throughout the pandemic, I sought to be open, transparent and accountable in respect of all decisions being taken, while acknowledging some of the issues presented by the sheer pace and magnitude of what we were facing in early 2020. I set out in my module 2A statement the high degree of formality around Scottish Government decision making. Decisions were informed, shaped and taken mainly through deep dive sessions, gold discussions and cabinet meetings. I feel that the nature of the communication that has emerged from the UK government has created an impression that we were all communicating in such a way. That was not the case, certainly not as far as communications I was party to are concerned. The culture within the Scottish government during the period in question was serious, formal, purposeful and collegiate. During the pandemic, I did not make extensive use of informal messaging and certainly did not use it to reach decisions. Is it still your position today that you and the Scottish Government were open, transparent and accountable in your actions, not just in your words, at all times throughout the pandemic response in Scotland? Um, yes, that is still my position. Um, openness and transparency with the Scottish public uh, was very important to me from the outset of the pandemic. I communicated uh, to the public on a daily basis for a, a lengthy period of time. Um, we will not have uh, got every decision right and we will have made misjudgments and there will be uh, undoubtedly instances put to me today where on reflection I will think that we could have been more transparent than we were. Uh, but given the nature of the emergency that we were confronted with, building a relationship of trust with the public was important. And in my view then, and in my view now, that had to be built on a spirit of openness. Openness and transparency are fundamental concepts in the way in which the Scottish Government uh, seeks to represent the people of Scotland, isn't that right? Absolutely. Um, one can see, as we've seen it in a number of documents, more general documents, but also one specifically related to the pandemic response. For example, the national performance framework, one sees those concepts 
repeated, I think, in that document. Is that correct? That is correct. And indeed, in documents uh, which we have looked at, which set out uh, the approach which the Scottish Government wished to take to the way in which it was dealing with the challenges of the pandemic, again, one sees the concepts of openness, transparency, accountability at the very core. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and as far as a role, a very important role that you played was concerned, the public communication strategy, again, these concepts were very much the bedrock, I think, of the way in which you tried to communicate messages, information, decisions to the public in Scotland. That is what I sought to do. Um, you say in the passage we've looked at that you did not use informal communications to reach decisions. What, did you, what do you mean by that? Informal communications uh, were not in any sense uh, an extensive or, or a meaningful part of how I conducted government business in any way, but certainly not to reach decisions. And I would say that in relation not just to COVID, but to government generally. Uh, the number of individuals uh, with whom I would have any uh, informal communication uh, through, I'm talking here about text messages or WhatsApp, yes. uh, would be very limited. Um, in the case of WhatsApp, probably no more than a handful of people. I was never a member of any WhatsApp uh, groups. Mm -hmm. And I think the two people that I uh, would have had the most extensive communication with would have been uh, my former Chief of Staff, Liz Lloyd, and uh, Hamza Youssef. Uh, I believe the inquiry has uh, some messages between me and those individuals, which I hadn't retained, but mm -hmm. uh, they had. And I think they will give a sense of the nature of that communication. Uh, the communication of that nature was not used by me for anything other than routine exchanges, uh, logistics, passing on information. Uh, the exchanges with the individuals I've referred to will be uh, littered with things like, you know, there's a note coming to you through the system. I'm giving you a heads up about that. That's the, the nature of the communication. I understand the inquiry may want to explore some elements of that, and I will, of course, answer questions about specifics, but that is the overall nature uh, of that communication, extremely uh, limited. And uh, I operated on the basis that I would ensure that anything in communications of that description uh, were otherwise uh, recorded on the Scottish Government system, uh, if there was anything of that nature. We've heard others refer to recording salient information on the corporate record. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. So if there were, and this would be rare in my case because of what I've said, I did not do government business uh, through informal messaging um, in relation to COVID or any other matter. Um, but if there were salient points of substance, I would ask myself, is that reflected, recorded? in the Scottish Government's uh, record, um, either because I had put it in or it was referring to something that was already on the record. If somebody was, as I uh, used as a, an illustration a moment ago, flagging up something that was coming to me through the system. Uh, you know, another example, in my exchanges with Hamza Yousaf, uh, he would, uh, for a period when vaccination was such a focus of all of our efforts, he would send me on a daily basis the, the vaccination uptake figures, uh, which would, within a very short space of time, come to me formally and be published. Uh, so I would check whether uh, there was anything that uh, required to be recorded on the, the Scottish Government system. And I uh, am absolutely uh, firmly of the view that there is nothing, and the inquiry has seen some of uh, these messages, in any informal messaging that I would have been party to uh, that could not uh, have been uh, seen and understood through uh, the formal systems um, and indeed through the public communications that I was engaging in on a daily basis, where um, I uh, went through in great detail, some people perhaps thought too much detail sometimes, uh, the issues that we were confronted with and, and dealing with on a daily basis. So just to be clear, to reconcile two parts of your evidence there, you said you didn't use these uh, informal messaging systems, but I think you suggested that there would rarely be occasions when you would have to transpose things onto the corporate record, which suggests that you at least rarely use them. 
Uh, so, sorry, just to be very clear, I, I have not said, and, and I'm not saying today that I never used yes. uh, informal means of communication. Uh, what I am saying is that I did so very rarely and not uh, even more rarely to discuss issues of substance uh, or anything that could be described as decision making. I, I, I'm sure we'll come on to the, the formal ways in which the Scottish Government took uh, decisions later on, but there was a mm. high degree of formality around the decision making of the, the Scottish Government. Thank you. Um, you. You mentioned a moment ago that there would be routine exchanges undertaken via these uh, media. Um, do you accept, based on at least the communications we have seen, that um, you, you did uh, undertake discussions around what decisions might be taken through these media? Uh, there would be a, a, an element of reflecting on the decisions that we were having to make. Um, but I was doing that openly in daily briefings uh, with the public. Uh, so I would not be reflecting in any way where I was, um, I suppose, engaging in some secret uh, course of discussion that I wouldn't be sharing openly mm. during that. So yes, there would be, and I think there have been some exchanges discussed at the inquiry in previous evidence sessions where uh, you know, I am saying about a particular decision, I'm not sure in my own mind, you know, what the right way to go is. But that would be something that I was trying to formulate in my mind before a formal cabinet discussion uh, where cabinet would take the decision. Um, and, you know, that is the extent of that. So other exchanges would literally be, um, I think, in the exchanges between myself and, and Hamza Yousaf, uh, things like I, I've Mr. Yousaf saying to me, I've, I've just been taken, I've just taken part in a Four Nations call. Uh, the note of the readout will be on its way to you if you want me to give you a call to you know, brief you on that before you get it. I'll do that. So that is the nature of the, the communication that I would routinely, and I again would say it would be limited, uh, that I would routinely have. Thank you. We, we heard evidence, as you may be aware, from uh, one of the directors general within the civil service in Scotland, Ms. Leslie Fraser. Um, she was responsible for um, the compilation uh, of a number of different Scottish government policies around uh, information and document retention. And she accepted in her evidence that the primary aim of those policies across Scottish government was to try to make sure that um, a reasonable amount of information was retained in order to be able to give any interested Scottish citizen the material from which, amongst other things, they could deduce how decisions had been taken. Um, do you accept that the messages that, you, uh, that we, we have seen from others contain information that an interested Scottish citizen would like to see in order to uh, understand how decisions were taken in the pandemic? Um, I for, forgive me, uh, Mr. Dawson, if I uh, perhaps haven't seen all of the exchanges. Well, of, of course. Um, but I, I am not sure I have uh, seen uh, exchanges that have been discussed at the inquiry where I would uh, accept, uh, and it, it may be that I'm showing some today where I do have to accept this, but that I would accept that the interested uh, member of the Scottish public couldn't uh, see the not just the decisions that were being arrived at in the Scottish Government, but the, the reasoning and the evidence behind those decisions from the public record. Um, I, as I've referenced already and is well known, so I won't labour the point, uh, almost every day during the pandemic, I would openly uh, share with the public the, 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 the state of the pandemic, the uh, difficult choices that was posing for the government, what we were considering in reaching these decisions, what it meant for uh, what we were asking the public to do. So there was a very open uh, form of communication and I, I, I'm not sure I have seen anything that I would say the Scottish public just wouldn't have had any idea that we were talking about that or considering that. It might be a matter for the Scottish public to judge, of, based of course, on all of the information of that was relevant to these matters, whether they felt that they had seen all of the information that they needed to be able to draw conclusions about the appropriateness, timeliness of your decisions. Uh, of course. I, no, I, I, let me uh, be absolutely clear. I, I accept that. And, of course, it's for the inquiry to judge uh, whether yes. that is the case. Um, uh, simply uh, sharing my views. Um, but, I, again, and I... 
I, I repeat this because I, I do think it is uh, significant and material. Uh, the, the means of communication, the, the method and the frequency of communication that the Scottish Government was engaging in uh, meant that on a daily basis, it, it was almost a, an open conversation with the public, which we thought was important to encourage compliance with what the public were being asked to do. Um, so, you know, the, these are public statements and the, the question and answers after it would go through uh, not just the decisions we'd arrived at, but we would go through the, the considerations, the, the balances we were trying to strike, the you know, pretty invidious nature of some of the choices that we were all being faced with then. You referred in the passage from your statement that we went to, um, to the fact that uh, it had emerged publicly through the procedures of this inquiry that a lot of this informal communication had been done within the UK government, by WhatsApp in particular, but by other means as well. And you suggested that um, you felt that the nature of the communication as emerged from the UK government has created an impression that we were all commuting, communicating in such a way. Um, we, we have, um, fortuitously, by way of example, seen very extensive exchanges between the now First Minister and Professor Leach discussing their attitude to important moments within the pandemic, uh, important decisions they needed to take, important advice they required ultimately to give to you in Cabinet and other fora. Um, it, it appears from that, and indeed the other messages which have now come to light, that informal messaging, in particular WhatsApp, was a frequent part of the way in which the Scottish <coughs> Government conducted its business in COVID. Were you unaware of the fact that that was the case as First Minister during the course of the pandemic? Um, the exchanges you refer to, I would have had no knowledge of and had no sight of uh, before seeing them in the course of this inquiry. It, it, if you're asking me, Mr Dawson, would, did I not know that anybody in the Scottish Government was using WhatsApp? Of, of course, that's not the case. WhatsApp had become in my view, probably too uh, common a, a means of communication. Uh, but I think the exchanges you're talking about um, would, certainly from what I have seen, uh, would not suggest that government decisions were being taken through WhatsApp. WhatsApp was a, a means of communication uh, that people were using uh, to exchange information on occasion, sometimes to, to share views uh, about things and, and using language uh, and or rather ways of describing things that perhaps uh, wouldn't have been done in different forms of communication. One of the, the reasons, and if I thought this before um, COVID and uh, this inquiry, I, I certainly think it even more strongly now, one of the reasons why I don't believe that WhatsApp, for example, should be used for government communication um, and decision making is that you know, when I make a public statement or when I made public statements as First Minister in this context, I would think very, very carefully mm -hmm. about the words I use to try to minimise as far as is ever possible the scope for what I was saying to be misinterpreted. When people send messages on WhatsApp, they don't think, including me, you don't think that deeply about how you're phrasing things. And therefore, messages, when you, they are looked back at later <coughs> on, can be open to different interpretations because people haven't really thought about the words they're using or the, the, the phraseology that they're using. Um, and I think that certainly would be true of some of the exchanges that the inquiry has been looking at. Would you as First Minister not have thought it to be important that ministers and senior officials would think deeply about the conduct of government business, whether conducted through WhatsApp or otherwise? It, of course, it, that is the case. And I, in, in saying that, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that people were not thinking deeply. The, the form of, and I think every, every human being probably can recognise what I'm saying, the form of communication can uh, influence the, the phraseology or the way they, in which things are, are worded. Mm -hmm. And informal communication, I think, lends itself to very short, sharp um, exchanges that would be very different if you were making a speech or, or putting something in a formal paper for decision making. Can I you know, say very clearly, um, when I was First Minister, I would not have expected any of my uh, ministers or any of my uh, officials to have been conducting substantive government uh, discussions and certainly not taking government decisions uh, through 
WhatsApp or other informal means of messaging. Thank you for that. Um, on the 27th of May of 2020, as we covered with uh, Mr Swinney yesterday, in the Scottish Parliament, in response to a question about whether you would order a public inquiry into the COVID-19 outbreak in care homes in Scotland, you replied as follows, of course there will be a public inquiry into this whole crisis and every aspect of this <coughs> crisis, and that will undoubtedly include what happened in care homes. So at that stage, you knew that there would be a public inquiry in the future into the Scottish Government's response to the pandemic generally? I always assumed there would be a public inquiry. In, in fact, of course, as we know, you effectively had the and, power to, and, and to order Indeed, an and, and uh, as, as it turned out in Scotland, we have more than, than, than one inquiry, so yes, yes I, I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the 3rd of August 2021, uh, Leslie Fraser, who I mentioned a moment ago, and another civil servant whom you'll know, uh, Mr Kenneth Thompson, sent a Do Not Destroy email to Scottish Government officials with the subject COVID-19 Independent Inquiry Record Retention, explaining the importance of retaining relevant material to the work of the inquiry. Do you recall receiving that email? I do not. Uh, as far as I am aware, I did not receive that. Um. You recall, I would imagine, in a general sense, that, that such, a, such a notification I, was sent out? I, I would say uh, this, that I, I don't think I would have uh, required to see that, to know that uh, matters that were uh, relevant to matters of substance, salient, relevant to the inquiry, should be uh, retained. And that, that I had a duty, as all ministers and officials would have had a duty, to ensure uh, that anything that they were exchanging in informal messaging, uh, if they were uh, not retaining those messages in line with uh, the, the policies that were in place, uh, then there would be a clear record of anything uh, on the Scottish Government systems. You said on the 24th of August 2021 at a Covid media briefing given by you that the Scottish Government had started the process of setting up the Scottish Covid inquiry, which we mentioned a moment ago. You stated, I believe that a full public inquiry has a very important role to play, both in scrutinising the decisions we took and indeed continue to take in the course of the pandemic and also in identifying and learning lessons for the future. Uh, do you agree that in order to scrutinise decisions and learn lessons, a public inquiry would need to see not just the decisions themselves, but the discussions that led to the decisions being made or not made, uh, including discussion of information and advice? Um, yes, I, I do agree with that. And uh, what I would add to that, and let me say this is obviously a matter for the inquiry to judge, um, in terms of any informal communications I had, which, as I have already said, were limited, both in terms of the number of people and the extent of the, the communication. Uh, there would be nothing in those communications that was not uh, available to either the inquiry or the public through the record of the Scottish Government or, indeed, in the very detailed uh, public statements that were being made every day. I, and I, I want to assure the inquiry uh, of that, that I take and took very seriously uh, the duty uh, that was on the shoulders of, of me as First Minister and of the Scottish Government collectively to make sure that this inquiry and the corresponding Scottish inquiry uh, would have at its disposal all of the evidence and material that would allow it to assess the decisions and the underpinning reasoning and evidence for those decisions. Um, over the course of the pandemic, and forgive me if I'm getting ahead of your line of questioning, uh, we will no doubt talk about cabinet uh, papers and, and minutes. Over the course of the pandemic, um, I think there would have been in the region of 100 cabinet meetings. For each of those, there would be detailed papers, detailed minutes that would not just record the decisions that cabinet reached, but that would look at the different options we uh, assessed and, and discussed that would narrate the evidence and the reasoning behind the decisions we arrived at. And in Cabinet Minutes would also have lengthy and comprehensive summaries of the, the points made in the discussion around the Cabinet table. Now, I, obviously that is not all that the, the inquiry has uh, at its disposal, but if it was all that this inquiry had, that would be a comprehensive and very detailed account of every uh, decision that the Scottish Government took in the course of the pandemic. Um, as at May, at least, I think you've indicated already, you were fully cognisant of the fact that there would be a public inquiry. 
Yes? Yes. Um, and in August 2021, you, you announced that there would be one? Yes. Uh, you knew at the time when you made the statement announcing the Scottish COVID inquiry that uh, material uh, which you had used to exchange uh, messages, informal communications, uh, would assist in the very important aims uh, of the inquiry, scrutinising the decisions that you took? Yes. And you knew at that point that those messages had been destroyed? Uh, I had... I knew, yes, that I had operated in line uh, with a policy uh, that I had operated in line with and advice that I had had from the outset of my time as a minister uh, to ensure that uh, conversations with uh, others in government with any uh, impact or, or relationship to government business shouldn't be kept on a phone that could be lost or stolen, but properly recorded. And I was very cognisant of and had been from the start of the pandemic, so not just at the, the points in time uh, that you are referring to from the start of the pandemic, of my duty to ensure that anything of uh, salience, uh, relevance, substance to the decision making of the government would be properly recorded through the Scottish Government record. Thank you. Um, you were asked a question by a journalist from Channel 4, um, it, it, where he, he asked you at, at that very press conference in August 2021, Scottish Government has a patchy record of disclosing evidence when asked to do so. Can you guarantee to the bereaved families that you will disclose emails, WhatsApps, private emails, if you've been using them, whatever, that nothing will be off limits to the inquiry? You responded, I think if you understand statutory public inquiries, you would know that even if I wasn't prepared to give that assurance, which for the avoidance of doubt I am, then I wouldn't have the ability. The, he asked specific questions about informal means of communication, including WhatsApps, uh, but you knew by that stage that your WhatsApps had been destroyed. But I also knew that anything of any uh, relevance or substance from any of that material uh, would be properly recorded in the Scottish Government system um, and indeed uh, would have been communicated in all likelihood uh, by me uh, through the, the daily uh, media briefings that I gave. Uh, the importance, uh, in my view, is making sure that the inquiry has at its disposal all of the evidence underpinning uh, the decisions as well as the decisions we were arriving at. I operated uh, from you know, 2007, uh, based on advice, uh, the policy that uh, messages, business relating to government should not be kept on a phone that could be lost or stolen and insecure in that way, but properly recorded uh, through the system. I, I would want to, again, uh, underline that in, in my case, uh, that communication uh, was extremely limited, and I do not... Uh, I you know, would not relate uh, to matters of substantive government decision making. But that wasn't the question you were asked. You were asked the question as to whether you would disclose emails, WhatsApps, private emails, have been using them, whatever. You didn't ask you the question as to whether the material that was contained within the discussions uh, exchanged by those media was recorded on the corporate record. He asked whether the emails, WhatsApps, private emails, whatever, would be disclosed, and you gave an assurance that they would be. And I, you know as will have been the case in uh, many occasions uh, over the course of uh, not just the, the COVID pandemic, but in my many years in politics, answering questions when you're answering questions, you're trying to answer the substance of the question. And when you look back at the literal terms of the answer, uh, it can be put to you in, in that way. So I accept that and I apologise if that answer uh, was uh, not as clear. Uh, but I also want to be very clear and give the inquiry uh, a, a personal assurance uh, that I am certain uh, that the inquiry has at its disposal um, anything and everything germane to my decision making during uh, the, the process uh, and the, the time period of the pandemic and the factors underpinning uh, those decisions. That has always been important to me um, and it remains important to me, but more importantly than that, it's essential to the scrutiny of the decisions uh, that I will carry the impact of these decisions uh, with me forever. And I want to make sure that those who come after me in politics uh, have the, the benefit of the learning, uh, the things that my government did right and the things that my government did not 
that were not right or with hindsight that we wish we had done differently. I cannot uh, say strongly enough how important that is to me. Uh, these decisions were of a magnitude uh, beyond what I had ever experienced, and that is true of decision makers everywhere, and uh, the, the impact of them. Um, I think about literally every day, and I want this inquiry and the Scottish inquiry to scrutinise those decisions so that we can learn and future governments can learn appropriate lessons from them. In case there's any doubt on the matter, uh, Ms Sturgeon, when I delivered the opening statement in this module, we, we were keen to try to make it clear that our position with regard to those decisions was that they were extremely difficult decisions. Yeah. And there, there, I think there can be no doubt about that. As regards your production of documents, however, you did not produce to us any uh, WhatsApps, messages or any other informal communications with your first statement dated the 6th of November 2023, despite the request that you do so. Um, I, at the time, for the reasons I have set out, I did not hold um, WhatsApp messages or, or text messages at that point. And I, uh, as I have said, uh, because I had gone through a process of making sure anything of relevance, which would have been very, very limited, I could assure myself would be available through the public uh, record and the, and the Scottish Government uh, record. Um, when I was asked to double check um, when the inquiry uh, sent another uh, request for a statement, um, I discovered uh, a isolated text message with one individual, the then Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, which I uh, provided to uh, the, the inquiry. And I also found, and I again, I apologise to the inquiry because I hadn't uh, at the time thought to look in this place because it would not be a, a normal means of communication. But I, uh, when I was racking my brains to see where I could find anything that might be relevant, I looked at uh, the DM function of Twitter and found there uh, some messages with <coughs> Professor D.V. Schrider and also some very limited messages with Professor uh, Jason Leach, which I then provided to the inquiry. Um, I also uh, sought uh, and was provided through the government with messages uh, between me and Liz Lloyd and Hamza Youssef, which I was aware the inquiry would have from, from them, but nevertheless, because I then held them, uh, passed them to the inquiry. Um, there is one exchange... Um, in the Twitter uh, DM messages with Jason Leach uh, that I think gives an indication of my approach to informal messaging, where he is uh, raising something with me. And I think it is the last message in this exchange. I, I, in terms, say to him, if you want to talk about matters like this, come and see me properly. This is not the place to do it. And that was my attitude to that kind of messaging. So was, should we take that to be an instruction to Professor Leach that if he wanted to carry out such conversations where he was discussing important matters related to the pandemic with you, you wanted to be clear to him that that was a matter which was not appropriate for these yes. uh, media. It should be done more formally in person. Discussions was your practice. Hey, absolutely. And, and that was I, I made it clear to him that that was my practice. Um, I think uh, the, the exchange was, was related to hospital capacity and, and ventilation mm. uh, facilities in hospitals at an early, yes. a relatively early stage of the pandemic. Yes. Of course, Professor Leach, we know, conducted extensive discussions related to important decisions in the pandemic with others, including the current First Minister. I, as I, I know you will appreciate, I have only seen exchanges okay. that have been uh, explored at... Uh, previous evidence session, so I cannot talk in any way about the totality of those messages. Yes. Um, I have not seen, to the best of my knowledge, um, anything that would suggest he was engaging in decision making. Um, there are exchanges, uh, conversational exchanges. Uh, it's, you know, many of these exchanges uh, that I have seen and from other governments as well, I think on WhatsApp would be Exchange, the kind of exchange that had people not been working uh, remotely and been in the same building as I actually was with uh, key advisors and, uh, throughout the pandemic, these are the kind of conversations that would have happened verbally, mm. face to face, and end up being <coughs> translated to WhatsApp because of the nature of people's working environments. Given the fact that you were in St Andrew's house, I think, quite a lot of the time, as we heard from Ms Freeman, 
uh, as she was. Um, there were a large number of those verbal conversations between you and others, like Ms Freeman, who are based predominantly there during the pandemic. Isn't that right? Uh, yes. I mean, the, the, the majority of the conversations uh, that I would be having with uh, certainly Ms Freeman uh, and uh, the chief medical officer at, at the time and you know, other uh, senior advisors would be face to face in St Andrew's House. I uh, was in St Andrew's House from very early in the morning till very late at night, uh, almost every day uh, for an extended period of time, as were these other individuals. I think Ms Freeman did say seven days a week you're, you're uh, For a much. period, seven days a week, yes. yes. Um, were the salient points of those verbal discussions uh, committed to the corporate record? Uh, yeah, so at my private office were also, uh, or uh, not my entire private office, but key individuals in my private office, and they would have a rota. There would be somebody from my private office uh, in the building with me. Um, so salient points uh, would be uh, recorded as appropriate and, and fed through the system. I think perhaps, if, if I may, there's, there's two further points uh, to be made there. If I, as First Minister, I'm having a discussion with anybody that then requires action to be taken, if that's not re uh, inputted to the system, action won't be taken. That is how uh, conversations turn into to actions that uh, are necessary. The second point is just to reflect, um, particularly in the very early stages of the pandemic and in the early stages of, uh, well, certainly through March uh, and into April 2020, there was a frenetic pace of decision making. Um, and we were taking decisions at very uh, short notice. Uh, we were, the situation was changing uh, several times a day uh, and we were all working at pace. Um, you know, I would have conversations uh, in the morning, that by the afternoon the situation had changed, and so the nature of of those conversations would be different. And I think it's you know three four years on, it is difficult sometimes to appreciate just how frenetic uh, the pace of activity was at that time. The fact that you're working at pace though doesn't alter the obligation to make sure that salient points of conversations and messaging are on the corporate record. Oh, no, absolutely. But, for example, I remember on the 23rd of March 2020, the day uh, that we entered what became known as, as lockdown, uh, having conversations uh, that because the advice uh, that was coming uh, at that point was that we uh, required uh, very strict measures to suppress uh, the virus at that stage. The measures that had been introduced previously weren't bringing the R number down sufficiently. Uh, I remember having conversations with Ms Freeman, the Chief Medical Officer at the time. Um, we then, of course, went into COBRA um, and those decisions were formalised through the COBRA meeting and they'd be recorded uh, that way. So I suppose what I'm saying is the ways in which these, these conversations would become decisions and then be recorded was perhaps uh, different in the, the environment we were in at that point than would be the case in normal times and, and normal government business. Whereas with these verbal conversations, it, it wouldn't be possible for us to work out whether the salient points of those had been transcribed to the corporate record, because although we might have the corporate record, we don't know what the conversations were. In contradistinction, we do now have some messages, so we could compare the corporate record to those messages and work out for ourselves whether the salient points had been transcribed. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely sure that you would be able to take messages and go to the corporate record, go to the public statements that were made at the time and see all of that reflected. It may not be the case that in every instance you will see, you know, conversation between uh, on this date uh, and the, the reference in, on the corporate record tying those up absolutely. But I am absolutely certain that the salient points that we were discussing then uh, would be reflected on the corporate and indeed on the public record. These were, by their very nature, these were decisions that could not be kept secret, even if we had wanted to, which we didn't, because these were decisions that uh, were asking the public to do things or more regularly not to do things that had to be communicated. Uh, they were also decisions that had uh, you know, very significant impacts for 
the private sector, for the public sector, for society as a whole, they had to be recorded in a way that they could be actioned and communicated clearly, quickly and effectively. That may apply to the decisions themselves, that they couldn't be kept secret because also ultimately the public found out about them, the restrictions and everything. However, the discussions relating to the decisions and how they had been reached could, it would appear, be kept secret. Um, well, I, again, I, I would like to give a, an assurance to the inquiry that contrary to any, to, to there being any desire on the part of me or my government to keep things secret, I would, I, I would suggest that the opposite uh, was the case during the pandemic. We went to great lengths uh, to communicate not just the decisions. I, I, I took a view very early on in the pandemic, uh, it's for others to judge whether it was right or wrong, that if we were to uh, achieve a level of compliance with the restrictions that we were placing the country under, then it was important that the public didn't just know what we were asking them to do, but why we were asking them to do it and what the reasoning was that had taken us to those decisions. And that's what I sought to do, sometimes effectively, perhaps sometimes not so effectively, on a daily basis. So there was, we were not having discussions that weren't then being communicated to the public openly. In the nature of not just government, but, but life generally, you know, it is not possible to record and I'm not even sure it's desirable to good governance, uh, if I may say that, to record every single word that is uttered in a conversation in government. There, there needs to be in government, and I think this is in the interest of good governance, the ability for ministers uh, with each other or ministers with advisers to, to have an open, you know, thinking out loud discussion before getting to the point of a proposal, let alone a decision. Um, but salient points about why we were taking decisions and what those decisions were. Absolutely, uh, to go back to, I think, the question you, you initially put to me, Mr Dawson, absolutely, I firmly am of the view that they will all be uh, discernible from the corporate government record and, indeed, over and above that, the public record. You, sub we subsequently learned from uh, your second statement that you had used... Uh, means of various informal means of communication for some messaging with uh, Mr. Youssef, Ms. Lloyd, Mr. Swinney, Ms. Freeman, Dr. Calderwood, Dr. Smith, Professor Leach, Ken Thompson, Leslie Evans, Professor Sridhar, the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, and the former Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill. Is that correct? Uh, yes. You produce no messages with any of these individuals with your, with your first statement. Is that correct? Yes, but. As I also say in the statement, um, those messages would have been extremely limited. If I uh, take John Swinney, for example, uh, it has never been our practice, um, not just during the pandemic, but generally to text. I don't think I've ever WhatsApped John Swinney, um, and certainly if I have, it would be the exception. Uh, uh, but text messages would be very occasional. And the nature of the text messages that I would have with John Swinney would be, uh, are you free to speak or um, can I pop in to see you? Uh, it's just never been in the nature of it. With some of the others, Catherine Calderwood was one of those who was in St Andrew's House with me. The, the number of people in, in the Scottish Government, the th however many thousands of people work in the Scottish Government that I hold a mobile phone number for is extremely limited. Mm. It was not my method of communication with Mark Drakeford uh, and Michelle O'Neill. These are uh, you know, discussions with other uh, government leaders that would have been recorded through the, the normal systems. Um, so I, again, want to be very clear that it was not my practice to not just not take decisions through informal messaging, but have substantial uh, or lengthy or detailed discussions about uh, government decisions through these means. It's not my style, it's not my practice, it's never been my practice, not least because I don't think it is a good or effective or helpful way of, of reaching decisions, not just taking decisions, but it's not a helpful process in reaching decisions either. WhatsApp messages between yourself and Mr Yusuf and Ms Lloyd were produced by you with your second statement. Where did you get them? Uh, they were provided uh, to me through the Scottish Government. You, you obviously didn't have those on your own devices because no. you deleted them, hadn't you? 
I didn't retain them in line with the, the, the procedure I've already talked about. Are you creating a distinction between deletion no, and not retaining? No. Um, you had deleted them, had you not? I, I think de deletion, I think, um, forgive me, I, I think sounds as if it was a sort of, uh, you know, not bothering to check whether I, any information was being retained. I was very thorough, and not just in the pandemic, but in all my work in government to ensure uh, that things were appropriately appropriately recorded, but in line with the advice I'd always been given since my first day in government, properly, probably, was not to retain mm. uh, conversations like that on a phone that mm. could be mm. lost or stolen and therefore not secure. But did you delete them? Uh, yes. And as far as the other messages are concerned that you couldn't produce yourself uh, between you and all these others, you deleted all of those as well? In the manner that I've... Uh, and after the process that I have set out, yes. You also produced some um, direct Twitter messages that you've already mentioned with um, Professor Leach and Professor Sridhar. Professor Sridhar also produced those messages to us, although slightly later than you, at the beginning of December. Did you have any discussions with her about the production of those messages? Um, I think I let her know that I'd found messages and would be providing them to the inquiry. So there was contact between you and her related to the messages? I, I simply as a courtesy to let her know, yes. Could I have a look, please, at INQ 00027766? We're both being admonished, I think, Ms Sturgeon, for speaking too quickly for the stenographer. So I, if we can both try and speak a little more slowly, that would be very much appreciated. Um, this is, uh, these are some extracts from messages uh, between yourself and Ms Lloyd. I'm starting with the one on the 27th of October 2020, 7.10. Um, so just reading through them, it says, I'm having a bit of a crisis, this is you speaking, I'm having a bit of a crisis of decision making in hospitality, not helped by the fact I haven't slept. The public health argument says stick with 6 uh, PM slash NO alcohol, no alcohol for level three, but I suspect industry will go mad and I worry we could derail debate, though I suspect that won't happen and we could commit to listening and changing if we felt necessary. To which Ms Loy's replies, replies, my instinct is 6 PM. That's the same as Central Belt now, but some more places open. They have offered further mitigations, so we work with them on delivering those extra mitigations and review at that point. She then follows up, the only alternative would be 8pm, but no alcohol. Restaurants would like you for that. To which you say, it's the same as non-central belt. Places can open, but only for food, non-alcohol. 8pm would be better. I guess, that, I guess, but not sure we can make much of a public health argument for 8pm alcohol at level 2 and 8pm no alcohol at level 3. Ms Lloyd replies, that's why I would stick with 6pm, but if you want to compromise, it would be about giving people regulated places to be in the winter, rather than unregulated homes. But no alcohol, because it changes behaviour. The difference from now would basically be it's colder and it's darker, so people will be less likely to be outside. You say, OK, we should prob, prob stick with 6. It's also random. But I think we need to be prepared for a bit of backlash. I've also queried whether we really need the last entry times, and if we do, if we should give on 9.30 slash 10.30, as it stands, there's nothing we can point to to say we've listened to industry. Ms Lloyd replies, level 2, 8pm is listening to 8pm is listening to them. And then she follows up, and the whole allowing restaurants and pubs to stay open, you say, I, propose, I suppose, and then she says, there's quite a lot recently. I mean, they'll still be grumpy, but there it is, I think it's meant to say. Um, this is an example of a messaging exchange that would be relevant to uh, someone who would be interested in knowing how decisions in this regard had been arrived at. Uh, yes, but I, I, in many respects, I think this uh, exchange illustrates uh, the answers I've been giving you for, for context, and uh, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, um, but I think this is 7.20 on the morning of the 27th of October 2020. That's I think correct. I was on my way to a cabinet meeting. I would be in the car uh, from Glasgow. Um, these would be decisions that cabinet was about to arrive at. And I am simply talking about the things that I would then go into cabinet and we would talk about and then would be recorded through the cabinet minutes um, and the decisions that we took. I was probably later that day standing on a public platform uh, talking about some of the, 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 the decisions that we'd faced, the options that we had and why we had arrived at the decision uh, that we have 
arrived at. There's a, I can't see it right now. There's a, a reference in there to I have queried. That's a reference. That's something I had obviously fed in as a, uh, a question to the advisors who would have been preparing the cabinet, the cabinet uh, minute uh, papers. So, in a sense, I I look at this, and I don't consider that there is anything in that that wouldn't be reflected through the decision making uh, and the evidence of the decision making of the government and undoubtedly uh, hospitality and the impact of hospitality, the, uh, the uh, different time limits, that was all uh, very, very much to the fore in public discussion at the time. And I am certain that I would have been talking openly about some of these uh, choices and the fine balances of the the very difficult decisions that we were having to take. Will we find on the corporate record or some other public record that your position was we should probably stick with six? It's all so random. But that's the, the, the message exchange Mr Dawson starts with. Um, and again, I, I, I said earlier on, the reason I don't think WhatsApp messages uh, should be used to have substantial government discussions is because we can look at them for almost four years later and, and they're open to different interpretations. That message exchange that you read out uh, started with me, you know, perhaps uh, this is the kind of thing I, I would prefer not to be on the public record, having a crisis of decision making, it, you know, perhaps is not what I wanted uh, <coughs> people to, to, to know and that I hadn't slept. I, at the 27th of October uh, 2020, uh, wouldn't have had a day off in since, you know, much much earlier that year before uh, March, um, and had been working. I'm not saying that for sympathy. That is that was my job and my duty. Um, and there were moments in that where the decisions that we were taking felt almost impossible. That whatever we did, uh, we would cause difficulty and harm to to somebody uh, somewhere. And so a phrase like it's all so random, that probably simply reflects how I felt at 7.20 that morning uh, when I hadn't had much sleep. Uh, but by the time I got to Cabinet, I'm sure that I would have collected my thoughts and that we then had a proper discussion and reached a decision that was properly recorded um, with a good uh, and robust process around it. This is a discussion related to an important decision made during the course of the management of the pandemic. That would have then been discussed at Cabinet and recorded through... Uh, you, you've seen all the minutes of, of, of the Cabinet, but the, the minutes of, of, the cab, of, of all Cabinet meetings, they don't just record the, the decision we arrive at. They will record if there's a paper given different options, they will record that. And they record uh, a summary, a pressy, of the, the discussion and the points made in these discussions. Does that record record that your position was as it stands? There's nothing we can point to to say we've listened to industry. I, I, I would um, reg. So I, I don't have the, the the cabinet minute from that date um, in front of me, but I absolutely am certain uh, that around this point in particular, um, I will have uh, spoken not just. Uh, in cabinet meetings, but publicly about uh, the need to listen to industry, uh, to listen to different groups uh, in Scottish society uh, as we arrived at the decisions. We were trying to take decisions that none of us wanted to be taking, uh, and we were trying to reach those decisions in a way that we thought struck the right balance. I'm sure we'll come on to talk later on about the four harms approach that the Scottish Government took. And in that, we were listening as much as, as we could to different viewpoints. Uh, we were not always able to take account of those viewpoints because of the nature of the decisions. So, you know, I am absolutely certain that it would have been uh, not news to anybody that we were struggling uh, with the impact on industry of some of these decisions and that we were at pains to show that we, as far as we could, given the nature of the decisions that we were taking, we were listening to reasonable points that were being made. Do you think that an interested member of Scottish society, or indeed this inquiry, should 
take no interest at all in the process by which this decision is made and this discussion's role in it, including the fact that you say it's all so random. There's nothing we can point to to say we've listened to industry. Ms Lloyd's response. Ms Lloyd's involvement in the discussion, either generally or in relation to this specific issue. Oh. No, I, I, I'm not saying the inquiry should have no interest um, in that. On, on the contrary, I think the inquiry does have an interest in this, and I think the wider Scottish public uh, would. What I uh, am saying is I do not uh, accept that it would have been unknown to the public at the time that these were the issues we were grappling with. Um, every day I was taking the public through the different issues that we were grappling with, the, the balances we were trying to strike, the trade-offs that we were having to make, and the different viewpoints that we were trying as best we could to balance. So, you know, in a sense, this is an example of an exchange that, you know, we look at it now in a, a WhatsApp, but I, I don't consider that there is anything in that exchange that would not have been known that was either on the, the record and through the Cabinet minutes or in public statements, that these were exactly the kind of issues we were trying to reach uh, considered uh, and balanced judgments on. Thank you. Um, could I take you to another document, please? This is INQ 00026801.7. This is a, a, another exchange. This is, in a, this is not a group that features you, but it's a, another piece of evidence that we've seen. And I, I'd be interested in understanding your reflection on some of the content of the exchange. This is um, in your capacity as the former First Minister and First Minister at the time. This is in a WhatsApp group chat called COVID Outbreak Group. These uh, messages were provided to the inquiry by uh, Dr Jim McMenamin of uh, Public Health Scotland, who did not delete his messages, uh, and not by the Scottish Government or its officials. In the exchange at uh, 27th of August 2020, uh, you'll, you'll recognise, no doubt, the individuals involved. Uh, Ken Thompson says, just to remind you seriously, this is discoverable under FOI. Know where the clear chat button is, to which Nicola Stedman replies, yes, absolutely. Uh, Jason Leach uh, points out DG level input there. Uh, Mr Thompson says, plausible deniability are my middle names. Now clear it again. Uh, Jason Leach says, done. Nicola Stedman, me too and someone called Donna Bell and me. Um, were you aware in your capacity as First Minister that these sort of exchanges took place and that a senior member of the civil service considered plausible deniability to be his middle name? Um, I, as you said at the outset of the question, I was not a member of this group I've, of until some of these exchanges were explored in evidence sessions last week. I had never seen uh, these messages before. Did I know that there would be WhatsApp groups where officials were exchanging in information? I'm not sure I was particularly conscious of it, but I would have, uh, had I been asked to stop and consider that, I would have said, well, I, I would assume so, given the nature of how people yes. were working. Um, I would absolutely expect all officials in the Scottish Government uh, to retain, in line with Scottish Government policies, information uh, relevant to our decision making. Um, I look at that exchange and I, I, what I don't see is an exchange about you know, the, the decisions we're taking. I see a, a light-hearted uh, discussion between uh, officials. Ken Thompson, I know, has been before you and has given his uh, interpretation of that, so you know, he, he can answer and has answered for himself. I would read that as him reminding people of the need to be professional um, on WhatsApp, uh, even when discussing light-hearted things. The other thing I would say about all of these individuals on the screen before me um, is that they are all, in my uh, knowledge and experience, and with some of them, particularly Ken Thompson, uh, this is extensive experience. They are public servants uh, of the utmost integrity. Um, and at this point and throughout the pandemic, uh, they were public servants who were working in a, a committed and a dedicated fashion uh, in terms of the hours and the pr they were working, the pressure under which they were working above and beyond probably uh, the call of duty. Um, Ken Thompson is somebody I've worked with throughout my time in the Scottish Government and he is a, a civil servant, as I say, of the utmost integrity uh, and the utmost professionalism. This uh, group was called Covid Outbreak Group obviously connected to the COVID pandemic, yes? Uh, I, if that is what you're telling one, me, yes. One assumes, yes, it, that is the name of it. One yes. assumes, therefore, it's to do with COVID outbreak group, mm -hmm. to do with COVID, and therefore uh, relevant to the pandemic. 
Um, what Mr Thompson does here uh, is that, despite recognising that material in this uh, chat is discoverable under freedom of information legislation, is to tell other individuals in the group that they should clear it or delete it. Is that not correct? Uh, that is what is in front of me, yes. Could I just go a little bit further down, please? Just, I'm, I'm just tracing the messages down to 1617, um, so very shortly after um, the exchange that we've had. There, at 1617, so this is just a, a couple of minutes after, further down, you can see in the background other uh, what happens in between. Um, there is something which Jason Leach says at 1617, which is redacted. And then Ken Thompson says, the information you requested is not held centrally. Um, is that a phrase you recognise? Of course it is, yes. Is that a phrase which often appears in freedom of information requests uh, when uh, documentation is requested from the Scottish Government? Yes. Uh, is it a phrase which indicates, uh, as a result of a request, the Scottish Government is not in a position to be able to provide the information it might otherwise because it doesn't actually hold the information in yes. its central repository? Yes. Does it look to you that this is Con Ken Thompson suggesting that that response is an excuse often trotted out by the Scottish Government in response to freedom of information requests? Um, I absolutely accept that's an interpretation that can be put on it. I, uh, it. These are not my words. Of course. This is not an exchange I'm involved in, so there is a limit to how far I can go in trying to interpret what uh, he meant by that. In looking at the exchange, my interpretation of it, which may or may not be correct, is that he is reminding uh, the others on the, um, in the chat uh, that the kind of things they are talking about, they probably shouldn't be on a, a chat like this. You know, somebody says, I was a nippy teenager in 1986, for example. That's the nature uh, of that. Um, again, all I can repeat about Ken Thompson is that he is a civil servant, in my experience, who took the uh, responsibilities around recording um, and uh, making sure that the government record uh, was complete extremely seriously. He's uh, one of the civil servants in my experience that was not just most experienced in that, but that uh, was most assiduous in that side of things. So I can't uh, answer uh, for him. I can speak uh, about my experience of uh, him and I can give an interpretation based on the context of that, that that was meant to be a light-hearted comment, um, but that is only my interpretation. For, forgive me, the, the other thing I would, I would say, I, uh, like many people, given, and I can reflect back to this time, our discussions in government were very serious. There are times when they were extremely sombre. There were days when they were very, very dark, uh, given the nature of what we were dealing with. And because the public as a whole were going through unimaginable trauma at the time, many of them still living with that trauma. Reading now light-hearted light exchanges, I think, can be very difficult because it, it gives an impression that people were not taking the situation seriously. That could not be further from the truth. I think what you have there are public servants who were working incredibly hard to take the best decisions, to support ministers to take the best decisions to keep people safe, who were you know, perhaps as is human nature occasionally engaging in light-hearted light comment to try to probably get themselves through the day? That's my interpretation of what's before me, but I appreciate uh, others may arrive at a different one. If it were ultimately to, 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 to be determined that there was a culture of plausible deniability, a culture of uh, deleting uh, messages that would be recoverable under FOI requests, um, a culture of suggesting in order to get out of FR requests that documents are not held centrally. Uh, these would be abhorrent Absolutely. revelations, would they not? Absolutely. And, and to be very clear, that is not uh, the culture uh, that uh, I uh, believe existed in the Scottish Government uh, during my time as First Minister, or indeed uh, in my time as Deputy First Minister. And if those things were deemed to be the reality of your time, the culture in your time as First Minister, that would be a serious breach of the bond of trust between the government and the Scottish public, which we discussed as being very much at the cornerstone of your whole approach. If, if that was the case, and, and let me yes. repeat, it is not my view that it was, then yes, what you're putting 
to me would be true. Uh, I would, again, and, and you will take me through, no doubt, lots of documentation later, uh, but that single page, and I'm, I'm sure there will be other pages of WhatsApp messages that you could put in front of me, I would counterpose to the, you know, in the region of 100 cabinet papers and minutes that properly seriously recorded uh, the decision making and the, the underpinning rationale for the decision making of the government. The bond of trust between any government and the public at any time is of paramount importance. Um, but this was particularly the case during the extraordinary um, an unprecedented situation we faced in the pandemic. And it was, it was something I felt uh, to my core um, every single day of that. Um, we saw in um, messages that we looked at in some detail with Professor Sridhar that you had um, suggested to her that she might contact you by, I, via either your SNP email address or your government email address. <coughs> um, was the suggestion that she might use your SNP email address an appropriate thing to have done in the conduct of your um, <coughs> government business? Um, it, it, in reflection, perhaps I shouldn't have done that, but if I had been trying to direct her <coughs> to a, a, a personal email, SNP or otherwise, to keep something off the government system, then I, I would suggest I wouldn't also have given her my government email address. I, I wasn't, and uh, obviously the, the inquiry has looked at that <laughs> message, I wasn't pushing her in one direction or the other. What I was saying this was, uh, I, I think, from memory in, in June 2020 or thereabouts, uh, at still a very, very uh, tough, critical phase of the pandemic. Effectively, what I was saying to her is, if there are things you think I should know, don't stand on ceremony. I'd rather mm. know. And at that point, I was, as I think any responsible decision maker should have been, I was trying to deepen my knowledge. I was trying to learn as much as I could about the virus and how to combat the virus. I, I was desperate to understand different perspectives. I was desperate to understand as much as I could from the experiences and the responses of other countries. Now, let me be very clear, the bulk of that was coming to me through uh, Scottish Government advisers. But I had a thirst to understand as much as possible. And I simply wanted uh, her. She was somebody who had been appearing in the media a lot. I was periodically asked about views that she had been expressing in the media, and I wanted to have an understanding, a deeper understanding of, of what they were. But if I'd been in any way trying to direct her to a private email address, I, I doubt if I would have put my government email address in there as well. Um, and all, of course, the context of what we were talking about was, I think, a paper that she was sharing with the wider advisory group. At no point did uh, Professor Sridhar send me anything that was, you know, for my eyes only, that wasn't either publicly available information or information that was being shared with the advisory group she was a member of. I think we have seen some emails now that were very recently produced to us by the Scottish Government uh, between yourself and Professor Sridhar, um, which do, I think, as the, the, te the direct message exchanges suggest, indicate that she was forwarding on to you policy papers, which I think your position is that those would otherwise have been made yes. available to you. Is that right? Do I, have I got that right? Yes, they, they, these were, she was a member, and yeah, I know the inquiry is aware of this, she was a member of the Scottish the Government yeah. COVID-19 advisory group. Um, and these were papers she was preparing for the group. What the group did with them or what uh, weight it gave to them, that would be for the group to answer. But these were not things that she was sending preparing for mm. me and sending to me alone. There were simply copies of things that were in wider circulation. It would, one assumes, be in accordance with the normal practice of the group, that the group would decide whether that needed to be sent to you rather than Professor Sridhar, isn't that right? Uh, possibly, yes, but at that point, and if, if, this, if this was the wrong approach to take, Mr Dawson, I apologise. At that point, in dealing with an unprecedented situation and a pandemic. I wanted to understand as much as I could. I wanted my decisions to be as informed as possible. I read um, perhaps one of the reasons why in the early exchange I was saying I hadn't slept much. I, I, I read extensively from public sources of articles and, and research studies online. I was trying to understand as much as possible and as, as quickly as possible. And I, I took the view if somebody could help me with that, if somebody could send me something that I would otherwise see, but I, I might see. I, I'm, I'm not even sure, with my apologies to her, that I would have necessarily read everything she, she sent me because I might already have seen it or I would perhaps not think it was particularly relevant. But I, I had 
a desire to have as much information in order to deepen my understanding of the situation we were facing as, as I could. And, and while there are things we may talk about today where I think if I was to go back and have my time again, I would take a different decision, mm -hmm. I hope I wouldn't take a different decision on that. It was important to me to be as informed and as educated as I possibly could be. You used a personal phone for the conduct of government business while First Minister, is that correct? Uh, I, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you never used a government-issued phone, is that right? Mm -hmm. We've heard evidence from a variety of ministers that they seem to use phones from a variety of different sources, some Scottish government, some personal, some Scottish parliament-issued phones. Is it appropriate, in your view, as the former First Minister, that ministers are conducting business on phones that are not government-issued phones? Um, it was never suggested to me at any time during uh, my period as First Minister that it was not appropriate. The reason I used a, a personal phone was that I, I didn't want to have multiple devices. Um, a government phone, I wouldn't have been able to do uh, constituency business or party or personal matters. And you know, on a constituency one, I can do the other. So you, you get the picture here. Yes. So I wanted to have one device. It was never suggested to me that was inappropriate, um, and I don't believe it was inappropriate. Um, I think any phone, whether it is personal, parliament, government, is vulnerable to being you know, left on a train or, or lost somehow, which goes back to points I made earlier on about the, the practice and the policy around how information is retained in government. Um, we've been made aware of an article which appeared in the press just yesterday suggesting that um, your expenses claims indicated that on the 19th of March you purchased a phone and a number of SIM top-ups. And the article also suggests that you purchased a second prepaid phone in between 2020 and 2021 because it's based on your expenses claims, I think, and that the amounts are, are there. Um, why did you, did you purchase those phones and why did you? Um, they were purchased, uh, certainly, through my expenses on my authority. I didn't mm. personally purchase them. They were also not for use by me. Uh, many MSPs, I believe, did the same uh, when the pandemic uh, started and uh, my constituency office staff could no longer work. Could I, sorry office. to interrupt, Mr. Urgent. Just to be clear, <coughs> I'm, we're obviously keen on understanding whether they were used for your business related to the COVID uh, pandemic in the uh, conduct of your role as First Minister. They were not I, if they were used for some other purpose, we have no interest they, in They were the phones that my constituency office landline were diverted to in the homes of my constituency office staff. I have never, uh, to the best of my knowledge, seen, held and certainly not used uh, any of these phones. Thank you for clarifying that. Milady, um, as I'm about to move on to a different topic, if that's an appropriate moment. Certainly. Um, I suspect uh, um, we may be getting messages that stenographer is struggling. Mm -hmm. Um, I yes. appreciate it. it's very difficult to change no, one's please. pattern of speech, but um, maybe if you paused before asking the next question, um, Mr Dawson, so the stenographer can catch up. I'll try my very best, Aye. my lady, yes. Pause. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pass to them.
Um, so this is an exchange in which they are discussing a cabinet meeting. The reference to she is you, I think. I assume so. Yes. Do you, do you recall this period just broadly? And we'll get into some of the details. I, I recall the period uh, not just broadly. I, I recall it in detail. I recall the yes. cabinet meeting in yes. detail too. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what the context is, if I understand it from the evidence that we've heard from Mr Yusuf and indeed Ms Forbes, is that um, there were discussions around the possibility of having further measures, but there were issues pertaining to whether or not um, there would be funding to support business if there were a further lockdown or further restrictions. And that at the Cabinet meeting, uh, Mr Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Health and, and Social Care, um, had suggested somewhat out of the blue, I think Ms Forbes told us, that he, despite efforts made to try to find funding to assist for that purpose, he had managed to find within his budget £100 million, which wasn't previously known about. Is that correct? Please correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, I think it's broadly correct. I, if I may, I can go into uh, well, what, what I'm really case. interested in is, is the possibility, well, is the suggestion that I'll make to you, that this is indicative of a culture in which you did not take kindly to people bringing up at Cabinet meetings things that you had not already uh, had brought to your attention and on which you had not already made a decision? Uh, no, that is absolutely not the case. There was no such culture uh, within the government I led. I think, uh, if I may, in order to uh, answer that question properly, of course. I need to set out absolutely. the circumstances of that Cabinet meeting. Uh, I had, in advance of that Cabinet meeting, asked uh, Ms Forbes, as the Finance Secretary, uh, to undertake an exercise across government uh, to ascertain, we were finding it difficult with the UK government in the financial discussions at that point, to ascertain if there was money we could uh, redirect, free up, uh, make available from within the Scottish government uh, budget uh, to give additional support to businesses should we require to impose additional restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms Forbes had done uh, that exercise. She had done it uh, rigorously and robustly. Um, and she had reported at Cabinet that the, uh, the outcome of this, uh, having gone round all of the portfolios, was that there wasn't really any money uh, yes. of any significant scale to, to have. Uh, at which point, um, Mr Yousaf, and let me say, Mr Yousaf was doing this for the best of intentions. I'm not questioning his motives. Um, said, well, actually, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, I can make £100 million available. Um, in that moment, I felt he was doing a real disservice uh, to the Finance Secretary because she had just reported that she had done a job and it had uh, resulted in no uh, money being available. And then he you know, seemed to take the feet from her in that. I, mm. I supported and believe is important that there were robust discussions around the Cabinet table. There were robust discussions around the Cabinet table, but I expected all my ministers to operate on uh, a basis of mutual respect and of making sure that they were operating collegiately. And in that moment, um, I didn't think that was the case, and I was not, uh, I was not particularly happy about it. I, I have to concede that. Um, I think that was probably exacerbated by the fact that, and I can't recall the date, um, you perhaps will be able to show it to me. I think sometime maybe a couple of weeks before that, uh, Mr Yousaf had indicated to me on WhatsApp that he might be able to find uh, some money in this order. And my response to him was, speak to Kate. Um, and at that meeting, it appeared that he hadn't done so. Uh, so that was the context. And I perhaps was also sceptical, given, um, given uh, the pressures on the National Health Service at that point, that it would be sensible to take £100 million from dealing with the acute pressures on the health service to fund uh, business support, but that is more of a substantive issue. So that is the context of that. I, um, you know, as First Minister, I, you know, and I, I, I make no apology for this, I, I always tried to lead from the front. I always took a, the buck stops with me attitude. Um, I always took Cabinet meetings extremely seriously, made sure I was briefed and had done all the, the, the preparation and reading. And I expected similar from my cabinet secretaries. And I think that is how good uh, government should work. So that's the context of that. That was not a regular occurrence at cabinet. It was a very particular set of circumstances um, that 
as it happens, I, I, I'm not sure that that exchange doesn't slightly overstate it, but I do concede to that I express some displeasure at uh, the process by which uh, the, uh, the offer had come to the table. And it, I, it was more on behalf of Ms Forbes, because I thought it did a disservice to her and the very professional job that she had done. But we've heard Ms Forbes on this very subject, so we, we know what her position in that regard is. Um, do these messages show, uh, Ms Sturgeon, that whilst Cabinet Secretaries might complain in private, as, in these ex as, as we've just seen, um, they would ultimately be expected to fall back in line behind your view on matters? No, absolutely not. I suspect in every government everywhere across the world, and I would uh, imagine uh, that the Scottish Government was no different, that ministers will, you know, moan about the First Minister or the Prime Minister to each other. Um, uh, maybe I used to do it in a previous job in, in the Scottish Government as well. So that is normal. Uh, but I expected uh, Cabinet discussions, and Cabinet discussions were uh, full, robust, detailed. Um, I expected all Cabinet Secretaries to come to those discussions able to uh, argue their point, put their point of view across, and then for us to come to uh, a, a position at the end of that. That's how cabinet government works. It was absolutely not the case. And you know, I've, I've referenced cabinet minutes before, and, and you have uh, seen all the cabinet minutes in relation to, to COVID, and, but this would be true of cabinet minutes generally. Uh, there is usually, um, I don't know, two, three pages in a cabinet minute that in detail summarises the discussion, the points that were raised. It doesn't attribute those points to individuals. That's not how cabinets are minuted, but it goes into detail about the points raised. So you can look across all of these minutes and see uh, the nature um, and the detail of the discussion uh, that has been had. And that is how I operated within government. Um, and it's how I would have expected all my cabinet secretaries to operate. You can't see these views in the cabinet minutes. Uh, possibly not, but that uh, I think certainly you, you would, not. You would see, you would see, um, for example, the discussion about money. Uh, you would see uh, the discussion about the, the the fact that there had been an exercise uh, to try to find additional uh, resources. Could I ask uh, you to go, please, to INQ zero 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 two one four seven three four, please. Bottom of page six. If we just go to the first page, please, can we do that? Just to see what it is. These are um, conclusions, as we've come to understand. They're called minutes of the cabinet meeting held on the 22nd of June 2021. Does that be correct? Yes. Um, and if we could go to page seven, please. Just again, to try to contextualise this, um, our understanding is that this is around the time either at or shortly before cases started to rise again as a result of the Delta wave hitting Scotland? Would that be broadly your recollection? Uh, of that time period, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at um, the decisions taken uh, under paragraph, uh, subparagraph P and Q, maybe over the P. <coughs> um, yes, thank you. Uh, th these are the, um, the matters decided by Cabinet. It says... For the purposes of COVID-19 decision-making during the summer recess to delegate to the First Minister decisions that were broadly consistent with the strategic framework and timetable, noting that the First Minister will be supported as required by the gold group structure of key ministers, including Mr Swinney, Mr Yusuf, Ms Forbes and any other ministers with an interest with input from, name redacted, chief advisers and senior lead officials. And under Q, over the page... In the event that the First Minister and Goal Group were to reach a decision that differed materially from the strategic framework, that Cabinet should be advised through correspondence, and if the First Minister requested it at a meeting of the Cabinet, which she could convene at any time, should circumstances require. Um, is the reference there to the Gold Group, a group which is sometimes called Gold or Gold Command? It is indeed, and it's a, an example, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, of uh, the Civil Service often uh, attaching names, uh, grand names yes. to meetings that are otherwise uh, routine. Yes. Our understanding, Ms Sturgeon, is that this was a, a, a group which, please correct me if I've got this wrong, but our understanding is that it was a group which tended to meet. It, it didn't always have the same people in it. It was almost certainly always you. I think it was always you. Um, but it would tend to meet 
in the days before a cabinet meeting, which would, yeah. if regularly scheduled, would take place on a Tuesday. Is that right? So sometimes over the weekend, for example, I think we've seen. Yes, so, so cabinets routinely met on a Tuesday. I'm, I'm sure there were periods during COVID when we met on other days, but yes. routinely a Tuesday. Um, the Gold Group, you know, which was a, an aim I didn't ascribe to it, it became, mm. came to be known uh, as that was initially uh, an opportunity for me and uh, for other ministers as appropriate to you know, interrogate the, the data, to ask questions of advisers. And before we even got to the point of uh, shaping the proposals that would go to Cabinet for decision to uh, you know, start to, uh, in our own minds, firm up uh, the direction we thought we were going in. Uh, I should be very clear that the Gold Group, Gold Command, whatever uh, terminology we want to use, was not a decision-making or a formal governance body. Um, you know, the, the Gold Group would not have reached a, a decision, and, and actually I think the rest of that paragraph makes that quite clear, that had the Gold Group uh, wanted to propose a decision, that would have had to have gone through uh, a proper Cabinet process. And uh, just to be clear, Cabinet correspondence, I think in the UK Government as well as the Scottish Government, is it's not the preferred way of reaching Cabinet decisions, but it is a, a, a way in which Cabinet decisions can be reached short of a meeting. Um, at, don't think that happened in, in this case, but uh, so that, that paragraph there makes very clear that uh, the, the previous paragraph, which is not before me right if now... If we just put the previous one yeah. back up, please, thank you. Again, it is... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's making... So this was in the summer of 2021. Um, people are aware of uh, how far into the pandemic that was. I, I suspect this was an attempt to give ministers some time off over uh, the summer period. Everybody had obviously been working... Uh, in some periods, round the clock on this. Um, but it's very clear that I am not being given, through a delegation, a carte blanche to take decisions I want to take. It is talking there about decision, any decisions that are broadly consistent with the strategic framework and timetable. So we had already set out at that point uh, the, the milestones that we wanted to reach. Um, and as sometimes was the case, Cabinet would delegate to me. So Cabinet would say... We want to do this, assuming the data on such and such a date supports it. And when we got that data, I would make a judgment, well, does the data support it? And so formally, I would have delegated power to make the final decision. But the process of decision making was through Cabinet. And I think that uh, makes that clear. But well, might I suggest to you, Mr Sturgeon, that contrary to your interpretation, this in fact gives you an incredibly wide uh, discretion as to what, to be what you might uh, wish to do in the management of the pandemic, saying that all you need to do is to make decisions, and it is making decisions, uh, which were broadly consistent with the strategic framework and timetable. That, that would mean you could do virtually anything. Uh, with respect, I would, I, I would challenge that and say that that is not the case. The, the strategic framework, uh, by its nature, strategic frameworks are are broad and, and high level, but the timetable was very detailed. To depart from that, uh, I would not have had latitude to depart from that. Departing from that would have required me to go through a decision-making process. And um, I did not have uh, carte blanche wide latitude to take decisions, and nor should I have had, incidentally, nor would I have wanted to, given the seriousness of what we were uh, dealing with. Um, I'm not sure anybody would have chosen to take solely onto their own shoulders uh, the, the decisions that were falling to be made, uh, although I always uh, accepted that the, the final accountability and responsibility as First Minister uh, lay with me. So I, I, I respectfully uh, don't think the, the characterisation of that is uh, accurate um, at all. And I, I think if you were to look at Cabinet... Um, forgive me... Um, there was a cabinet minute uh, discussed with Mr Swinney yesterday, I think from the, the 19th of December uh, 2020, where conclusions were put to him similar to that. You know, decisions are delegated to the First Minister. Looking at only those conclusions would have given the impression uh, that, that has been given uh, now. But when you look at the minute in its entirety, the, the previous two pages of that narrate the cabinet discussion make very clear that Cabinet agreed with the decisions that were being proposed um, and that there had been a full and comprehensive uh, discussion. Uh, so, yes, when you take... Uh, when we look at paragraphs like that in isolation, uh, I accept that that gives a certain impression that is, I would say, is not accurate, but also would not be the impression given if these minutes are read in their entirety. You mentioned in your explanation, your helpful explanation, 
um, that the process uh, would be that there would be a discussion to ascertain whether Cabinet agreed with the decisions that were proposed. Does that not lead to the conclusion that decisions had already been reached and that Cabinet was in effect a decision ratifying rather than a decision making body? Uh, no, um, that's not the case because in many of these um, instances there was not one proposal put forward. Cabinet would have a range of different options. Um, one Cabinet uh, we may come on to talk to later on um, at a later stage to this as we go into the, the, the latter part, into Christmas of 2021, when Omicron um, has been identified, um, that Cabinet has, and I'm using this just as an illustrative example, there will be many others, it has three options, you know, effectively st stick with the measures we have in place just now, enhance them in some way or have a circuit breaker. Cabinet has a full discussion and then it reaches a decision. So it was uh, not always the case that Cabinet simply had a proposal put to it that it could take or leave. Cabinet would have a range of options. The, the exchange that we talked about before the break between Liz Lloyd and I um, is reflective of that. There were options that Cabinet would have been chewing over and coming to a balanced view of. We can judge that ourselves, as uh, said earlier, from the Cabinet uh, conclusion. Absolutely, yes. Um, the, the, the gold or gold command meetings, it's accepting that you don't like the term, um, that seems to be what they were at least colloquially referred to as. Um, they, are, they are somewhat mysterious to us in the sense that they weren't minuted, were they? Um, there, there were not minutes taken of them in the way that you have Cabinet minutes. Um, that is certainly the case because they were not decision making uh, meetings in the way cabinet meetings were um, however uh, and I, I believe uh, forgive me if I'm misinformed here I believe the inquiry has uh, papers that went with and around uh, those meetings uh, slide packs that would inform the discussion agendas of the, the, the issues we were going to discuss and where there had been actions out of these meetings usually to do further work to inform decisions then uh, notes of action points and I've certainly the committee uh, the inquiry uh, apologies had asked me to review some of that so I've reviewed uh, that paperwork and I, I I know that that is there but in many of these meetings uh, the purpose of them was you know cabinet had choices and options but no cabinet on any issue anywhere you know, sits with a blank sheet of paper. So there is a process of <coughs> shaping the options that will then become the, uh, the decisions that Cabinet takes. And these meetings were often to try to shape those options. So in, in a sense, the, the output of those meetings, the, and I use this term loosely, the minutes of those meetings are the Cabinet papers that then go to Cabinet for decision because that is uh, what comes from these meetings into the Cabinet papers that then inform and shape the decisions Cabinet reaches. We've certainly had access to ac certain action points. They don't relate to every gold meeting. We've struggled rather to work out even when the gold meetings took place. We have to look at other documents to tell us when they might have happened. We have seen action points, not in relation to all of the meetings that appear to have happened. But the action points appear very much to be effectively the conclusion of the meeting rather than any discussion as to how those conclusions were reached. Therefore, is it fair to say that the documentation to which you refer does not tell us the salient points that were discussed in the conduct of government business at those meetings? So I, I think, yes, I, I think that would be fair and there is uh, undoubtedly a learning point for government here and it is not any longer for me, but I, I'm sure the Scottish Government will be reflecting on this. Um, I think around, uh, you know, the impression that can be created when you give, you know, grand names to fairly routine meetings, and I've already made that point, but more substantively, uh, to make sure that there is a, a clearer record of these discursive non-decision-making meetings that are discursive and there for the purpose of shaping the decisions that have to be taken by Cabinet. So, yes, I, I, I would accept that can, you know, to somebody outside the process, it would uh, be helpful if that was clearer. I can look at Cabinet uh, papers, not minutes, but Cabinet papers, putting the the, the proposals for decision or the options for decision to Cabinet. And I know that, you know, that effectively reflects the discussion that we would have had in these meetings because that was how we shaped the 
options and uh, decisions that were coming to Cabinet. Is there a theme developing in the areas we've already looked at, Ms Sturgeon, that the Scottish Government does not like light to be shined on the way in which discussions leading to decisions have, have taken place? Uh, no, I, I would very, very strongly uh, refute that. And, you know, this is a point I've made uh, a number of times already this morning, and I, forgive me for repeating it, but I do think it is extremely important. Um, you know, I have, in preparation for coming here today, and some of these, the committees specifically, uh, drawn my attention to, I have looked at all of the Cabinet papers and, and minutes over that whole period. It runs to, you know, thousands of pages. And that paperwork doesn't simply record the decision that was reached. Um, it records uh, the options that Cabinet considered, the pros and cons of each of these options, the reasoning and the evidence that underpinned both the presentation of the options and the decision that was reached. And then the Cabinet minutes, often over several pages, records a very uh, detailed summary of the discussion around the Cabinet table. Um, and I do believe that not only gives a comprehensive record of the decisions that the Scottish Cabinet reached in relation to COVID, but also the, the thought processes, the reasoning, the rationale, um, and the factors that were considered in the process of reaching <coughs> these decisions. The cold meetings, as we're calling them, were often attended by Mr Yusuf. Is that right? I don't have the attendance list in front of me, but yes, broadly, that would broadly. have been the case when he was Health Secretary. Uh, yes, uh -huh. uh, And often attended by Ms Lloyd. Uh, there would have been a special advisor in them and officials there and somebody from my private office. If their position at this inquiry were that the gold meetings were a decision-making body, would they be wrong about that? Uh, yes, the, the gold meetings were not. Cabinet was a decision-making body. How was the list of attendees decided? I think you said that Mr Yusuf would attend in one role, but perhaps not in another. It would, it would depend on the nature of the decision that we were uh, about as Cabinet to consider. So that would vary depending on the state, you know, the stage of the pandemic and, and the state uh, of things that we were dealing with at the time. Um, so sometimes that would be very health focused, um, particularly later as we go into 2021, when finance to support our public health decisions was becoming more of an issue that would include finance. Um, you know, I, I, I was, again, at the committee's request, reviewing uh, the inquiry, my apologies, uh, request, reviewing some of these papers over the course of, of yesterday. Uh, so, for example, at uh, late 2020, uh, the, there were meetings that Ms Forbes, as I think she said yesterday, wasn't at, but her office was copied in to the notice of the meeting and the papers. The economy secretary, uh, Fiona Hislop at the time, uh, was at these meetings. Um, later in 2021, when finance was much more of an issue, uh, Ms Forbes would be in attendance and perhaps another minister might not be. Uh, these were discursive uh, opportunities for us to throw around uh, issues. Well, firstly, to look at the state of the pandemic, the data, what we were dealing with, the choices and the decisions that we were having to take, what the implications of those decisions were, what factors we had to take account of in order that all of the proper work could be done to then shape and inform the decisions that Cabinet would take. To be clear about Ms Forbes' evidence, her position was that she did not attend any meetings in 2020. In fact, she didn't even know of the existence of the Gold Group in 2020. Uh, that, I obviously cannot say what information uh, was shared with her at that time about these meetings with the private office, but having reviewed some of these papers last night, and I will you know, apologise and be corrected if I've read this wrongly, her office was copied into uh, the uh, papers and the notification of meetings at the end of 2020. But she didn't attend in 2020? Uh, she was... She wasn't in attendance in 2020. I, I, I don't think it would be true to say that her office didn't know about these meetings. Had she felt, mm -hmm. had she known, and obviously from her evidence yesterday, she didn't know, but had she and had wanted to attend, there would have been nothing to stop her attending. But in those meetings at the end of 2020, um, I, I believe that the 
Economy Secretary was present because at that point, as we've reflected earlier on, issues around hospitality, the, the impact and the burden on businesses was one of the issues that we were uh, frequently discussing and reflecting on. These meetings presented discursive opportunities, as you've described them, uh, at which um, Ms Forbes, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, did not participate. Is that correct? Uh, she did not participate in all of the meetings, no. Uh, she but didn't then, participate in any of the meetings in 2020? I, I, I'm I think there were probably only, um, I think there were only few meetings in the latter part of 2020. I don't have the list uh, in front of me right now, but uh, I, I believe that these meetings, these goal meetings, uh, started in you know, perhaps September, October uh, 2020. So I don't think there were very many meetings in 2020. Um, she wouldn't, from her evidence yesterday, she wasn't there. She was at meetings in 2021. There was no, this was a, a as, as I think you're demonstrating in your questioning, it was a, a reasonably fluid uh, group in order that we were, we had the right people around the table to sort of throw around the issues that we were discussing in order to inform decisions at Cabinet. Of course, Ms Forbes, with all other Cabinet secretaries, would have been at Cabinet when the actual decisions came to be taken and would have been and did uh, make their views known and contribute fully to those discussions and take part in the decisions. As she wasn't there, she obviously wasn't one of the right people to have round the table, is that right? Uh, no, that is... Well, she was there when we got into 2021, when well, in finance became more of a, an issue. That is not, that is not uh, the basis on which um, I operated at any time <laughs> over my period as First Minister, and certainly not during the pandem pandemic. All I was interested in was having around the table the people that we needed to inform the decisions that we were taken, and when those decisions failed to be taken, all of the cabinet were, were there. I, you know, my only motivation at any point during the pandemic was to do the best we could to keep the country as safe as possible. Sometimes we would have succeeded in that, other times we didn't. Um, and I carry the regret for the occasions that we didn't all the time and, and always will do. Uh, but the motivation was just to try to take the best possible decisions we could. Could we go to INQ 00034641, please? This is um, some notes taken by Ms Lloyd, you may recognise the handwriting, um, from the 28th of September uh, 2020. Um, and in these notes, she says, the Gold Command... Um, and she refers to let's find the page. It's the next page, I think I want to look at. If that's okay. Yeah, just the passage at the top, which is obviously in that context. Navigate economy, avoid blunt instrument. F H no finances. FM starting point, how do we reduce impact of spread with minimal economic impact? Uh, political tactics calling for things we can't do to force UK. Um, this is a gold command meeting that Ms Forbes was not at. Is that your understanding? Uh, yes, FH will be Fiona Hislop. Yes, Ms Hislop was. was. That, yes, that's my understanding as well. Um, this is um, a meeting in which there is a discussion about important financial matters um, relating to um, how we would reduce the financial, uh, financial impact of uh, uh, possible restrictions that were being contemplated at that time. Is that correct? Uh, that certainly is how it appears from what's in front of you. Again, to, to contextualise this, just to make sure we're literally on the same page, but my understanding of this period is that this is a period when Cases have um, risen. You, you made an announcement on the 7th of September that you would have to um, slow down the easing of the lockdown. There, were, uh, there was advice being given uh, in this month by SAGE and others in, within the Scottish Government as well that there may need to be a circuit breaker. And I think what well, the, the context of this discussion, just so we're understanding each other, is that there was consideration of what the economic... Uh, situation would be if we had another lockdown, uh, in particular whether there would be funding for um, uh, business and uh, for furlough and that sort of thing. Is that, again, broadly your understanding of this period? Uh, yes. We discussed this, I think, with Ms Lloyd, in particular the part where she talks about political tactics, tactics calling for things we can't do to force UK. What was the reference there, do you recall? Well, this was uh, during a period... Um, 
as we are sort of September through the autumn of 2020, which culminated in um, the second lockdown in England, enhanced measures in Scotland, but not uh, full lockdown. And it was at that point, it became much more um, of an issue as we went into 2021. But this was at the point where this issue, uh, which I spoke about very often at the time and which no doubt we'll speak about later today, was, be was starting to come to the fore of a, a, a disjoint between the ability of the Scottish Government and the responsibility of the Scottish Government to take public health decisions, but our inability to borrow the money or uh, raise the money yes. to compensate businesses or individuals for the impact of those decisions. Uh, when such decisions were taken by the UK government for England, they could provide the financial yes. support. And this was a frustration uh, that was expressed by us um, regularly and also by the First Ministers of Wales mm -hmm. and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister of, of Northern Ireland. Um, that is, a, again, it's, these are not my words, they're not my notes, um, but we often, not often, that's, that would be putting it too strongly, but this was the start at which we were experiencing experiencing a situation where we were not managing to persuade the UK government privately mm -hmm. um, and therefore we were having to contemplate airing some of these issues publicly. Um, I, think, I think that did happen, Mr Sturgeon. I think, I think you made an announcement in this regard yes. about what the situation was on, in fact, the 1st of November, just a few days after this, which then, on the very same day, yeah. led uh, the then Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, to respond saying that furlough would be available in the event of a further uh, Scottish that, that, and indeed Welsh or Northern Irish lockdown. Uh, I don't think we ever, uh, in fact, I'm not sure to this day we ever got the actual uh, pinned down detail of, of what that meant, whether it would be uh, 80 per cent furlough for as long as a Scottish lockdown lasted or whether it was mm -hmm. just a, a sweeping yeah. statement to. To be clear, that this, this wasn't, in fact, it was slightly late. It was the this, was it, this was earlier than that. Yes, this but was I, I'm just trying to illustrate what this was. It was a yes. time when these frustrations were beginning to surface, which hadn't been there in, in terms of the financial aspect of this up until now, where, I mean, this was, to be blunt, this was about making sure, the Scottish Government seeking to make sure that if we had to apply tougher restrictions or impose a, another lockdown, Scottish workers would get their wages paid, Scottish businesses would be compensated for that in the same way that... <clears throat> the UK government would be able to make possible for individuals and businesses in England. And, and that's what that is, uh, I, I believe, that is what uh, that is referring to. Um, Ms Forbes told us that prior to and around this time, she had been involved in considerable discussions with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury around this and other financial issues. Um, this was a discussion in which she should have participated, is it not? It, it, it may have been. If, if what is being put to me, and forgive me for um, if I'm reading into things that are, are not there, but if what has been put to me is that Ms Forbes was somehow being excluded from discussions that she should have been party to, then that is absolutely not the case. Uh, Ms Forbes was uh, uh, an extremely highly valued member of my cabinet, an extremely competent um, and professional member of my cabinet. If she, you know, any discussions she would have been having with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury would have been properly reported to me and through the government. Um, there you know, were, were many different meetings at many different levels within the Scottish Government at which different uh, ministers and cabinet secretaries and, and officials would have participated. Um, Fiona Hislop and we at that time had a finance secretary and an economy secretary. Uh, she was there that day clearly to represent the, the broader business uh, financial interests. And I'm sure, uh, again, you'll be able to check whether I'm uh, right or wrong on this by reference to the public the corporate record is that if there had been issues raised there that required uh, answers or considerations around financial impact, then Ms Forbes' office would have been contacted and she would have been part of wider discussions. Um, I did not operate um, on any issue at any point of the, uh, the COVID pandemic in a way that sought to exclude people from decision making. I uh, tried to lead from the front. I tried to shoulder my fair share, sometimes deliberately more than my sh fair share of the burden of decision making, given the, the severity um, and the difficulty of the decisions that were being made. I thought that was appropriate for, first for a First Minister. 
unlike cabinet secretaries who have their own portfolios, I also had a responsibility to see the whole picture. Um, but I, I tried to use the best resources I had available ministerially and in the civil service for the Scottish Government in the whole to reach the best decisions. And, you know, I absolutely accept it's, that it's the case that we can look at a single note of a single meeting and look at, well, a particular person wasn't at that and, and reflect now. I, so I am sitting here thinking, yeah, I don't know why she wasn't there that day and, and probably she should have been, but that was not some you know, deliberate attempt to exclude her. On the contrary, uh, she was crucial uh, to the pandemic response in many ways. Well, we have her evidence on that matter. Mm -hmm. We've looked at another exchange between Mr Yusuf and uh, uh, Professor Leach, actually around the time that Mr Yusuf took the role after the election of Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, uh, in which they start to discuss the exposure of uh, Mr Yusuf to all the information that he needs to take on board to try to make decisions in his new role. Uh, Professor Leach uh, refers, uh, they, they discuss the possibility or the, the, the imminent uh, deep dive meeting that is about to take place at which they're both going to attend. And Professor Leach suggests as regards that meeting that there was some FM keep it small shenanigans as always. She actually wants none of us. Is that an accurate reflection of the way in which you manage the pandemic in Scotland? Uh, no, it's not, and uh, it couldn't be further uh, from that. Perhaps you have to know uh, Jason Leach as well as I do to fully appreciate his, you know, sometimes uh, turn of phrase. Um, I should say I have got the highest uh, opinion of Professor Leach, and he was uh, crucial um, in a very, very positive way to our handling of the, the pandemic. Um, this probably refers to if it's not, and this, this wasn't particular to the pandemic, it was probably particular to uh, my first ministership overall, a bit of a, a sort of, I don't know how to describe it, almost, almost joke within the government. When you, in government there is a tendency, and again I say this respectfully, I've got the highest regard for the civil service um, and deep gratitude uh, to the civil service for uh, everything they do and particularly did during COVID. But when you have a any meeting involving ministers, particularly the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, there is a tendency kicks in. Everybody wants to be in the room, whether they, strictly speaking, need to be there or not. And you could end up with meetings where there would be literally a cast of thousands of people, many of whom just wanted to be in the room to hear what was said and didn't need to be there. I, I, I didn't have a great deal of patience with that. I wanted the right people, by that I don't mean people, you know, whether I liked them or not, I meant with the right expertise and, uh, and uh, ability to, and experience to, 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 and knowledge to offer round the table. So that's, I, I suspect, again, Professor Leach would have to answer what he meant there. I suspect that's a reference to that thing that was said about me in the Scottish Government uh, that I, I didn't like casts cast of unnecessary thousands in meetings. I absolutely wanted the people who were critical to making decisions around the table uh, when either decisions were being discussed and shaped and certainly uh, when uh, they were being taken. And uh, she actually wants none of us. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, there are days during the pandemic I would gladly not have had to see, you know, Jason or uh, Gregor or Hamza or uh, all of these people. This was an incredibly stressful period for all of us, but I wanted uh, all of the uh, people with the right expertise in the room so that we could take the best decisions we possibly could. The word shenanigans has the words as always. I think I've set out what I think that means. Um, I think it probably should... Professor Leach was not discriminating in uh, the comments, who he chose to make comments about in these discussions. Um, you gave some previous evidence when you helpfully appeared in Module 1 uh, about your uh, experience, ministerial experience, um, having been Health Secretary, Deputy First Minister and First Minister. And you told the inquiry um, about the fact that you had in fact had, I think in your role as Health Minister, experience of dealing with the pandemic before, uh, as you had dealt um, with Scotland's response to and position in the 2009 H1N1 swine flu crisis. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, although Her Ladyship is still to make determinations on the matter, 
uh, it was suggested by a number of witnesses in Module 2 uh, that the then Prime Minister, Mr Johnson, was the wrong Prime Minister for this crisis. Uh, did you share that view? Um, yes. I, again, I, I'm, I'm risking here going further than I should and being reprimanded for sounding political. I'm not meaning to be. I suppose I'm trying to put that into context where I don't think I'm betraying any secrets here when I thought Boris Johnson was the wrong person to be Prime Minister. So stop. Yes. Um, so I think that answer has to be seen within that context. Um, did you consider yourself against that background and your considerable ministerial experience to be precisely the right first minister for the job? No, that's not how I would have thought of it at all. Um, I was the first minister when uh, the pandemic struck. There's a large part of me wishes that I hadn't been, um, but I was. And I wanted to be the best first minister I could be during that period. It's for others to judge the extent to which I succeeded. Thank you. Did you, it's undeniable that you had the previous experience of the H1N1 crisis, that's simply a fact, and that you had considerable experience in dealing with health matters, in particular as you had been Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health. Um, I'd be interested to know, Ms Sturgeon, whether in the juxtaposition between that simple state of affairs and your opinions shared by some others of Mr Johnson, that you saw a political opportunity in the fact that you were uh, well equipped in your mind to deal with the response and he was not? No. Um, the answer I gave you a moment ago about Boris Johnson, I don't remember thinking that in the moment. It's, it, you know, I've made the political comment about my views of Boris Johnson generally. In those early days of the pandemic, my view was, and my experience was, uh, that we were all trying our best in almost impossible circumstances. Um, to the next bit of your question, did I see an opportunity? I didn't see an opportunity of any description in COVID. I saw a threat, a risk, a catastrophe. Uh, my memories of the early part of 2020 in terms of how I was feeling and thinking and the emotions uh, that I was experiencing was at first fear um, at what might be about to unfold and confront the country. Um, at times, uh, and I think, you know, you've seen snippets of perhaps, you know, the, the sort of human side of, of being a leader and a politician in these moments, at times in those early days, I, I felt overwhelmed by the scale of what we were uh, dealing with. And perhaps more than anything, I felt an overwhelming responsibility uh, to, to do the best I could. And that's so the idea that in those horrendous days, weeks, I was thinking of a political opportunity, I find... Well, it's just it wasn't true. Was it the case, Ms Sturgeon, that the overwhelming responsibility that you've described feeling um, manifested itself in you taking a very firm grip over decision-making, difficult decision-making, such that ultimately decisions about the management of the pandemic were made by you? No. Um, and again, I would say any reading of the Cabinet documents, I think, would show that that is not the case. Um, decisions were made by my Cabinet. Uh, did I, in those discussions leading to decisions, uh, have views? Of course I did. I we've reflected earlier on, I was trying to inform myself, to educate myself. I had a role in Cabinet that to an extent the Deputy First Minister had as well, to see the whole picture and not just uh, particular portfolio impacts. Um, but the decisions were taken collectively by Cabinet and I uh, absolutely maintain that that is what the Cabinet documentation shows. Um, you asked me if at the start of that, given that overwhelming responsibility, 
did I take a firm grip of uh, leadership? And I, I hope I did. I had never experienced, and most people at that time had never experienced, I had been health secretary during swine flu, thankfully turned out not to be anything uh, as severe as COVID. I had never experienced uh, this before, and I had a, a sense of responsibility that as First Minister, I had to lead from the front, that I had to uh, take the decisions collegiately, but ultimately have an attitude that said that the buck stopped with me, that I was accountable. So we'll talk about decisions and have done today and will do no doubt later on that our decisions that were probably taken not by me, but by my cabinet secretaries or ministers. There is no part of me that will ever say, well, that wasn't anything to do with me. I was ultimately accountable and responsible, and that's the only way it could have been. And I tried to uh, do that to the best of my ability. You've mentioned, uh, Ms Sturgeon, a number, on a number of occasions, the the very initial stages of the pandemic, and that's what I'd like to turn to, to next. Just to link it into a matter that you've, in fact, just been discussing, we've heard some contradictory evidence about the extent to which those who were involved from a scientific perspective in the 2009 swine flu crisis, at the time <coughs> when uh, information uh, was emerging about the, the new threat, uh, took that experience to be something of a comfort based on the fact that, as you said, uh, it didn't turn out to be as bad as it might well have been in Scotland. Uh, and from others that use that experience really almost in completely the opposite way uh, to lead to the conclusion that the threat was incredibly great. Um, based on your previous political experience of that and, and knowledge, which you've told us about in Module 1, um, to what extent uh, were you able to draw on that experience, and in particular, what, what advice do you recall having it in the first couple of months, January, February time, about whether that experience should be something from which one should take comfort, or something from which one should, uh, in fact, sense considerable alarm? Um, if I may, there's different parts in, in that, so if, yes. if I can try to, try to uh, address all, all of them. I don't think there was any advice in that early period that said in terms, you know, don't worry, it will just be like swine flu versus, you know, we should be thinking that um, because we, it was mild in swine flu, it will be the opposite. I, I don't mm -hmm. think there was advice in those mm -hmm. terms. Um, during January and into February 2020, I think I received the first briefing forgive me if I'm not getting my dates absolutely correct here. I think I received the first briefing about swine flu around the 17th of, of January. I convened the first meeting of the Scottish Government's Resilience uh, Committee, the Scottish Government equ equivalent of COBRA, I think on the 29th, 28th or 29th of January. So from January onwards, there was uh, a distinct and almost on a daily basis growing uh, understanding and apprehension that this was going to be extremely serious. Mm. Uh, sometime in February, early February, I, and I remember this vividly because it was part of that sense of fear and responsibility I spoke about, seeing you know, reasonable worst case scenario projections that were terrifying in terms of what could have, have happened. Um, in terms of going back to swine flu, in my own view, mm. this is a question I've asked myself often. Um, did the experience of swine flu even subliminally influence uh, my attitude in the early days to COVID. Um, it was definitely there. I, I learned things in relation to swine flu. The, the, the communication approach, the, the daily briefings, the then Chief Medical Officer Sir Harry Burns and I did a similar approach in, in swine flu. So I, I'd learned about the importance of clear, regular communication and I was able to draw on that. I don't think... I don't think I had any sense that because swine flu had turned out to be, to use a, a loose term, a false alarm, the same was likely to happen with COVID. In fact, I think that because that was in my mind, I think I was guarding against that in those early days. Um, but it's, it, it's a complex question with perhaps no simple answer. I think there are other things which no doubt will come on to in those early days that, or those early weeks, that if 
I had my time again, I would want to do differently. I think there were assumptions made, for example, around the public's willingness to comply with restrictions and how long that would last that were made by decision makers, myself included, that turned out to be wrong, I think, um, that perhaps influenced some of those early decisions more than a memory of swine flu did. Thank you. Um, as I say, we have conflicting evidence about what scientists thought about that. Um, we heard evidence from Professor Nick Finn, who, spoke, who was not actually at Health Protection Scotland as it was at that time, but spoke on behalf of uh, that body and Public Health Scotland in the evidence we heard. Um, he, in his evidence, uh, was one of the witnesses who sought to draw on the H1N1 experience as something of a comfort, given the way it had turned out. Was HPS a, a body from which you were getting advice about the threats at this time? Uh, yes, so I, I referred to the early briefings. They would come uh, either from HPS or you know, informed by HPS through yes. whatever channel in, in the Scottish Government. H, looking back at, at swine flu, um, HPS um, back then was a body, I, I was health secretary, I was familiar with it anyway, but worked closely with Jim McMenamin, who I know you heard evidence yes, from as well, worked extremely closely with him and somebody else I have the highest uh, regard for. Um, his expertise and commitment to these issues. Um, so HPS was, it, obviously Public Health Scotland was established at the start of the pandemic, uh, but HPS was a, a valuable and valued source of advice to me and to the government more widely. We, we know that HPS stood up its national incident management team on the 13th of January. So we understand that that was a body that was providing advice at that time uh, to the government. Is, is that correct as far as you recall? Uh, yes, so I, I, I think uh, the 17th of January was the first time a briefing came to me, yes. but that would have been informed by the... Yes. the, the I, th I think at that early stage, it was, and I think this is reflected in the early advice, it was something of an intelligence gathering uh, operation from what was happening principally in Wuhan, in China, and anything else that was being seen uh, across the world. But that would have been the source of the advice that was coming to me. You were also, quite naturally, receiving advice from Dr Calderwood over this period, is that correct? Yes. Were you aware <coughs> of a series of emails exchanged in late January from the 21st of January, um, which were sent by Professor Mark Woolhouse, a consultant epidemiologist at Edinburgh University, to Dr Calderwood and the contents of those emails? No, I, I wasn't aware of them at the time, uh, either of their existence or uh, of their content. I, I should say my direct contact with Dr Calderwood in, in this context would probably have started around the time of the first SCORE, uh, Scottish Government Resilience Meeting, at the end of, of January. Um, so I wasn't aware of the, the existence or the content of those emails, but having now had the opportunity to read them, um, certainly as we went from January into February, the, the tenor and you know, the general content of those emails was certainly percolating through in the information that was coming uh, to government ministers. So I, I don't read them now and say I had no idea mm. that this was perhaps it. You know, not in all of the detail of that, but in the, the general sense. So would Professor Woolhouse, the general <coughs> tenor of Professor Woolhouse, obviously Professor Woolhouse is very much in the camp of, based on previous experience, in particular his experience in dealing with uh, the swine flu crisis and the, the emerging information, he was very much in the camp of the, hitting the serious alarm button at that stage. <coughs> uh, you say that was percolating through? Yeah, y y yes, uh, in the sense that as we went through the, the latter part of January into February. I, I think, you know, Cabinet first discussed this on, if, if I'm remembering the dates correctly, here on the 4th of February. Um, now, just to give a, a, a sort of accurate picture here, the, the, the concern was increasing and mounting as we went through late January into February, and certainly, you know, as we got to the end of February into March, it was uh, ever higher. But... You know, we had a sense, a very strong sense from the latter part of January that this was something to be very worried about. The, we, we've been through the emails from um, Professor Woolhouse uh, and um, with Dr Calderwood on a number of occasions to look at the detail. I think you've seen those as I have. indicated. I, I don't intend to go to the details, um, but what I'm interested in is uh, ascertaining um, what your understanding was of the practical steps which Professor Woolhouse 
over and above his detailed epidemiological analysis of things like the R0 and that sort of thing, the practical steps that he was indicating ought to be taken at that stage in order to try to deal with the threat which he had identified. These include the requirement for an integrated surveillance system, uh, various different types of surveillance, including um, uh, genomic sequencing, um, isolation, infection control, contact tracing, public messaging and social distancing. Um, if I can, these are, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not sitting here notwithstanding having been a minister through two pandemics to claim to be an expert on these technical matters, but all of these are things that uh, were built up and developed in Scotland. It will be a matter of you know, judgment for the inquiry as to whether all of these things happened as quickly mm. as they mm. should or could have happened. And, you know, we can go into any of these in individual aspects in more detail if, if, if you wish mm. me to. But if I take... So we had, and I remember this well from my time as Health Secretary, we had a system of surveillance, uh, the Sentinel surveillance system, which was based on sample testing of respiratory infections across uh, certain GP practices. Um, some not initially in January or February, but later that was scaled up to cover, I think, more than a million of the, the Scottish population. Uh, we very quickly uh, established from having no uh, ability to carry out COVID uh, tests in Scotland. I think by the 10th of February, we had established uh, COVID test processing facilities in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, I think at that early stage, positive tests still had to go to Colindale. In, in London for confirmation, but we, so over a very short period of time, we had established from no uh, testing capacity to having that, and then that scaled up ever more. Uh, genomic testing, you know, again, if, uh, again, uh, an issue we might or, or might not come on to talk about the, the Nike conference. Uh, there was genomic uh, study done around uh, the, the lineage of, of COVID in that. So there was a, a very substantial study done later on involving genomic sequencing of the importation of COVID to Scotland. So um, whether we did it quickly enough will be for others to judge. But certainly, as we go into uh, the later part of 2020, these capacities um, are, are there in Scotland and have been developed and uh, possibly in some cases still developing. Social distancing, of course, you know, came later through the early COBRA decisions. We, you know started to give advice, uh, I think, sometime in March about people being careful about contacts, and but the, the formal uh, COBRA decisions around isolation and distancing came uh, later on in March. When Ms Freeman gave evidence to the inquiry, um, she was of the view that Scotland's public health service lacked in staff facilities and kit to introduce a testing system of the kind that was being introduced uh, and that the capacity of tests remained at only 350 per day until April. Um, does this, in your view, based on your involvement and recollection, indicate uh, a lack uh, of urgency in Scotland's response? So, specifically on testing, I would say I, I don't think it reflected a lack of urgency. I think it reflected um, a it reflected the capacity we had in place and therefore, and that determined the speed at which we could scale from the very limited capacity to the much greater capacity we had. So if you take testing, for example, um, the, the testing facilities that were available pre-pandemic diagnostic testing facilities tended to be uh, not just for COVID, but generally in small scale, multiple small scale labs. Uh, while there were you know, expert staff working in these. There was a need to recruit, um, which is not easy to do with people of the expertise we needed. Um, there was also at that point, and there are different conclusions that can be drawn from this, I appreciate, but at that point there was intense uh, supply chain pressure on, you know, swabs and reagents for testing. So I, I don't think it was a sense of a lack of urgency, but it, it by necessity, there was a certain limit to how quickly we could go from where we were at the start of the pandemic in testing 
to where we wanted to do. It took time to put the larger scale labs. That said, the, the Glasgow Lighthouse Lab, which was done through the UK uh, Lighthouse system, I think was open by um, sometime in, in April. So things moved relatively quickly. Were they as quick as I would have wanted? Uh, even at the time, and certainly with hindsight, no, but there were practical constraints that we were, that we were uh, dealing with at that point. Had your H1N1 experience of 2009 taught you that early decisive action to contain a viral pandemic uh, would be necessary and that it would require a testing and tracing capacity? Uh, yes, and uh, the, because of what we've already talked about, swine flu in the way it developed or didn't develop, the, the limited uh, testing and contact tracing that we had in place at that time was much more capable of, of dealing with the scale of, of the threat. So yes, it, it did teach me that. I think there is, and it's certainly a point I have reflected on with hindsight, um, and I think governments now have to reflect on with foresight, is the level of testing and contact tracing infrastructure that is kept in place outside pandemic periods. It is very costly um, to do that, but we certainly we certainly suffered from not having a greater baseline capacity at the start of 2020 um, that, than we had, and we scaled up as quickly as we could. My own view, I uh, am no longer in a position of responsibility around this, my own view is there should be a greater baseline uh, capacity infrastructure in future, but that comes with costs and it comes with opportunity costs, and there are obviously issues that governments have to grapple with in that. The maintenance of that baseline capacity may well be costly, uh, Ms Sturgeon, but I rather suspect that the pandemic itself has shown that Absolutely. it is even more costly not to. Um, so let me be clear, yes, and I, I, I want to be clear that I was not suggesting that the financial cost should uh, you know, take priority over the human cost. The, the, there were many costs of the, the COVID pandemic. The human one was the the worst of all. Um, so I absolutely agree with that. But and Scotland and the UK was not alone in this internationally. Some countries had or appeared to have a greater baseline capacity uh, of testing. You know, I, I should also say for the for completeness at this stage, although you, you'll stop me if it's an area you're going to come on to, testing had limitations. It is absolutely the case that I think it would have been desirable to have been able to do more testing at an earlier stage. But particularly in people without symptoms, uh, there was not a, a degree of confidence then. I'm not sure what the degree of confidence is now that the test would would pick up the, the virus uh, in everybody. So we talk about testing. I think it is really important that we understand how central testing is. My personal view is we've also, in doing that, got to be careful we don't uh, blind ourselves to the limitations of testing. Although there might be limitations uh, related to false negativity in testing, you would, you would have found, would you not, that you would have got more positive tests than the actual situation of not carrying out tests at all? Oh, uh, Self-evidently, yes. The point I'm making is that if... I'm at risk of sounding as if I'm arguing against the importance of testing, and I, I am not. But some of the clinical, um, which were expressed in some of our decision making around putting too much reliance on testing, is because of the f potential for false negatives. So if somebody does a test one day, it's negative, and then they think, well, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about social distancing or uh, face covering or, or all of the other protections, then that could at least hypothetically, have uh, a negative effect. So I think that's more what I was talking about. I am not arguing against the importance of testing, nor am I suggesting that it would not have been advantageous for Scotland in a whole range of ways to have had greater testing capacity at an earlier stage of the pandemic. One other aspect of the um, plan, the practical plan, that um, Professor Woolhouse suggested taps into an area that you've already mentioned. He suggested that there would be a need, uh, it would be extremely important, in fact, in his correspondence, that there would be public messaging 
And of course, that was something later on that a strategy was developed for. Were you aware at around this time that there had been a recommendation by a consultant epidemiologist that public messaging, keeping the public informed even at this early stage, was a very important <coughs> part of the strategy, rather than simply later? Uh, no, I, I, I wasn't aware of the content of, of those emails, so I wouldn't have been aware that that had been a specific recommendation. Um, although the, the, the regular, which became uh, daily public messaging in the form of the, the, the daily briefings, uh, didn't start until March, uh, sometime in March 2020. And I, you know, I'd, I'd have to check exactly what the dates were here. I, I recall, understandably, given that this was becoming a dominant global story, I recall, um, certainly in advance of that, more regularly being asked questions about it in, in interviews, so that the public messaging was something that we were aware of and were starting to, to seek to do, although not in that formal, very structured sense that you refer to, uh, which kicked in later. We've seen some evidence related to various matters um, around this period, really up to the first lockdown, where there are matters that are not communicated to the public and that appears to be broadly on the advice of Dr Calderwood. I'm thinking in particular around the emergence of the threat and the uh, matters raised by Professor Woolhouse, um, the threats from the Nike conference and the genomic efforts to try and trace uh, individuals who had been infected as a result of that, um, the identity of the first person in Scotland to die uh, from COVID in the middle of March, concerns that had been expressed around the uh, rugby international which took place at Murrayfield between Scotland and France on the 8th of March. None of these matters were uh, communicated at that time uh, to the Scottish public with any degree of uh, detail. Uh, is it correct in the first instance that uh, it was on Dr Calderwood's advice that those matters were not communicated at that time? I mean, there were different considerations in each. Uh, yes. Understandably, these have been grouped together. Yes. They all stand individually, and I would have to go. Well, of and course. I'm certain you but, don't but want the simple question was, did um, Dr so in, provide it? In the case of Nike and uh, the, the rugby, um, yes, I took advice from Dr Calderwood and discussed that advice uh, with her. I don't think her advice, wh wh whatever I might think now with hindsight, that if I was to go back, would I take the same judgment? Um, I may take a different judgment, but I don't think her advice was unreasonable. I, if, I, if I can take Nike, perhaps, as the, the uh, instance to illustrate this with, the Nike was an event that the Scottish Government hadn't known about before it happened or until after it happened. So it wasn't an event that we had been asked to approve or, or not approve going ahead. When the first, in the first few cases that were um, associated with that conference, uh, there was... Uh, an incident management team uh, put in place, led by Health Protection Scotland. It wasn't genomic uh, sequencing that traced individuals. That came later to trace the, the sublineage and yes. could show what happened with or didn't happen with the spread of the infection. But there was a, an incident management team uh, that kicked in to do contact tracing, to do everything. And we now know they were very successful in halting any further spread from the, I think, 38 primary and secondary cases that were identified mm -hmm with that conference. The issue um, it's, it's the publication became, the the public, became the whether we put into the public domain at that time that the, I think it was the second case had been associated with that conference. That was a, a fine judgment. Um, <coughs> this was a conference, I, I think I heard in evidence last week that there was a couple of hundred people at that conference. There, there wasn't, there were 71 people at that conference. Only 10 of them were for, from Scotland. And there was a concern that was uh, put to me in the advice from Dr Calderwood that to uh, say that the case was somebody from that conference would have risked identifying uh, that person um, because of the small numbers involved. Um, I got that advice. I think I spoke to Dr Calderwood and I accepted that advice. I don't think it was unreasonable. I heard Dr Smith uh, say to the inquiry, and I thought this was was a reasonable way of putting it, that a different clinician might have had a different risk appetite for patient confidentiality and given different advice. That's not to say that Dr Calderwood's advice was wrong or unreasonable, but a different clinician might have given different advice and a different politician 
might have decided not to accept that advice. And the same politician, going back again, might have decided not to accept it because even though I don't think when that did uh, surface, I don't think it did undermine confidence in public messaging, um, I can see now that it had the potential to do that and I would not have wanted to take that risk. We, of course, know that it didn't lead to any, any further spread. The final point I want to make about this is this was in early March. On every given day, there were judgments falling to be made, decisions falling to be made, often very fine judgments that could have gone one way or the other. And we were taking these in this unprecedented situation, trying to reach the best decisions we could. I hope the majority of these decisions were the right ones. Some of them undoubtedly we would have fallen on the wrong side of that judgment. And perhaps with hindsight, uh, this is one of those. But that doesn't mean it was a decision reached with a motivation of secrecy. There would have been no reason other than the patient confidentiality for the Scottish Government uh, not to have uh, said that this was associated with a Nike conference. The reason the decision was reached was on the basis of patient confidentiality. It may have been a judgment we should have taken in the other direction, but that was in the nature of what we were dealing with at the time. I've put the Nike conference and the lack of publication of it in the context of a number of other things for a reason, which is, w would you agree if it were to be concluded that over this period, despite the clear indication had, that had been given by Professor Woolhouse of the need for clear public messaging over this period, that the Scottish Government adopted a, an approach of secrecy uh, such that it, it, it released very little, if any, information about the threat to the people? Uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't uh, agree with that at all. I think, uh, you know, if, if we get, if, if we're talking about the time period in which the Nike decision was made, which is around the same time period decisions were being made around um, the, the, the Murrayfield rugby match, uh, there was copious amounts of information, I think, on the day that I got and accepted advice around the rugby match. We had just published the Four Nations uh, strategy document. We were putting lots of information out there about what, how we perceived the risk and what we thought uh, the steps that had to be taken uh, were and how that was going to unfold. Um, the, the decisions that were taken on all of these things were not taken with the intention of being secretive or keeping information away from the public. They were taken on the basis of in the case of Nike, considerations of patient confidentiality that I accept. Other clinicians, other politicians may have taken a different view on, but they were the genuine uh, considerations that were being taken into account. In the case of the rugby going ahead, that was HPS, gave advice that came to me through Dr Calderwood at the time, that taking it all into account, uh, the fact that it was open air, the fact that there were likely to be supporters that if they weren't going to the match would go into pubs instead because they would all come to Edinburgh, that it was relatively safer for the match to go ahead. These were the, the decisions we were weighing and arriving at every day. Was every one of these decisions with hindsight the correct one? Absolutely not. But they were being taken in good faith for the best possible reasons and in the best possible way to try to keep people as safe as possible and be as open as possible along the way in that process. Were the decisions wrong with hindsight? Um, would I take... Because, on Nike, because I, I saw the potential, I don't, I don't think this was the reality. Um, I don't think this risk materialised, but I saw the potential for... The, the Nike conference to emerge later through a media disclosure to undermine confidence. Uh, with hindsight, I would have, I think, gone the other way on that. Um, I, I think the rugby at that point is a more difficult one to call. I, again, with all the benefit of hindsight, yes, I, and within a few days, of course, I was uh, absolutely recommending that mass events should not be going ahead. Uh, but this was public health advice that was being given to me by, you know, respected experts. And I accept it, and I take responsibility for accepting it. Um, and yes, I, on some of these, would I go a different way now? Does that mean they were right versus wrong? These were matters of judgment. There were balanced decisions we were seeking to make for the best possible reasons. We absolutely didn't get all of them right.
was the first person to die from COVID in Scotland, a French national who had been at the rugby? He was, yes. No further questions at the moment, my lady, um, if that's a convenient time. Certainly. <coughs> I shall return at quarter to two.
Thank you, lady. Um, Ms Sturgeon, before the break, uh, we were discussing uh, some of the early decision-making uh, on the part of the Scottish Government relating to the emergence of the pandemic. We talked about advice being provided um, by uh, Dr Calderwood and others. Um, in, in that period, uh, do you recall whether you received advice from the then Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Professor Smith? He was part of the process of giving advice, so during that period, um, the then Deputy Chief Medical Officer was um, mainly, I'm not, I don't think this was exclusively, but mainly the Scottish Government's observer at SAGE, for example. Mm -hmm. So he would be the conduit of uh, readouts, feedback from SAGE. Um, they would come to me um, in written form, but he was uh, frequently um, there in, in person around the table when I was discussing the matters with Dr Calderwood. Thank you. And um, we, we've also obviously heard evidence from Professor Leach, who we've talked about already, the, the um, National Clinical Director. Was he providing advice uh, as well at that time? Um, Undoubtedly, he would have been, but it wasn't, uh, as far as uh, I, I recall, I don't think it would have been coming to me directly from Professor Leach, uh, but I am sure he would have been part of the, uh, the process of uh, that advice being in gathered from different clinicians and different uh, experts to, to put to me. Um, the three uh, principal government medical advisors, Dr Calderwood, Professor Smith and Professor Leach, um, came from an obstetrics and gynaecological background, a G general practice background and a dentistry background. Is that correct? Yes. Um, none of them uh, were trained in virology, epidemiology or respiratory medicine. Is that your understanding? As far as I am aware, um, I uh, know that they have uh, varying degrees of experience in public health. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Leach in particular has qualifications in, in public health. Um, I Forgive me, I, I'm not uh, saying this in any way to say these appointments are nothing, but the First Minister is not involved in the appointment okay. of uh, these, so that I, I wouldn't have been involved in the, the appointment process for any of these individuals. We've seen um, in, in this module and others that advice was provided to the UK government by um, Professor Chris Whitty, who's an expert in uh, infectious diseases, public health, um, Sir Patrick Valance, uh, who had a background in clinical pharmacology and had worked in industry dealing with, amongst other things, vaccines. We've obviously seen and discussed some of the evidence that emerged from individuals uh, in, in the background, certainly, in Scotland, uh, Professor Woolhouse in particular. Uh, Professor Woolhouse was also, in his advice, able to draw on discussions he had had with other experts, uh, such as um, uh, Neil Ferguson and others who, who he mentions. Um, was it your, did you have a concern over this period that the people from whom you were getting advice were not sufficiently expert to deal with the threat? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, the advice I got from uh, all of these individuals, uh, not just initially, but you know, in, in the case of two of them over the course of the pandemic, I had a, a high degree of confidence and, and trust in, uh, and I think that confidence and trust was justified. I was also aware that they... Uh, we're not uh, simply giving advice to me uh, as individuals, you know, operating solely. They were drawing on other uh, sources, Health Protection Scotland, other uh, experts uh, in various aspects of this. And, of course, uh, when we get into March 2020, the Scottish Government COVID-19 Advisory Committee is established, which has a range of, of experts. Professor Woolhouse, of course, was a member uh, of that. And, you know, I, I remember... Uh, specifically, the membership of that, again, was not selected by me. It was advised to me by uh, Dr Calderwood at the time, and I do recall that she specifically uh, said that she thought it was important to have him on there because she wanted to ensure that there uh, was a, a diversity of, of views coming uh, through that, that we didn't want to have uh, people... Obviously, we were guarding against anything that could be described as groupthink or simply people that uh, had one particular perspective. <laughs> But that body didn't exist. It wasn't set up until the end of March and became operational in early April. Is that right? Um, I, again, you will have the dates in front of me. I, mm. I don't have the dates in front of me. I, I think it met for the first time in late March. Um, and it was set up, established by Dr Calderwood at my request for specific reasons that I'm happy to uh, cover if you wish me to. Mm. Um, but before then, you know, again, SAGE was an important source of advice um, and uh, although there were 
uh, frustrations I had with the SAGE process that led me to ask Dr Calderwood to establish the advisory group, I had great confidence in the scientific uh, advice coming through SAGE. So we, at no point did I feel that I was not getting good advice. Uh, it was a, a, an uncertain time. The, the knowledge of the virus was developing. There was you know, significant doubts and uncertainties around different aspects of how it uh, transmitted, um, which became less uncertain over time. But I had confidence in the, the advice I was getting, and I have great respect for and, and indeed real gratitude for the, the work that Dr Calderwood, Dr Smith uh, and Professor Leach uh, did in that period and in the case of the latter two uh, subsequently to that. We've seen some evidence um, to suggest that um, Dr Calderwood didn't appear to have uh, very much of a plan as regards the testing aspect uh, of the pandemic response. Was, was that your um, experience of dealing with her over this? For, forgive me, I, I didn't hear whether you said did or did not. The evidence is that she did not have... Um, I, I wouldn't testing. agree with that, and nor would it necessarily have been uh, on testing solely for, for the chief medical officer uh, to have that plan. We, I think I said earlier on, we uh, went from a period in late January to having no capacity whatsoever in Scotland to process COVID tests, to by the, 6th, uh, so the 10th of February, I think, if I'm getting that date correctly, to have uh, facilities established in, in two labs uh, and in the week subsequent to that mm. capacity rolled out to every health board in Scotland. So there was a plan. I think there are very legitimate questions, which we covered this morning, about whether the pre-existing infrastructure we had in place allowed that plan to develop at sufficient pace. Uh, but I, I would contend uh, the Chief Scientist for Health, uh, David Crossman, was also uh, closely involved in uh, and brought great expertise to the, the role of developing our testing capacity and, and the use of testing, which of course was as important as the capacity that we had. Would it be fair to say that Dr Calderwood was one of the main architects of uh, what there was of a Scottish Government strategy in the period from January to March? Strategy for testing or strategy for overall? Overall. Uh, in um, she was... Uh, she was a critical part of that. She was the main conduit of clinical advice uh, to me, but that advice was coming from different sources. Uh, and she was part of the, the collective Scottish Government team uh, that was responsible for both uh, devising and implementing uh, the plan to respond to the pandemic. I, I don't think it would be accurate to say that was her sole uh, responsibility. Um, and while you know, different people would interpret phrases in different ways, key architect, I'm respectfully not sure, would, would properly describe it either. She resigned on the 5th of April. Yes. Um, when did you become aware of the circumstances which led to her resignation? On the uh, evening of the 4th. Or the Saturday night, she resigned on the Sunday, if that's the 5th of yes, April. Right. Um, I struggle sometimes with the precise dates. Um, on the Saturday evening, I got uh, a call from uh, one of my special advisers who advised me that they had taken a call from a, a Sunday newspaper uh, with uh, the, the story that then emerged uh, in that, on that day. Uh, were attempts made within the Scottish Government to retain Dr Calder despite uh, that report? Uh, so I would... Uh, as, as I do for all aspects of the COVID uh, response, but in particular this one, I take uh, absolute responsibility. I, um, in the immediate uh, moment, and remember we're in the very early stages of an unprecedented situation, I, was, uh, I had two considerations in my mind, and I'll end by saying what I think I got wrong in, in this. Firstly, I immediately understood that there would be significant public anger uh, about this and that that would have to be addressed and that Dr Calder would, would have to very clearly apologise and be very clear that she had made a mistake and uh, that the rules apply to her as they did uh, to anybody else. The other consideration was that we were at this relatively early but still very pivotal stage in the pandemic from a, a period of you know, decision making that you know was very fast paced. That we had to you know respond very quickly to to things. 
we had begun to settle into, I'm talking internally in government decision making, more of a rhythm of how we were uh, doing things of, you know, the advice and, and the decisions that that would then uh, lead to. And Dr Calderwood was a very uh, key part of that. She was a conduit of clinical advice to me. I had high trust in uh, her and she was uh, a key part of the communication effort as well. Um, and therefore, I was mindful of how disruptive it would be to suddenly, in those circumstances, lose uh, a chief medical officer. And so I initially thought I wanted to try to achieve two things, address the public anger and make sure there was no doubt at all that she had made a very serious error, but retain what I thought was very valuable expertise uh, and advice in, in government. I think as the Sunday uh, progressed, I began to realise I couldn't achieve both of those things and that if I continued to try to achieve the, the latter of those, I would seriously compromise uh, trust in the government's message and that the internal ways of working, that was something for the government to deal with and I had to prioritise the, the confidence in public messaging. So that led on the Sunday evening to me having a conversation with Dr Calderwood that led to uh, her resigning. I, I, I should say, and I want to say this on the record, uh, she had already reached that conclusion herself and made no attempt then to avoid uh, her resignation. And I think it is to her credit that she, at that point, was very clear with me that the public, uh, the confidence in the public messaging uh, had to take priority. And uh, I do think, uh, perhaps stands contrast to other uh, incidents, but I think that is to her credit. But it was a very difficult uh, episode in what was overall an incredibly difficult period. We've seen some correspondence over that weekend, as you described, this. she eventually resigned uh, late on the Sunday, the 5th, that tend to suggest that there was a, there was a process over that day uh, whereby um, it, there was an evolving realisation, I think, that she would end up having to resign. Um, are you saying, for, uh, Ms Sturgeon, that the, your initial reaction was to try to keep her but that became impossible. Yeah, I, I think I thought wrongly, um, as it turned out, and I quickly realised this was not possible to, to achieve both of those objectives, to make sure we didn't have the public, uh, public confidence in our messaging undermined and keep the Chief Medical Officer in post in the, uh, the midst of a pandemic. Um, yeah, and I perhaps tried to give equal weight to those considerations, but over the course of that Sunday, I realised that was not possible. And if I continued to try to achieve the, the latter, the outcome of that would be the undermining of confidence. And, and that quickly led to the, the situation that unfolded on the Sunday evening. But as I say, Dr Calderwood had already, uh, I think herself, come to that same conclusion. So ultimately, did you tell her to resign or... Did we, you agree that she should? In point of fact, um, I, I said earlier on, the Chief Medical Officer is not a first ministerial appointment. I probably technically couldn't have, uh, you know, made her resign, but that wasn't, that wasn't necessary. By the time I spoke to her on the phone on the Sunday evening, I was clear it was an inevitable outcome and she was clear it was an inevitable outcome. So the conversation really became that that is what was going to happen. We've also seen some uh, internal correspondence involving Professor Smith and others that tended to suggest that the way in which the resignation had been handled had undermined their position and they felt that it had undermined um, con the confidence that they felt w was in them uh, to be able to continue in that role. Was that something of which you were aware? I wasn't aware of it at the time. Looking back on it and having now seen that correspondence, I, I, I suppose that is not surprising. It was, a, as I say, in the midst of a, a really tough, difficult time uh, for everybody. This was an episode that, you know, I hadn't known Dr Calderwood or worked with her for as long as others had. It was, you know, it was upsetting, the whole uh, circumstance. Um, and so, yes, I can see that perhaps the the process that unfolded over that Sunday of trying to achieve both of those things may have may have given an impression to other advisers that I thought the loss of her would be so catastrophic that they felt that I didn't value their advice or their input. That wasn't the case. I, I can perhaps see why they might have thought that, but that wasn't the case. I mm. highly value um, the, the contribution of, of all of the individuals who were advising me. 
did that experience to any extent undermine the ongoing relationships of the team that uh, remained in place uh, with I mean, you? It's certainly not in my uh, experience, and I don't, I genuinely don't think that was the case. We very quickly, um, you know, moved to an adapted way of working. Uh, Dr. Smith became the, at that time, acting chief medical officer, and you know, later became chief medical officer um, in his own right. And you know, yes, there were difficulties over the next few days. We had to adapt to the loss of somebody who had been very central to our response uh, going forward. But I don't think um, it it damaged relationships at all. I think. Something else that I read into that correspondence was that uh, there had been a sense of, uh, because Dr Calderwood with me had been the, the key communi clinical communicator. Had Dr Calderwood not resigned that weekend, we were already, we, we decided to try to establish a very firm point of you know, contact between the public and, and the government. But you know, that uh, position of, of her doing the daily briefings with me every day would not have been sustainable because it would have taken up you know, too much of the time. She, so we were already uh, planning to move to a situation which we did anyway, where the clinicians would share uh, that responsibility. I might, on that particular aspect of that correspondence, it, it might be read slightly differently, I think, uh, to suggest that the remaining uh, medical and clinical advisory team, if we can put it that way, were of the view that too much reliance had been placed on Dr Calderwood as an individual and not on the team more widely and indeed other sources of uh, expert advice. Um, was that, um, would, would, if, if that is the correct interpretation of that documentation, is that a fair representation of the way in which advice was taken from medical sources by the government? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I can absolutely see why that would be an interpretation that could be put on that, and it may indeed be what uh, the, the author of that correspondence meant by it. Um, Dr Calderwood, Calderwood was the, uh, the principal conduit of advice to me. She was not the sole author of that advice. I, I said earlier on, I interacted uh, regularly with Dr Smith in the period before uh, Dr Calderwood resigned, so it wasn't as if he wasn't a key part of the response. He, he was, and a very valued part of the response. And, you know, we, we've, we, you asked me earlier on about my experience as health secretary um, when uh, we confronted, were confronted by swine flu. Um, and I had, albeit as health secretary at the time, although if swine flu had developed differently, no doubt the first minister would have uh, adopted this role. But I developed at that point a very key working relationship with the chief medical officer, uh, who at that time was uh, Sir, Sir Harry Burns. And so, again, that was part of my le the lesson I'd taken from that, the, the importance of that relationship of having a clear conduit for advice uh, was important. But, of course, she wasn't giving me advice that she was the sole author of. She was drawing on uh, multiple other sources and in, in giving it to me. But in translating, if you like, those sources of information to you and her being the person that you're speaking to, um, there was a risk, was there not, that in that translation, the right information might not be getting to you? Um, there was a risk. I'd, I'd, this, if I've given an impression, so, you know, Dr. Smith would not always be, but you know, equally not infrequently be in the room at the same time. It wasn't that she was the only uh, person that, that I was speaking to. You know, frequently in uh, the very early days, um, she would take part, as Dr. Smith did. At, later in four, the, the, the calls between the four UK CMOs and come straight off that call and give me information that she had got from the other three CMOs. So it was a, it was a, a situation where she may have been the principal conduit of information to me. She wasn't the only person in the room during these discussions. Uh, and I was absolutely aware that she was bringing to me uh, information that came from different sources. Her resignation was, was it not, Ms Sturgeon, um, a cataclysmic event for the ability of the Scottish Government to react appropriately to the threat and also had an enormous effect on public confidence in the Government strategy? Um, I, I, on, on both of those, it had the potential to do both of those things. I don't believe it did either. Had Dr Calderwood not resigned on that Sunday evening. I believe in terms of confidence in the public messaging, it may well have had that impact. I would 
suggest that the evidence through public attitudes and public polling after that suggests that it didn't have that effect. I think her resignation uh, stemmed uh, the potential for that. And on the first, it did have a disruptive effect, but it was one that we were able to overcome uh, reasonably quickly um, and establish ways of working. And, you know, I think Dr... I know Dr Smith stepped up and did uh, a very good job in those circumstances. Um, so I, I absolutely accept the potential for both of those things to happen. I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily agree that either of them uh, were the, the outcome. Thank you. Sorry to jump around a little in the timeline. I'm going to go a little bit earlier than that uh, beginning of April. Um, on the 12th of February 2020, there was a ministerial tabletop exercise called Exercise Nimbus, which took place uh, involving representatives of the UK government, Scottish government, uh, Welsh government and Northern, I Nor Northern Irish executive. Um, was this something you were aware of at the time? <clears throat> uh, I undoubtedly would have been aware of it at a certain level at the time, but I don't think it was something mm. at that point that was particularly... Uh, high up uh, my uh, awareness scale, if, if I can put it that way. You didn't attend it? I didn't attend it, unless you're about to tell me that I did, and I you, haven't you, recalled that. I'm pretty understand. certain I didn't attend it. Um, Ms Freeman also did not attend it. Mm -hmm. Is that your understanding? Uh, that I, yes, that is my understanding. Yeah. It was attended by uh, Mr Fitzpatrick, who is a minister in the health um, mm -hmm. area as well. Um, should either you or uh, Ms Freeman have attended such an event, uh, which was, we heard from Ms Freeman, uh, an event which sought to update pandemic planning in order to apply more specifically to the circumstances of the emerging threat? I, I think, forgive, forgive me, I haven't... Um in, in advance of today, reviewed uh, Operation Nimbus. I, I, I hadn't been aware you wanted to question me on this, so I would have to go and review the of detail course. of that to, to give you, and I'm happy to do so if you wish me to, uh, to give you an answer about whether, with hindsight, on reflection, I think I should have been at it personally. I, I suspect my answer to that would probably be, be no. Um, you know, having a, a minister, uh, Mr Fitzpatrick, involved in that would not be in any sense... Uh, <laughs> abnormal in these circumstances uh, and you know he would have fed back through the normal uh, the normal processes in government what the findings and and conclusions and, and any recommendations from that would have been there would have been I'm absolutely certain senior officials in attendance at it uh, as well I think and Dr Calderwood was at it as well to be uh, Dr Calderwood was at it uh, then that makes part of my point I think and again, you know, we, we may come on to other aspects of this. I think in, in government, in, in normal times, but particularly in the times we were in, not everybody can be at everything. Um, and just because a particular minister or a particular civil servant is not present at a particular meeting doesn't mean uh, that that minister is not engaged in the, 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 the outcome or the, the deliberations around that meeting. But it's a matter of priority between conflicting commitments, one imagines. It, it, most days in government, yes, that is absolutely the case, that there will always be a, uh, an, an element of prioritisation. Would this event not have been in the circumstances, given the evidence we've heard about the possibly. extent of the threat, uh, something which should have been prioritised more than it appears to have been? It, possibly. I, I just, if I, I'm not genuinely not trying to avoid answering the question, I, I've not, in advance of this, reviewed Operation Nimbus, so... I, I don't want to, without having done so, I don't want to be more definitive than I've been. Uh, it, it may well be that what you're putting to me, I would answer yes to, and I'm happy to give some written evidence to Thank the inquiry you. on this point, if that would be helpful. Thank you, Ms Sturgeon. Um, we have seen uh, in a notebook from a, a, an individual named um, Mr Derek Grieve, the Deputy Director for Health Protection Division within the Directorate of Population Health, a number of entries ranging from the 26th of February to the 5th of March, uh, which read as follows. On the 26th of February, it says that he attended the COBRA M meeting with the Cabinet Secretary, Ms Freeman. Um, it's, it, he noted that it's clear all departments in the UK government are fully engaged and mobilised in a way that the, the SG simply isn't. Um, the next day, uh, he, he indicates that despite attempts to encourage them, still no real engagement. 
They then spent 20 minutes talking about internal SG comms, completely amazed. And even by the 5th of March, he notes, I attended director's meeting, laid it out thickly, but few believe this is going to be serious. Uh, is that, uh, as far as you're concerned, and as far as you were aware at the time from your position, an accurate understanding of the state of preparedness and urgency uh, amongst directors in the Scottish Government, in particular uh, the observation that it appeared that the UK Government's operation was uh, sufficiently further advanced? Um, I, I couldn't comment in any detail on the UK Government's operation at, at that point, um, and perhaps I should uh, limit myself to commenting on the government I was uh, responsible for. It, it, that wouldn't be my understanding or experience. Uh, that said, and I didn't know th about these views at the time, Derek Grieve is a, uh, a civil servant that I have worked with in various capacities over my time in government. I, again, you know, he is uh, a civil servant of the utmost uh, professionalism, integrity and, and skill and expertise, so I would take seriously what he says. I, I would make two, I, I suppose, in, in ex acknowledging that I can't directly comment on a meeting I wasn't at and a note that I didn't write, beyond saying that was not my experience at the time. I think there's two other uh, things I, I would say. In preparing for today, um, I, it, it struck me that at a cabinet on, I think, the 10th of March 2020, I make uh, some quite extensive comments about uh, the fact that this is going to be a whole government, whole society challenge and not just a health, I'm paraphrasing. So clearly at that point, it was something I was certainly stressing, uh, that, that it had to be something everybody saw as their business and their priority. Um, the other comment I would make, which possibly is not fair to ascribe, and I'm not trying to ascribe it to Derek Grieve, but I, I remember at the start of swine flu um, as health secretary, that a sense when you're in... A, a crisis that is very much initially focused on health, it is absolutely all you're thinking about. And even people who are thinking about it a lot, but maybe not as much as you, there is a sense of frustration that they're, they're not as, <coughs> as seized of it as you might be. Um, and of course, swine flu, thankfully, didn't progress beyond it being largely a, a health challenge in the way that, that COVID did. Um, my recollection, my experience, my understanding is that there was certainly an increasing over that period realisation of how serious this was in the Scottish Government, but there was a realisation that this was something that was serious and that was going to affect everybody and every section of our society. Can we go to INQ 00023705, please? <coughs> These are the minutes of a cabinet meeting held the day before the entries that I've started to read out from uh, Mr uh, Greaves' uh, notes. Um, on the 25th of February 2020, you're noted as being in attendance. Can we go to paragraph 44, please? It says, uh, under any other business, novel coronavirus, the First Minister informed Cabinet that later that day should be chairing a further ministerial meeting in the Scottish Government Resilience Room mm -hmm. to discuss Scotland's response to the global outbreak of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, about which there would be a fuller discussion at the following week's meeting of the Cabinet. It would be particularly important to ensure that, that, that messages to the general public were as informative as possible and couched in appropriate language. Um, was it appropriate, given the information we've looked at emerging from uh, Professor Woolhouse in particular, that as at the 25th of February, novel coronavirus was being dealt with under any other business with no substantive discussion of what might be done to prevent its spread? I, I think if that had been all uh, that, that, was, uh, that that note was communicating, I would agree with you. Uh, but I was communicating the fact that later that day, I was chairing a meeting of the Scottish Government Resilience Room. Uh, that was, forgive me, what date? Was the 25th of the February. When I started chairing those meetings in uh, 28th, 29th, 29th, I think, of January, um, with one exception, uh, when I'd been visiting flooded areas uh, elsewhere and the Deputy First Minister chaired, I chaired all of these meetings. Um, this was a period where there was significant work ongoing. Uh, there was... Um, either the following week or the week after that at Cabinet, there was a very substantive paper uh, submitted and led uh, by Jean Freeman. So I would suggest that that was giving... If, if that had said, uh, 
there is a, you know, there's a global outbreak of the novel coronavirus, you know, we'll keep Cabinet informed, and there was no action behind it, I would accept that. But that, in Scottish Government terms, is very significant action that is clearly in train um, as a result of that information. And that there would then be a fuller, more fully informed Cabinet discussion in the week uh, after that. This was also not the first discussion that Cabinet had had about COVID. I think the first discussion was on the 4th of February. Um, and so there would have been extensive Cabinet discussions along the way. And you know, that uh, would, is an indication to fuller discussions that were ongoing across Government. There's no note of any discussion relating to procuring or building a testing capacity, is there? Uh, because that one uh, note doesn't describe it, it doesn't. So this is the 25th of February. By the time this note is written, we have already taken the first steps to build testing capacity. Uh, our testing capacity at the end of January, zero. By the 10th of February, two, two weeks before this note, we had established testing facilities in Glasgow and Edinburgh. I think we very quickly after that uh, established a facility in Tayside and in, in Dundee as well. I don't know whether that would have been before or slightly after this note. Um, so clearly, evidently from uh, the, the reality of what was happening, there was work to build up testing underway by the time this note was written. There's no note of any discussion of the current state of building testing capacity, though, is there? Uh, I would... But no, that note suggests there wasn't, but that doesn't mean uh, that that work wasn't underway. The Health Secretary would have been uh, leading that work. The Scottish Government resilience meeting that I was chairing later that day uh, undoubtedly would have touched on uh, that, that work. Uh, and we know, from, we know from what was happening, had already happened, that that work was underway and was progressing. As I said earlier on, the question of whether it was progressing quickly enough is, is another uh, discussion, but it was undoubtedly progressing. There's no note of any discussion or information being shared about uh, procuring personal protective equipment, is there? Again, uh, that does not uh, mean that work wasn't underway. We had, I think, um, in fact, I think, uh, again, I don't, uh, I can't bring it up, perhaps, you can bring it up, but I think one of the first cabinet meetings, no, sorry, the, one of the first briefings I received in uh, January uh, 2020 told me about the first release of uh, face masks from the, the national stockpile. Um, so clearly, again, just because this note doesn't uh, say that these issues were discussed at this particular cabinet meeting, the, the, the evidence, both in documentation, but in, in reality of what was happening, uh, was that this work was underway. The earliest predictions in January from uh, Professor Woolhouse had involved a prediction of a pandemic fuelled by mild cases with mortality amongst the vulnerable. Um, Scotland was known at this stage to have an elderly and vulnerable population, that there were recognised health inequalities amongst those with protected characteristics and in lower socio-economic groups. Isn't that exactly why a project would be put in place to introduce Public Health Scotland to address those issues? Could you, could you repeat that question? Sorry, yes, yeah, certainly. I'm pointing out that the earliest predictions in January 2020 from Professor Woolhouse had involved a, pand a prediction of a pandemic fuelled by mild cases with predicted mortality amongst the vulnerable. Scotland had an elderly and vulnerable population mm -hmm. with recognised health inequalities amongst those with protected char characteristics and in lower socio-economic groups. I've asked you, uh, this was why Public Health Scotland by this stage was in the process of being set up to deal with those very problems, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, sorry, it was, a, it was a very final part of the question. I, yes. I, I hadn't okay. quite caught. Um, yet one of many reasons why Public Health Scotland was being set up, Public Health Scotland uh, was uh, due before uh, COVID uh, arrived with us. Uh, Public Health Scotland was due to uh, be <clears throat> formally established, I think, on the 1st of April uh, 2020, and that was a long-standing programme of work. I, I think it's important to say that it, it is not the case that the Scottish Government only started dealing with these issues when Public Health Scotland was established. Uh, the Scottish Government, through many of its uh, pre-existing 
uh, bodies and, and, and processes were, uh, you know, acutely and intensely uh, focused mm. on health inequalities and uh, the needs of older people. Uh, Public Health Scotland was established because it was thought that having uh, a body of that nature, particularly one that brought uh, the health service and, and local government more closely together, would be better able to, to do that, amongst other things. There's no discussion here, uh, no, no mention here of any discussion or any information being provided about any steps to try to protect that vulnerable part of Scotland's population. I, I know from uh, the work that was underway in the government at that time that all of these issues were being progressed, all of these issues were uh, being worked on. I, you know, I suspect that you know, because not, well, I know that because not all of that is encapsulated there doesn't mean that wasn't happening. Okay, well, what steps note. were being taken to protect the vulnerable part of Scotland's population? Uh, all of the work we were doing to understand COVID, to, uh, to make sure we were preparing uh, and scaling up facilities like testing, uh, making sure that we were uh, in a position to supply PPE. And I know there were you know, many concerns raised about all of these things. I'm not suggesting all of that worked perfectly. Uh, all of that was, was designed to protect, as far as it was possible to do in the face of a pandemic, the, the entire population and within that those who we were uh, beginning to understand were going to be more vulnerable uh, to a virus of this nature. It was part and parcel of all of the work we were doing. At this stage, the Scottish Government was asleep at the wheel, wasn't it, Ms Sturgeon? No. Could I ask you some questions, please, about um, the COBRA meeting, which took place on the 12th of March 2020? Um, we, we went through some evidence in this regard uh, with um, Mr Gove. Um, it's, a, it's a meeting uh, which was chaired by Mr Johnson. Uh, if we could go to INQ 00005622, please. Um, could we go to page eight? Thank you. you. You may recall, Ms Sturgeon, that there was some discussion around this stage as regards Scotland's emerging position, that it was interested in um, seeking to cancel mass gatherings, which did subsequently happen. At paragraph 15, it says, <laughs> continuing the chair said that the GCSA should use the announcement to set out what stage two should be and begin socialising options three and four to protect the most vulnerable. The general public would not be asked to do options two, three or four immediately, but these policies would come in the next few weeks. He respected the Scottish Government's decision to cancel mass gatherings to manage pressure on emergency responders, noting that as the pandemic progresses, this approach may need to be taken by the whole of the UK to protect public services. However, it was crucial for the Government to stick to the SAGE advice as far as possible. The four nations um, should try to stick together as one United Kingdom. And at page 10, there's a list of actions where it states Chief Medical Officers for all four nations, Department for Health and Social Care and Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport to prepare advice for consideration by COBRA on approach to mass gatherings. And then the decision reached underneath at number three, uh, sorry, at number five, COBRA will keep under review the policy towards mass gatherings with particular, particular reference to their impact uh, on public and emergency services. Um, we can see from the first page of this document that this meeting, chaired by Mr Johnson, took place at 1.15pm. Um, do you read that, as I do, uh, to the effect that there was an agreement that COBRA would keep the issue of uh, cancel, cancelling mass gatherings under review and that further advice in that regard would be uh, provided by, amongst others, the chief medical officers for all four nations. I, I accept the, the reading that you have put on the minute. I was at the meeting and yes, there course. was no doubt in that meeting that the Scottish Government was going to uh, confirm a, a decision to advise that the that day it was later uh, before we had legal powers to enforce it, but that we were going to advise the, the cancellation of gatherings of over uh, 500 people. You rightly point to the time of that meeting, 1.15. Uh, just before that meeting, I had taken part in uh, the weekly session of First Minister's Questions in the Scottish Parliament, and I advised Parliament that that is what uh, 
the Scottish Government was minded to do. We would obviously listen to other views at COBRA, uh, but this was a Scottish Government decision to take. I was in no doubt uh, in that uh, meeting that that is the uh, decision the Scottish Government was going to take. By this time, um, I was increasingly concerned that we were not moving fast enough to deal with the, 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 the rate of transmission of COVID. Um, I heard it referred to, I think, perhaps by Mr Gove in evidence to you, that I jumped the gun on mass gatherings. I would counter. I, I think by this point, none of us were jumping the gun. We were arguably all going more slowly than... Uh, we, we should have been. I think the public uh, was ahead of governments at this point and the action they thought was appropriate. Um, my view on mass gatherings, which I set out to COBRA, uh, was that uh, for three reasons um, I thought it important to, to, to take this action at this time. Firstly, uh, that while the medical advice was that open-air events were relatively less risky than others, uh, there was no, it was not the case that there was no risk of transmission. Um, and I thought at that stage, given the state of the pandemic, we, we had to do whatever we could to reduce the risk of transmission. Secondly, I was increasingly concerned at that point about the pressure on emergency services, having to police large events when they were dealing uh, with other pressures associated with COVID. And thirdly, uh, I thought there was emerging a serious disjoint in the messaging of governments, that we were seeking to uh, communicate that this was a very serious threat, but yet saying it was OK for them to continue to go and gather together in big, crowded events. And if people saw that it was OK to do that, would they be less likely to follow the other advice we were giving them? in uh, the day-to-day -day business of their lives. Before lunch, you asked me about the, the rugby match at, at Murrayfield. And you know, I think there is, as you put to me, an argument that should not have gone ahead. So that was my position. I set it out at COBRA and I indicated that the government would confirm that decision. Jean Freeman went to, back to the Scottish Parliament that afternoon to announce, uh, to confirm what I had said at, at First Minister's questions. Um, and I was... I announced the decision that the Scottish Government had taken and I would uh, assert uh, very strongly then and I would now uh, that having taken that decision, we were perfectly within our rights to take that decision um, and I was perfectly uh, not just within my rights to announce it, it was important that I announced it alongside, which we may come on to, the other important decisions that were taken at COBRA that day, that it was essential the public were given uh, quick and effective information about. Are the minutes wrong then? If, if what you're saying, if, if what the reading of that minute is, forgive me, if, if your reading of that minute is putting a question to me that says I somehow breached good faith and and that I did something that was against the agreement in COBRA, there was no doubt in that COBRA meeting. I mean, I think the, it's not in the page that's in front of me just now, mm. where it says the Prime Minister respected the Scottish Government's decision um, or words to... I, I think it was the passage that I referred uh, to earlier at page eight. Yeah, yes. which... Yeah, he respected the Scottish Government's decision. I mean, it's clear that he understood we had taken a decision. Um, well, to be, to be fair, Ms Sturgeon, if one reads that passage in isolation without looking at the subsequent actions, one might conclude that. But one obviously needs to see what's reached by the end of the meeting in the actions, which well, involved further advice being taken on the issue. All I can say is uh, I was in that meeting. I recall it very clearly. And there was no doubt that that was the decision that I communicated. I tried to persuade the other governments to follow suit. As it happens, they all did, I think, follow suit within two or three days because the situation was developing uh, at pace and in a, a not good uh, direction. I, I believe the Scottish Government was right to take that decision then. Um, and if I have a regret about that decision. It's not that I took it that day, it's that I didn't take it days earlier. Including in relation to the Rugby International? I, I, I've tried, I tried to reflect in my answers earlier. The, I suppose what I'm trying to reflect here is how, how difficult those decisions were and how to describe now, looking back with hindsight, something as, you know, in very binary terms, right and wrong. Mm -hmm. I think is, is not always fair in the nature of the decisions we were taking at the time. 
But it is one of the decisions that, yes, if I look back on and could take, you know, have my time again, may go the other way. But that was, that ma match was the weekend before that. So certainly, yes, I, I think that was, yes, if I have a regret, it is not that I took the decision too early, it's that we took it too late. Um, you, you did announce at 3.20pm that day that mass gatherings of more than 500 people will be banned in Scotland, is that right? Uh, if if you tell me that's the time of day, I, I did it roughly, yes. Sir. yes. Uh, you also provided other updates from the COBRA meeting, such as the decision not immediately to close schools. Um, you made these announcements before Mr Johnson was due to speak to the public about the outcomes from the COBRA meeting later. What were the reasons for the timing of your announcement of these matters? Um, well, I'll give you the, the, the reasons for the timing uh, very clearly in a second, but perhaps just to be clear, and I, I don't mean this in a political sense or in any way seeking to be adversarial. My responsibility as First Minister was to the Scottish people, not to... Boris Johnson. I tried and he tried. I'm sure we all tried to work as collegiately as possible. But my responsibility was to the Scottish people. Um, why did I announce those? The, the very nature <coughs> of the decisions we were taking, we were in a, a pandemic of a rapidly transmitting virus. The nature of the decisions we were taking meant that they had to be communicated quickly and clearly to the public. At this particular point, the, the 12th of March, my strong sense was that the public were anxious for, for, for their governments to act, to do more, to be much more on the front foot. Um, we were in that meeting, as well as the discussion about mass gatherings, we had decided uh, at that meeting to advise isolation uh, of symptomatic cases. That was really important in trying to stem transmission. These were not decisions that were meant to be kept secret. It wasn't just important that they were communicated, it was important that they were communicated quickly. Um, so I, I, would, I, I would put it uh, that it wasn't that I communicated these things too quickly. Perhaps the UK government were communicating them too slowly and perhaps not... Uh, doing so with the urgency that at that point was required. Did you tell the UK government of your intention to make the announcement at 3.20pm? It would have been, uh, I'm certain would have been known. I, I don't know whether I specifically said. Again, I don't mean this to sound in any way um, politically adversarial. You know, I, I have a duty to communicate. This was advice we were giving the public. How, how were the public meant to know what we were asking them to do? if I didn't tell them. In Scotland, if I didn't tell them, and the rest of the, Q, the, the, the UK, other leaders didn't tell them. My expectation, and what I do remember, my expectation was that by the time I made, Boris Johnson would already have spoken out of that COBRA meeting. The media, the public, on that day, I remember, were, were desperate for information. I guess I was surprised that I spoke before him, not because I went too quickly, because I was surprised that the time I did it, he hadn't. These obligations of which you speak are, are not mutually exclusive, are they? One can have an obligation to the Scottish people, which of course you, you had, but you can also have an obligation to try to do what one can to uh, maximise the efficiency of uh, four nations working, which was the policy at that time. So, so therefore, would it not have been possible to discharge both of those obligations at the same time? Absolutely, and I always tried to do it. There was only one occasion... Uh, that I recall in a COBRA meeting where the timing of uh, respective communications was discussed and that was on Monday the 23rd of March, the day uh, we went into lockdown and in that COBRA meeting there was a discussion about uh, the Prime Minister communicating first and I agreed and honoured the agreement that I would wait until he finished, this was in the evening I think, before I, I did so. At no other point was there, you know, who's going to do it first or, or you shouldn't do it before I do. I fully, I left that COBRA meeting thinking it important to communicate the decisions that had been taken to the Scottish people because it involved the Scottish people doing things and not doing things in order to try to, we were in a race against a virus in order to try to stem transmission of a virus. I fully expected the Prime Minister to do exactly the same. I think it would have been wrong and negligent to wait for ages before telling people 
what that COBRA meeting had decided. Did you consider that you had a duty of confidentiality as regards the matters discussed at the meeting? Uh, I did not breach confidentiality. I am not bound by uh, confidentiality in, in a UK government sense. But nothing in this was a, these were Scottish government decisions. The fact that we were all agreeing them in a four nations context did not change the fact they were decisions within the power and responsibility of the Scottish government. Um, I was not breaching confidentiality. And I would go further than that and suggest that, given the situation we were dealing with, the whole notion of confidentiality is, is a bit absurd. This was a virus that was spreading rapidly at this point. We were taking decisions that were about trying to stem the spread of that virus. And the only way those decisions could have the desired effect was if the public knew about them and if the public knew about them quickly. And therefore, in my view, the responsibility on all of us, I can't speak for uh, Boris Johnson, but the responsibility on all of us was to get out there and tell the people of Scotland, uh, tell people across the UK what we were asking them to do and not to do in order to, if we'd operated on the basis of these decisions being confidential, then I think self-evidently that would have been a very, very uh, mistaken position to be in. There was a commitment at this stage by the Scottish Government to seek to promote four nations working in light of the fact that the virus was no respecter of man-made boundaries or responsibilities. Is that right? I had a strong commitment to four nations working, even when our, the detail of our approaches started to diverge. I didn't ever uh, form a view that four nations working wasn't important. My understanding of Four Nations working is we aligned our approaches where we could and where we were, for legitimate reasons, taking different approaches. We tried to nevertheless work together, understand each other's position and coordinate where we could. Um, but I, you know, I had a duty as First Minister of Scotland to the people of Scotland. If I had simply, in order to keep a notion of four nations working that I know some people hold to, which is that it should mean we all do this exactly the same at all times and that should be decided by the UK government. I would have ended up, and the Scottish government would have ended up, acquiescing in decisions that we thought were wrong and not in the interests of keeping people as safe as possible. But I never, I had many, and I know Michael Gove spoke about this on uh, early Monday, I think uh, he was here, and we worked... I would pay tribute to Michael Gove in particular on, on these matters. We had very, didn't always agree, but we had very constructive discussions. I always sought uh, to work as collaboratively as possible within the Four Nations framework, but I couldn't allow that to usurp my duty as leader of a government with particular responsibilities to take the decisions we thought were best in the circumstances. It would be necessary in order to try and promote the likely success of four nations working to work with respect for the other uh, <coughs> participants in that process. Do you think that's a correct principle? I, I do. Um, you said a moment ago that uh, you considered the UK government's expectation that these discussions would be conducted confidentially to be absurd. Does that suggest any respect on your side? I, I don't think it, it, it suggests any a, a disrespect. I was making a point about the... the the nature and status of decisions being taken in the face of a, a spreading virus and making the point that by the very nature, these can't be confidential decisions because otherwise the public doesn't know about them and therefore can't implement them. Um, and that's the point I was making. I always try to be respectful in you know, all my dealings with the UK government. There were, not just in COVID, but in many things, you know, moments and issues of tension, uh, where no doubt they found me difficult to work with, at times I would find them difficult to work with, but I always tried to be respectful and be constructive in those interactions. The, Mr Gove gave evidence to the fact that uh, what had happened on that day caused considerable irritation, at least on the part of a number of individuals, including the Prime Minister, uh, on the basis that there was a perception that you had uh, not behaved respectfully and breached confidentiality. Um, was that a phenomenon of which you were aware at that time? Um, it wasn't particularly. I, I suppose I can see why that would have been the case. I, at that point, the last thing in my mind was I wasn't setting out to irritate anybody, but equally I wasn't 
you know, I, I had reached a view, the Scottish Government had reached a view that to try to stem transmission of the virus, we should advise the cancellation of mass gatherings. COBRA had taken a decision that was asking people with symptoms of COVID to isolate and not leave their homes. I took the view that it was vital to communicate these decisions and to communicate them quickly and effectively. I wasn't doing it to irritate anybody, and I'm sorry if that was the effect, but my overriding... Yeah, I, I got lots of things wrong in the whole process of this. I, I, I don't suggest otherwise for a second. But my overriding motivation and priority was to try to reach the best decisions, communicate those decisions so that the public could comply with those decisions and we could collectively try to stem the spread of a virus that was already doing significant harm. The phenomenon of you making announcements about matters before the UK government would go on to become something of an issue between the governments. Were you aware of that? Uh, yes, I was. I, I didn't think then and I don't think now it was fair or rational. Uh, fairly early on, I can't remember exactly when, my daily briefings became set at a, a time of day, I think 12.15, slightly later in the day, when I gave statements to Parliament, because uh, that was determined by parliamentary sitting times. So my, my public announcements were at a fixed point in the day. The UK government decided to have theirs, and I'm not, I'm not making any criticism, but they decided to have theirs at 5pm or thereabouts. That was their choice. If they had wanted to speak before me every day, they, they had the choice of doing that earlier. I was simply trying to communicate decisions to the public that we were relying on the public to comply with. I was trying to do that uh, openly. I was trying to do that as clearly and as effectively as I could. At no point in, in my thinking was I trying to steal a march on anybody else or trying to get ahead of it. I was simply trying to I was simply trying to do my job to the best of my ability. Your job, however, as we've identified, involved a responsibility to the Scottish people, of course, but also a responsibility to try to promote four nations working. Why was it that those two obligations were not able to coexist? I, I don't believe it is the case that they didn't coexist. But in order for me... I have to choose my words carefully here. In order for me not to to use the phrase that's been put to me, irritate Boris Johnson, I think I would just have had to adopt a position of doing whatever Boris Johnson wanted me to do. Now, as First Minister, if I thought the UK... As, look, you know, we, we will focus here on areas of disagreement or divergence. There was a huge amount of good joint working and alignment and, and uh, you know, the, the different governments working together effectively. But where I thought the UK government was taking a decision for England that was not the right one, I would have been negligent in my responsibilities just to go along with that in order to, to avoid I am bizarrely irritating people. I suppose another point in this is it's, it's been described, it's often described as if the UK government's position on these things was the, the, the orthodox one and any of the devolved administrations that diverged were stepping out of that orthodox position. That wasn't, that's not, I, I think, the right way of, of looking. Often in these issues where the Scottish government was diverged, in the language the UK government would use, diverging from their four nations' preferred road, we were joined in that by Wales and Northern Ireland. So, so often, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland were in exactly the same position, but the UK government, as was their right, had decided to take a, a different position. In effect, they often became the outlier in Four Nations decision-making, not Scotland. Surely that can't have been the UK government's position, Ms Sturgeon, because in the schedules to the Coronavirus Act 2020, the UK Parliament had granted power to Scotland, we'll avoid the word, to diverge, to, to differ, to take a different path. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question you're putting to you. Me. You were suggesting a moment ago that um, 
the, the UK government thought that the way this should work is that their position should be the orthodox one, and there should be some limitation on Scotland's ability no, to, to take a different path. The, the legislation made it clear that the UK absolutely. Parliament had granted that power. No, in, indeed. So that cannot possibly be the well, UK government's position. What I'm saying is often that some of the comments you're putting to me about me being or others being irritated at things I did. Those aren't my words. No, no, so, putting those words forgive me, Mr. I know, I know they're not your words. Um, but that gave the impression that while the, the legislation was exactly as you set out, when the, the reality of that manifested itself in different decisions, then somehow that was an irritation. It was not intended to be an irritation. We were all trying to do our best based on the, the, the epidemiology, on the you know, demographic and health profile of our, our countries to try to take the best decisions we could. I simply make the observation, you know, the, the first, I, I suppose, significant policy divergence was in early May over the stay-at-home uh, advice when the UK government decided to move to stay alert. It's often been suggested that that was the point at which the Scottish government diverged from four nations' decisions. In actual fact, at that point, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland stuck with stay at home and the UK government for England moved to stay alert. I'm just making the point that when things are described as the Scottish government moved outside of four nations decision making, we took the decisions we thought were best, but often we were in the same position as two of the other four governments that made up the four nations. On the subject of the legislation, uh, was it your understanding or had you received advice about whether the Scottish Government considered that the Scottish Parliament had power to impose restrictions before the enactment of the Coronavirus Act 2020, which came into force on the 26th of March? I know I was aware, and we were always very clear, that uh, until uh, that, came into, that, that act came into force on the 26th of March, 25th, 26th of March, as you say, uh, that you take mass gatherings. Uh, until that point, it was advice that yes. we were giving. It was not enforceable until that point. Um, and similarly, I think with the initial stay-at-home advice for a period of a day or two, that was advice until the legislation came into force. So the position, as you understood it, before the enactment of the Act was that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament did not have the power to impose restrictions. Hence, those decisions were uh, issued on an advisory basis. Uh, Yet yeah, we wouldn't have had the power to enforce uh, restrictions. We, of course, had the power to advise people to do yes, certain Which is what you did over that period. Um, did Scotland, the Scottish Government push for an earlier lockdown? Uh, this, well, the Scottish Government uh, started, so no is the, the answer to, the, the, the simple answer to that, in the sense that we weren't uh, pushing the advice to uh, have a lockdown uh, really only crystallised through COBRA on the, the 23rd of March, uh, so no. But <clears throat> as I think we have just uh, been reflecting on in the context of mass gatherings, the Scottish Government was starting uh, to move or argue that we should be moving more quickly. Um, one example of that is the one we've been talking about, mass gatherings. We also uh, took the decision to recommend the closure of schools slightly, I think, as it happened. Uh, others followed suit again fairly quickly. Uh, but at that point, I was of the view we had to start moving more quickly and started to... To, to demonstrate that through the examples I've spoken about. Um, I, one of the, before I, I say this, I, I can't say, and I don't know that anybody can say with certainty what difference it would have made in the overall uh, trajectory of the pandemic and the outcomes of the pandemic. But of the many regrets I have, um, probably chief of those is that we didn't lock down a week two weeks earlier than we did. Um, you are a staunch supporter of Scottish independence. I believe that well, the record will show that to be true. Yes. yes. It runs through you to your very core, does it not? It does. Is it possible, do you think, for you to take decisions on any matter without seeing them through the prism of Scottish independence and your burning desire to achieve it? Uh, yes, I, I know for a fact it is, and if I ever doubted that before uh, COVID, although I 
had other examples of, of doing that in the job of being First Minister and Health Secretary before that. I, I have been in politics for 30 years. I've been a lifelong campaigner for independence. I don't think in my entire life uh, have I ever thought less about politics generally and independence in particular than I did during the course of the pandemic and particularly in those early stages of the pandemic. People will judge, you know, for better or worse, the decisions my government took. I want to say to people uh, and give this inquiry an assurance that none of those decisions were influenced in any way by political considerations or by trying to gain an advantage uh, for the cause of independence. I was motivated solely by trying to do the best we could to keep people as safe as possible. And we did that to some extent, but not to, and perhaps we never could have done it to the extent I would have wished we could have done. And um, I carry the, the regret for the loss of life, the loss of opportunity, you know, the, the loss of education of our young people. I carry the get of that with me every single day. Um, but in all of the mistakes I made, um, that I will concede some I may argue weren't mistakes, I will absolutely assert very strongly that I did not take decisions for political reasons and I certainly did not take decisions influenced in some way uh, by considerations around the constitutional argument. I, uh, on the 18th of March 2020, uh, my constitution secretary, Mike Russell at the time, wrote to Michael Gove saying that we were suspending all work on an independence referendum. That didn't recommence apart from uh, reactive work in a particular very focused thing in before the Scottish election in 2021. That didn't recommence until uh, much later in 2021. The government I led focused entirely on trying to do the best we could through COVID. It's a matter of instinct for you, isn't it, to seek to promote the cause of Scottish independence? Uh, yes, it is, but perhaps... When you suddenly find yourself in a position of being the leader of a government in the face of a global pandemic, you suddenly find that the instincts you thought you had are not the instincts that come to the fore. My only instinct in uh, the early part of 2020, and this remained the case, was to try to take the best decisions I could and for my government to take the best decisions we could to steer the country through COVID. Um, and I, I hope that people observing the Scottish Government, observing how I went about things during that period, whatever they think about me, my politics, my government, I, I hope that any reasonable person will, will have seen that. It's a matter of instinct to seek division between the Scottish Government and the UK Government to achieve no, and promote the cause of Scottish independence, isn't it? No, it's not. As you said, the position, uh, as at the beginning of the pandemic, I think you said the 18th of March, was that Mr Russell had written, in fact, to Mr Gove to indicate that uh, campaigning for a second independence referendum would be suspended. That, yes, I, I think we also requested at that time that the UK government did likewise around the constitutional project of, of Brexit, and that was declined. The, the UK government never suspended any of its work on Brexit. One of the reactive things that the Scottish Government officials had to do during COVID was respond to consultation on the Internal Market Act, for example. Mm. It was the transition period for Brexit, wasn't it, in 2020? There were, so, so work was required on that? Well, I, I think that is perhaps a, a matter of opinion uh, rather than fact. Okay. Um, could we look, please, at INQ 00021448? Page 13, paragraph 56E. This is um, the 30th of June, Cabinet Minutes. Um, an agreement is reached at the end of this uh, Cabinet meeting uh, that it was agreed that consideration should be given to restarting work on independence and a referendum with the arguments reflecting the experience of the coronavirus crisis and developments on EU exit. The Cabinet agreed on that date, did they not, to seek to promote the cause of Scottish independence by politicising the pandemic? Uh, no, I, I, I respectfully don't think that is a, 
a fair or accurate reading of, of that part. I remember the, the meeting. Um, there was no uh, particular discussion. This was a Brexit paper. Again, you know, we were having to consider issues around uh, Brexit. We had no choice in that matter. This was a, a Brexit paper. Um, I don't there was no particular discussion around that uh, recommendation, uh, as far as I recall. We agreed that consideration should be given to restarting work. In matter of fact, work did not restart. It was not consideration that led to that happening. Um, and that is, that is the fact of the matter. We agreed to consider something. I certainly am not aware of being part of any real consideration, because in my mind, there was no prospect of starting work on independence at that time. But in any event, it didn't happen. Why would there have been any mention of this at all, given Mr Russell's announcement? Um, I think it's very, it would have been very difficult in the context of a debate or a paper on Brexit, uh, perhaps for that not to have, so that would have arisen in the context. This was not a COVID paper uh, that this conclusion uh, was attached to. This was a paper on EU exit. It was a paper on Brexit. The words say what they say, Ms Sturgeon. Consideration should be given to restarting work on independence in a referendum with the arguments reflecting the experience of the coronavirus crisis. I appreciate the words say what they say. I, I'm not arguing with that. But the facts also say what they say, which was that whatever consideration uh, may or may not have been given, I, I certainly wasn't uh, part of it at, at that point. And that if somebody you know, had come to me after that and said, right, OK, should we consider this and restart work, I'd have said absolutely not. The facts are that no work did restart on independence at that point. You've told me earlier in other contexts that cabinet minutes are really the highest source of authority as to what was actually happening. Not in this case, apparently. Well, well I'm not saying they don't reflect a, an outcome of cabinet. I'm, I'm saying that that didn't happen. So <clears throat> we didn't restart work. Whether or not cabinet had... You know, somebody in the course of a cabinet meeting had said we should agree consideration of this. The fact is it didn't happen. A few hours after this meeting, on the same date as these cabinet minutes, you appeared on your regular coronavirus briefing and said, frankly, anybody who is trotting out political or constitutional arguments is in the wrong place completely and has found themselves completely lost. Is there not a hypocrisy between saying publicly that any, anyone who is making constitutional arguments during the pandemic is in the wrong place uh, and uh, completely lost, and having, there having been a decision in Cabinet hours before uh, that uh, there should be consideration of restarting work on the campaign for independence, uh, reflecting the experience of the coronavirus crisis? That had not been a, a significant part of the discussion. It was clearly a comment that was made, otherwise it wouldn't appear in the, uh, the conclusions like that. But I did not leave that Cabinet thinking we were about to restart uh, work on independence. And uh, I would have made my views clear that that was not going to happen uh, if that had been the case. We didn't restart work on independence. Uh, we didn't, um, you know, we had to, over the course of the pandemic, we had to respond to a court case that had been taken about a judicial review that had been taken. You know, governments have to answer PQs or FOIs. Um, we had to respond to some Brexit, uh, but we didn't. Uh, we, all of the, uh, the the team that had been working pre-COVID on independence and an independence referendum had, at the start of COVID, been redeployed into COVID work. Sturgeon, oh. <clears throat> that's not a comment. The, the, the minutes read, agreed. That means Cabinet agreed, doesn't it? Well, so it, are you saying you would have overruled Cabinet? If after that... so. Let me be clear what I mean. There was clearly some uh, comment made in that cabinet meeting that said, oh, maybe we should think about restarting work on independence. Remember, this was at a point where uh, we had, uh, we were in, uh, going into the summer 2020 where cases were falling and... Uh, no, no, just please focus on the point. It's agreed. It's not a comment. It's, it's an agreement by cabinet. But agreed that consideration should be given. What yeah. I meant is if somebody had come to me afterwards and said... We've done this process of consideration and we now think we should restart work on independence. I would have said, I don't want to do that. And I would have said to Cabinet, let's not do that because it's not the right time to do that. But I think more materially, that didn't happen. Nobody came to me and said, you know, if, if that said, agreed to restart work on independence, that would mean something much more than that does. There was not a process of consideration that then 
saw somebody come to me with a proposal to restart work on independence. And I'm sorry, uh, Milady, I'm genuinely sorry if it sounds as if I'm dancing on the head of a pin here. I don't mean to. But the key point here is that we did not restart work on independence at that point or anywhere near that point. If it were to be decided on the basis of the evidence before this inquiry that, that, that there was a politicisation of the pandemic and that you had used the pandemic as a, as a means of uh, pursuing uh, your goal of Scottish independence. That would be a considerable betrayal of the Scottish people, would it not? Um, with respect, I, I don't believe that, that conclusion uh, would fairly be reached because it's not what I did and I don't believe there is evidence uh, to but suggest... But you, you've given your position, Ms Sturgeon, as to whether you did it or not. My question um, was, if it were to be decided that that's not right, if, if I that had would be a considerable betrayal of the Scottish people, would it not? If I had at any point decided to politicise a, a global pandemic that was robbing people of their lives and livelihoods and educational opportunities and had decided in the face of that to prioritise campaigning for independence, then yes, it absolutely would have been as you described, which is precisely why... I didn't do it and wouldn't have done it. If that's a convenient moment, my lady. Certainly. <coughs> I shall return at quarter past three. <coughs>
think I beat mm. most of the public galleries, so we'll just wait a second. Of course. Yes, Mr Dawson. Thank you, my lady. Ms Sturgeon, moving on to a, a different topic, uh, that of border controls. Um, we heard evidence earlier in the module from a Mr Halliday, who is the chief statistician to the Scottish Government, that the UK Government and Scottish Government uh, would make decisions about restrictions of people coming into the country, going out of the country as regards visiting others or coming in, based on largely the same data about the threat of an individual country. Um, I think he said that the, the data would often come through the Foreign Office, which would have contacts in the countries to try and work out uh, what the threat was. Um, is that your understanding, broadly, of the, the evidence base upon which decisions was taken? Although, of course, a different analysis of it might yeah. have been undertaken. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's broadly my understanding. I think uh, as uh, the matter progressed, the Joint Biosecurity uh, Committee became uh, central to the provision of that data. Yes. Um, and. It's fair to say, is it not, that there were, uh, although not necessarily huge differences between the Scottish position as regards which countries people come in or go out to, there were periods where that they weren't quite the same as the UK government. For example, on the 3rd of July, the UK government published a list of 59 countries for which quarantine restrictions would no longer apply to travellers <coughs> arriving in England from the 10th of July. However, at that time, quarantine requirements remained unchanged in Scotland. Um, yes, that, that would be uh, my broad uh, recollection of, of that. Um, generally, I think on international travel, rightly or wrongly, there was more alignment than yes. divergence. I, I, I think when uh, the, the air travel started to be opened up in the summer of 2020, um, the regulations took effect in, in June 2020, um, the key difference... Um, at that time was that there was, a, for a short, relatively short period of time, uh, Spain was one of the countries uh, that the UK government had opened up a, what was called at the time a travel corridor mm. with, and for a short period of time Scotland didn't do that. We delayed doing that for a period. I think it was then, Spain was then taken off that by all countries later on. Yes. It, it might not be entirely surprising that there wasn't huge difference, if we're mm -hmm. avoiding the word divergence, um, because it was based on the same data, although the, the, the essential point I'm trying to make is that the Scottish Government had, in terms of its devolved public health responsibilities and indeed responsibilities under, which had been given to it under the 2020 Act, it had the power to control that for Scotland. Uh, yes, I, I think borders are one of these areas where the, the interface between devolved and reserved uh, responsibilities is particularly complex. So uh, the Scottish Government, I think, under the, uh, the Public Health Act, uh, 2008, Section 94, I think, to be precise, has the uh, ability to uh, put uh, limitations or restrictions on people coming into the country for public health grounds. Um, so that's a statutory position. I think, practically, we rely on Border Force, which is a reserved uh, organisation, yes. to uh, deliver that uh, in, in a practical sense. There's then, obviously, the case that, as we encountered later on, that if there were differences between the two, one of, one of the things that made it difficult for the Scottish Government, whether or not we thought it was desirable to take a different uh, position, as if we may have had a different set of uh, rules at, say, uh, Glasgow Airport, but people, uh, if they wanted to avoid those restrictions, could fly into London and travel up by rail or, or road. So it was an area where the... Uh, the, the differences in, in power and responsibility were often complicated by just the practical realities. Yes, I think we've seen some documentation that suggests that that particular issue, going to Glasgow via Manchester or something, that was an issue early on when travel was a big part of the decision making, and then it came back later on under Mr Yusuf's uh, period as uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health. Um, the, could we have a look, please, at INQ 00029264? <coughs> Um, this is uh, an exchange of emails uh, which shows uh, we're going to page six, please. <coughs> so the, the page at the top, I think, indicates that the position here, as at the 20th of July, is the Deputy First Minister was requesting a call to discuss international travel um, and that there were a number of people uh, who were involved in that. Page six, please. <coughs> Uh, 
previous page, please. Sorry, Mr. Yeah, this is a, we can see here that it's an email from the Deputy First Minister, uh, Mr. Swinney, um, to um, a number of people, including yourself. Is that right? Um, Are we on the same page here? Yes, the 19th of July, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary Education and Skills 2, and there's a number of people listed yeah. there. Oh, yes. First one of whom yeah. is First Minister, and, and a number of others, some, some of whom actually we've heard from, uh, Audrey McDougall, Roger Halliday, etc. Um, and this is uh, yeah, an email um, in which um, some details around the um, discussion which the Deputy First Minister had been interested in having on international travel, where it says, Ken, I'm extremely concerned about this. Spain is now being held to a much higher level of scrutiny and performance than other countries. If it is not added to the exemptions list, ministers will have to explain why not when it has an estimated point prevalence rate of 0.015 compared to 0.33 when the decision not not include was originally taken. 0.015 is verging on green. And there is visible action from the Spanish authorities to do whatever it takes to suppress outbreaks, compare and contrast with outbreaks in England. It won't matter how much ministers might justify it on health grounds. The Spanish government will conclude it is entirely political. They won't forget there is a real possibility they will never approve EU membership for an independent Scotland as a result. This is a, an email copied to you. To what extent were concerns about the possibility in the future that Spain would block uh, an application for EU membership by an independent Scotland uh, a factor in the decision making around the Spanish travel corridor? I, they weren't. Uh, for me, I, this email is copied to me. I assume I would have seen it at the time, but I remember very well the decision making uh, around this. Uh, I think. It was around the 10th of July that travel corridors were introduced and we had significant doubts about adding Spain to that uh, because the, uh, the prevalence of the virus at that time was higher in Spain than it was in Scotland. But that was moving and over the next couple of weeks, uh, I think, uh, if my memory is serving me correctly, that, that change, uh, prevalence was reducing in Scotland and actually was uh, in Spain and rising in Scotland. These are decisions um, that were taken for public health reasons. They were you know, difficult decisions. They were often very finely balanced decisions. And uh, you know, if, if that concern had been the one driving the decisions, then you know, presumably a, a great criticism, not least from our own airport sector at the time, we wouldn't have, have kept uh, Spain off the travel corridors in the first place. Why is it though, that there is discussion if matters are being addressed solely on public health grounds, about the possibility that the Spanish government uh, may conclude that there is a political aspect to things that they will not forget and that they may vote subsequently against um, uh, EU membership for an independent Scotland. Why is that even part of the discussion? I, it wasn't part of my consideration. I, I certainly, uh, to the best of my knowledge, didn't have any discussion uh, of that nature. I didn't write that email. I can't speak for other people as to why that was, was written uh, in that way. What I can tell the inquiry, um, sitting here today answering questions, is that's not the basis on which uh, the, the discussion uh, took, uh, not the way in which the, the decision was taken. These were finely balanced decisions on public health grounds that often, uh, in fact not often, always uh, clinical advisors would be uh, inputting their own opinions to as well. Go to page four, please. This is an email chain. Yes, and an uh, email from uh, Ken Thompson to a number of people. It says there, colleagues, you were mostly on the call with FM and other ministers just now. The FM agreed to a pause in which we were to give her advice on the implications for the borders review of non-care home COVID cases currently being investigated. We have to do this rapidly, obviously. I'm proposing to write the outline of the advice to ministers and to ask some people to comment and contribute to that. Um, is the position then that there was a on the 20th of July, shortly after this, quarantine requirements for Spain were lifted? I don't have that date in front of me, but I, I, I know it was a, a relatively short space of time uh, between uh, 
the Scottish Government not lifting them and, and lifting them. But if, again, if memory serves me correctly, uh, we then qu very quickly reapplied them. I think all of the countries in the UK re that, That's correct. I understand them, it. On the 20th I, of July, I think what happened is that you, you agreed with other ministers that uh, there should be a pause to the restriction, but that those were reimposed from the 26th of July. The... The, the, the relative prevalence was changing uh, at that point. We had reached a point uh, where uh, we thought on public health grounds that it was, uh, that it was appropriate uh, to add Spain to the travel corridors and then uh, the, the, the data uh, obviously changed that position. Did the uh, consideration regarding uh, the political implications uh, connected to Spain mentioned in the previous email feature on the call that's been referred to? Uh, not that I can uh, recall, uh, so uh, that is not my recollection. But you were the one that made the decision to pause uh, the restrictions, despite the fact that there was uh, concerns about the, uh, the data uh, upon which such a public health decision might be made? Well, at that point, the data had reached... A a position where we felt we could make that decision. I mean, I, I, I would suggest that had the consideration that appears in the, the previous email that was shown to me been guiding uh, the decisions around this, we would not have taken the decision which was extremely controversial at the time and attracted criticism, I think, uh, from many people and including very hefty criticism from uh, airports in Scotland and airport in, in the city, uh, we would not have done that uh, in the, the first place. The fact that we were, in the face of that controversy, prepared to take a decision uh, that was to continue to apply restrictions to Spain at a time when other parts of the UK were not doing that, would, I hope, suggest that these were decisions being driven by data and public health considerations. But the decision on the 20th of July was that quarantine requirements for Spain should be lifted, but then they were reimposed on the 26th. And the data, was, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's possible to, uh, you know, put, put on the screen what the, the changing data around that time would have been. I, I remember that period. The data was changing uh, at that. This is July 2020. We were... Uh, Sadly, it was relatively short-lived, but we had reached a, a low point in cases in Scotland um, at that point. Spain had been particularly high. That was the reason for our initial decision. Spain uh, had taken, I think, further steps to suppress the virus. It was coming down there. I can't, I'm not sure whether at this point cases would, there was even the indication yet of cases starting to rise in Scotland. These were decisions that involved changing data, uh, data that was often changing uh, on a daily basis. Um, can we look at page two, please? Um, and in, in this regard, again, uh, Dr Smith says that he asked for a view on the robustness of this data for Spain. There's been a remarkable change in the point prevalence from the set considered previously. It's difficult to reconcile with the public facing evidence of multiple large outbreaks in, in, in uh, different areas mm -hmm. of the country. And he, he asks whether can anyone offer an assessment of this. Now, the, the evidence, therefore, on a public health basis would tend to suggest that there would be multiple large outbreaks which would not be consistent with the decision taken the next day to lift the quarantine. Is that correct? Um, no, actually, I, I, with, with respect, I, I read that differently uh, to that. What I think uh, Dr Smith is saying here, although he would have to... Uh, tell you what he meant is that while we were seeing evidence of multiple large outbreaks in different areas of Spain, and that was what had driven our concern about having uh, restrictions on Spain lifted, the point prevalence data uh, was actually showing something different. It was showing a change that was suggesting that cases were coming down um, at that point. And my, not just my reading of this, my, my recollection of the discussions at the time is that what that is saying is that notwithstanding these very high profile outbreaks, the overall data for Spain shows that the risk is reducing, which was what was driving our decision around the 20th of July to lift restrictions before that data, I think, started to go in the wrong direction in Spain again. So despite concerns about the robustness of the data in the face of evidence of multiple large outbreaks, you did open up uh, the travel corridor to Spain, albeit only for a short period? With, with, with respect, I... I, I do think the interpretation of this that's been put to me is not... What this is saying 
and I remember some of the discussions at the time, is that the data, the point prevalence data, was no longer backing up uh, the, the, the ongoing restrictions, that despite there appearing to be outbreaks, they were outbreaks in particular parts of the country, and the overall point prevalence data uh, was showing that the, the risk from the virus in Spain was reducing. And actually, I, I, I do consider that this and the discussions that lay behind this were actually what was driving, not, not that this was contrary to the decision we took at that point, but that was part of what was driving that decision at that point. But surely it doesn't make a lot of sense if there are issues about the robustness of the data to change the position. And in any event, we know that you had to change it back a few days later. Mr Dawson, uh, there was issues about the robustness of data at every step of the management of But this would you not take a more precautionary pandemic. approach if the, if the changes in the data didn't seem to add up? We... We were under a lot of pressure from airports uh, at that point. We were under a lot of criticism for being an outlier in, at that point, I think, I, can't, I think we were at that point an outlier. And the data, the point prevalence data, was showing uh, that we were no longer able to justify uh, the position we were taking of more uh, onerous restrictions on Spain. Um, and that was, that, that was the position. The data was particularly around comparisons between different countries uh, was changing all the time. It was, a ne it was necessary to assess not just the, the overall data, but the, what, what lay behind that data. Um, if it's what's been put to me here is that this was a politically driven decision, um, and certainly on my part, it was, it was absolutely not. Uh, and I, I come back to this. Decisions that were taken by my government in this period, um, I hope many of them were right. Um, I think some of the outcomes, in a relative sense, suggest that that would be the case. Some of them were undoubtedly wrong, but speaking for myself, none of them were driven by extraneous political considerations. Could I go to INQ 00274143, please? You will recall um, that Mr Johnson visited Scotland on the 23rd of July 2020, Sturgeon. I do. Yes, and this is a tweet by you where you say, I welcome the PM to Scotland today. One of the key arguments for independence is the ability of Scotland to take our own decisions rather than having our future decided by politicians we didn't vote for, taking us down a path we haven't chosen. His presence highlights that. Um, this is a political tweet relating to your support for the cause of independence in July 2020, isn't it? It, it is, um, but it's also a response to... Um, the Prime Minister at the time uh, coming to Scotland and very overtly describing that visit as a, a mission to save the Union. I think he had first-person pieces in uh, at least one newspaper ahead of that. Now, in reflection, should I have risen to the debate, the, the debate and posted that tweet? Probably not. Um, but I would never even have been in that space at all but for the pretext of, of the Prime Minister's Visit. I, I was also, because he was coming to Scotland, because uh, of the narrative that the UK government had put around his visit, I was inevitably being asked about it in my, my briefings and interviews. Um, but, yeah, perhaps I should have been the, uh, the bigger person and not reacted in that way with that tweet. I had intended, of course, to put to you also the context, which is that um, on his visit, and I think in the newspapers before, Mr Johnson has spoken about the might and merit of the union. And therefore, your uh, interpretation of that is that he was seeking to politicise the situation. Is that right? Um, I, I think I say in my um, written statement, I, I, to be fair, I, I don't think generally the UK government tried to politicise the pandemic. Um, I think this was a, a rare exception to that. If they did... So, so you think this was? I, I, I think Boris Johnson, not, not coming to Scotland per se, but mm -hmm. coming to Scotland with the narrative that they put around mm -hmm. that uh, was an exception to what I've said. That I, I think generally they didn't try to politicise the, mm -hmm. the pandemic. And other than this occasion... The occasions where I thought they did, it was more around, you know, Brexit and the vaccine rollout being possible because of Brexit. Um, so I, it's not a general accusation I, I would have levelled at them. I think this was an exception. I, I listened uh, to parts of uh, Michael Gove's evidence earlier in the week and, and now realise that there may have been discussions at UK government level that led to this that I wasn't aware of at the time. Yeah. 
Um, so this was a response. Was it as a mature a response as with reflection I might have wished for? Perhaps not. But it wasn't, yeah, it, it wasn't me deciding suddenly to start talking about independence apropos of, of nothing. It, it was a response to of nothing. It, it was a response to the Prime Minister's visit and, and in particular the narrative of his visit. Again, Ms Sturgeon, in fairness, I was also going to refer you to the paper that we took mm. Mr Gove to, the State of the Union paper, which he delivered to the UK Cabinet on the 21st of July, two days before the visit, in which he described the risk to the Union as the greatest challenge for the UK Government to confront and said that protecting and strengthening union, the, the Union had to be the cornerstone of all that the UK Government did. So I, I put to him that that put some context, which of course you were not aware of at the time, to the visit. But your position, as I understand it, uh, was that I may have politicised the pandemic, but he did it first. Uh, no, I don't think I did politicise the pandemic at all. I, I, I responded to a, a particular narrative of his with a tweet and, and undoubtedly some answers to, to media questions. Um, and the answers to media questions were unavoidable because I took lots of questions every day from journalists. The tweet, yeah, perhaps I shouldn't have, but it, I don't think a tweet adds up to politicising the pandemic. Perhaps I was just trying to defend uh, the position against the, uh, the, the claims that were being made. Perhaps, though, the accumulation of evidence which we've looked at might suggest that there was an attempt on your part to politicise the pandemic. I would strongly uh, argue the reverse, uh, and with respect to the evidence that's been put to me today is the evidence of that, I would say it demonstrates nothing of the sort. In the period after the election, did you attempt uh, to revive uh, the uh, campaign for a second independence referendum? I think the uh, work that on a second independence referendum did not restart in government until much later in 20... There was an announcement in, that was you made in September September, which is some six months or more after the Scottish election. What I'm interested in exploring is whether, in fact, there was within the Scottish Government an attempt uh, to seek to do so before that. We went with uh, Mr Thompson to an entry in his diary from a period in May 2021, shortly after uh, the election, in which, amongst some reflections about uh, his, his position and his, uh, his future role within the Scottish Government, he wrote the words, Indy back. Does that not suggest that it was a policy of the Scottish Government at that time to try to seek independence again, despite the fact that you made no announcement to that effect until September? It, it, as a matter of fact, it, it was not the case that work on independence restarted at that point. We were still in... You know, a very challenging situation with COVID uh, through the summer uh, of, of 2021. So I, I, I heard uh, Ken Thompson's uh, answer to what that meant, that he was looking ahead to things that might be uh, on the, the horizon for civil servants and the varying degrees of challenges they might be facing. As, as a matter of fact, uh, independence work did not restart at that point. point. So at risk of contradicting... Um, somebody I've got the, the highest regard for at that point, Indy, was not back. I'd like to ask you some questions about uh, the zero COVID or elimination strategy, which we've touched on already. Um, you say in your statement, um, I was of the view that zero COVID in the period before a vaccine was available was an aim worth striving for. I knew that our circumstances, particularly if the rest of the UK was not following, following suit, meant it was unlikely to be completely achievable for any sustained period of time. Um, was there a zero COVID policy in the Scottish Government uh, in the summer of 2020? There was a maximum suppression uh, strategy. I think the, uh, the, the phraseology that was used and it was in, if not our first strategic uh, framework, then uh, later iterations of that was suppressed to the lowest possible level and, and keep it there. It is undoubtedly the case that we would have colloquially used terms like zero COVID um, and elimination, uh, although emphatically not eradication, which is a very different uh, concept uh, to describe uh, that strategy in shorthand. Um, basically what we uh, and uh, I was articulating, I, I on many occasions uh, explained this at, at briefings and in response to questions, at no point uh, was my belief uh, that we would get COVID 
to a level where it was eliminated and, and went away. Uh, that would take a vaccine. But in the days before a vaccine um, and before you know, effective treatments, when COVID, the direct harm of COVID was so severe, we needed to suppress it as, as far as possible, both to protect life, but also to create the conditions where we could start to safely open up the economy and, and society, and that the best way of achieving maximum suppression was to try to drive it as low uh, or as close to zero as possible. And that was uh, the, the position of the Scottish Government, uh, certainly throughout the summer of 2020. That uh, strategic objective changed uh, later, uh, I think around about the, the spring, early summer of, of 2021, uh, when we got to the position where growing and, and significant numbers of the population were vaccinated. Um, on the 14th of April 2020, the Scottish COVID Advisory Group provided a formal advice entitled Lockdown Review, um, in which the government was advised that it was the group's advice that in the context of there being no vaccine or specific drug treatments available to prevent or treat COVID-19, and to quote, we do not believe that it will be possible for the foreseeable future to eradicate the SARS-CoV-2 virus, henceforth virus. We need to find ways of living with the virus as best as possible which includes protecting the NHS and social care capacity uh, to care for citizens. Um, around this time, what planning did the Scottish Government have uh, about the, the prospect or the requirement uh, that had been advised by the COVID advisory group that there would need to be found ways of living with the virus? We were already actively uh, planning for that. And in fact, off the back of the kind of advice that was coming through, we published <coughs> In late April 2020, uh, our strategic framework for decision making. Uh, there were other publications with more detail on that through me. And then, of course, at, uh, I think on the 28th or later in May, round about that time, we published the route map, route map for exiting lockdown, um, which set out different phases of lifting the, the restrictions and therefore opening up and starting to live with the virus while keeping it, uh, for, for, uh, to, to use a, uh, an expression for shorthand, as under control uh, as we could. Um, the, the word eradication appears in that advice. I, I just want to stress it was never. Eradication and elimination mean very different things. Um, in preparation for today, I came across um, the way I articulated uh, the elimination uh, strategy in a briefing, I think in June 2020, uh, where I say explicitly elimination is not eradication. It is about getting the virus to the lowest levels you can, which doesn't mean it has gone away and doesn't mean it won't rise again, but it gives us more confidence that we can keep it under control with surveillance testing and contact tracing um, and with targeted measures as opposed to blanket lockdowns. That's what was meant by it. It was a way of all through this, we, we got it, including from uh, the, the, the COVID advisory group and, and certainly uh, from SAGE, as we came out of lockdown, we had to come out of it in a way that avoided the R number going above one again. And people will recall references across all the governments at the time to how much headroom we had, and therefore we had to open up in a phased way. And that's what we were trying to do, open up, learn to live with the virus, but keep it under control so that it didn't take off again and start overwhelming us in the way that it had in previous uh, in the, the early stages. That was a very difficult balance to strike. Um, it involved lots of judgments about what could open, what had to stay closed, what the phasing of that was, but that's what we were trying to achieve. Can I but just check that we've got the note correct? Because that is what I understood you to say. Did, did you say elimination and eradication are different things? Uh, yes. Aren't they the same thing? Uh, no. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this sort of epidemiological, I, I think um, you, you will find Gregor, comments from Gregor Smith and uh, comments he's made. Uh, I, I came across one in a committee in the Scottish Parliament that we both appeared at. Eradication effectively means you, you, you get to a point where a disease has gone away and, and it's not a risk anymore. Uh, with COVID, uh, that... Uh, was likely and understood likely to only come with vaccines. Elimination was effectively, you know, as I put it there, it doesn't mean it's gone away, it doesn't mean it won't rise again. You're, you're taking measures to try to keep it at a level as close to no cases as possible, but it doesn't mean that 
if you lift those measures, it won't start to transmit again. So in, in epidemiological terms, I'm not an, an expert on this. No, Other people can explain it, it much like better people than people are playing fast and with the language. But. Um, well, I, 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 I was trying, um, obviously not as successfully as I, I hope to. I, I read out a quote there from a briefing in June 2020, where I'm obviously being asked these very questions. And I start by saying elimination is not eradication. I, I, didn't, I didn't come to that conclusion myself. That was the, the, uh, expert, advice. the expert advice that was being given to me. Pardon. Language in this regard is, of course, important, Ms Sturgeon, isn't it? <coughs> Very much so. And I always tried to be as precise as I could in my language, hence explanations like that. I, I am not suggesting for a second I always succeeded. Because the language of zero COVID and uh, elimination or eradication uh, permeated um, the public's understanding of what the uh, objective uh, was, didn't it? In that we were trying to... Uh, get to a point where we were suppressing the virus mm. as, as much as possible. But the, the word suppression wasn't the word that was generally used by the Scottish Government at this time, was it? I, I believe, and it's my opinion, and, and others will take a different view, I think the, the level of understanding of the public at that time was, was very sophisticated, and I think there was an understanding of, of what was being talked about, what was meant. Language is really important, uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, I, one of the things I, I think I was perhaps criticised for it on the day of lockdown was calling it an effective lockdown um, when the Prime Minister at the time didn't use the term lockdown. I, I took the view that we needed to communicate with people in language that they were using themselves, that they could understand, that we could then make sure was, was defined. So I, I think there was an, an understanding of what was meant by that, that we, we couldn't make COVID go away, you know, but we could keep it at levels that wouldn't overwhelm us, get contact tracing and surveillance and testing back so that it was allowing us, as for much of 2020, from, you know, through the autumn of 2020, before the Alpha variant it came, we managed to do through particular outbreaks, uh, outbreak control, then the level system that we used for a period. We were having a degree, not complete, but a degree of success in that. And that was only possible because we had got over the summer the virus to a sufficiently low level to allow those approaches to be successful. The language is important, Ms Sturgeon, because the language of elimination or eradication rather than maximum suppression, which is a phrase you're using just now, uh, gave people the impression uh, that uh, COVID was over, didn't it? I, I genuinely and very firmly don't believe that was the impression at any point in Scotland over that period. I, just for to be clear, I never used the term eradication. I, I, went, I was at pains when asked about it. To be clear, I wasn't uh, talking about eradication. Um, but I, I don't believe that was the view in Scotland over uh, any well, Mr. Sturgeon, you know perfectly well that people jumped on planes to Spain and this caused the second wave. Uh, well, we've just been talking about how we tried to you know, deal in a way that was cautious around uh, travel to, to other countries, in, including Spain. Um, some people went on holiday that summer. I, I don't, I think many people didn't. I think many people tried, uh, many people wouldn't have gone on holiday at all. Many people who did stayed up in Scotland and uh, holidayed at home. Some people would have gone overseas. I, I genuinely don't believe that was because people thought, uh, the majority of people thought COVID had gone away. I, I stood up every day and reminded people COVID hadn't gone away and wasn't going to suddenly and, and magically go away. And I think there was a, a very high degree of understanding. And I've talked earlier on about, you know, criticism, perhaps, and I, I don't mean this as a criticism of them, some of our sternest critics over this period were uh, the, the airport sector um, who felt that my messaging in Scotland was actually making it was discouraging people from going on foreign holidays at a time when they thought they were being encouraged in, in perhaps other parts of the UK. You wanted to have the reputation, did you not, of the person who had driven COVID out of Scotland? I'd never thought I was capable of driving COVID out of Scotland. I hoped that the decisions my government would take would keep COVID uh, at the lowest possible level so that it took the lives of fewer people, you know, minimised the disruption to people's livelihoods and the education of, of children. I, I, 
the, the, the thing I find, uh, I, I guess, forgive me, I appreciate I'm here to answer your questions, I'm not. I accept this, that, that there will be genuine and serious scrutiny about the, the content of decisions that were taken. And some of those decisions I wish I'd taken, my government had taken differently. Some, I think, uh, were right. Um, my motives in this were only ever about trying to do the right thing to, to minimise the overall harm that the virus was doing. The toll it took in Scotland, as in other parts of the UK, was far too high, so I didn't do that as successfully as I wish I was, had been able to. Um, but perhaps in some ways, the measures we took had some impact. I, uh, Professor Serene, uh, Serene Diamond, the UK statistician's evidence to this inquiry, uh, looking at the you know, quite significant lower uh, deaths in terms of COVID-19 on an age standardised basis in Scotland than in other parts of the UK, still far too high. We were always trying to protect people and to minimise harm in all of its forms. And, and the nature and the content and the substance of those decisions deserve to be scrutinised as, as closely as possible. Um, it genuinely, um, I take it very, very you know, personally when people question the very motives, because I know that the motives were absolutely uh, in good faith and for the best reasons. Your desire to be the person that drove COVID out of Scotland was the reason why you entered into uh, direct Twitter messaging with Professor Sridhar, whom Professor Morris, the chair of the COVID group, uh, has told us was in a minority of one in being the only person on that group who thought that COVID could be driven out of Scotland at that time. Um, I don't think that is a fair representation of, of, of her view, but I'm not here to speak for her. Can I just say, I, I didn't... This wasn't about my reputation as the person who drove COVID out of Scotland. I, I desperately wanted to minimise the harm of COVID in Scotland. I was not under any illusions about the reality of the situation we faced. Uh, I reached out to Professor Shudar, um, I, I think for two main reasons. Um, one was that she... She was a member of the advisory group, but she was also somebody, I think, to her great credit, who was seeking to communicate through the media uh, messages that she thought was important um, regularly. As a result of that, I was periodically being asked um, for my response to views she'd expressed, and I, I wanted to you know, have, make sure I understood where she was coming from. Uh, she was also, I knew, very uh, plugged into the responses in different countries. I think she had... Uh, connections into the WHO, uh, the government of New York at the time and, and other countries. And I, I was at that stage, I just wanted to understand as much as I could about the pandemic, about other countries' approaches. It was part of a process of, of me just trying to make sure I wasn't missing anything. I wasn't overlooking anything. And that while I wasn't trying to elevate one voice over others, I was wanting to make sure that if, if she was a minority, voice, that I wasn't losing a different perspective, that I was able to hear, that it wasn't being lost in the consensus, that I was able to hear the diversity of, of views. And again, you know, the motives were only, whatever mistakes and misjudgments I might have made, the motives were only about trying to equip myself as well as I could to do the job that I had I was in the position of having to do. Your messages with her demonstrate a coordination of your two, the two of yours media strategy. What you were trying to equip yourself with was uh, the view of a scientist who would support uh, your view that elimination was possible, even although she was in a minority of one on your COVID advisory group. Um, I, I don't believe that the messages... Well, I, whatever the impression the messages might give, I know there was no coordination of media strategy. My media strategy was fairly uh, obvious and, and well, uh, well established. Uh, she was speaking in the media. Generally, there was a, an alignment. I wanted to, the Scottish Government to be suppressing COVID as much as possible. And, and whether you know, she believed that that could go further than, than others believed it could and that I believed it could... Generally, the, the thrust of those messages was in vain with, with what uh, the advice to me was and, and to the messages we were communicating to the public. Um, 
she this frequently is... runs what she intends to say in the press and in uh, press interviews uh, by you in order to ensure that your positions are aligned. I, I, the the, the uh, volume of Professor Shidar's uh, media output uh, would suggest that if she ever did that, it was on uh, a, a very small number of, of occasions. Um, and, but also in terms of, I would very, very frequently at, in the question and answers that followed uh, my daily briefings be asked about her views. So some of uh, what you're reading in messages about and, and uh, putting to me as coordination was simply, you know, flagging up things she'd said uh, in order that I knew what it was when I was asked about it. I, yeah, I come back to the point I, I keep making. My decisions and judgments can and should be scrutinised. My motives were never anything other than just trying to do the best I could in a situation that at times, I'm sure for every decision maker, felt as close to impossible as I've ever experienced. The focus on the elimination strategy took the Scottish Government's eye off the need to prepare for a second wave, which experts would have told you was inevitable, did it not? We knew a second wave was almost as close to inevitable as anything it was. Well, no, it didn't. Pre preparation was done for it. Uh, that I don't, uh, I don't accept that that is the, the case. We, through the autumn of uh, 2020, we went from uh, lockdown to an opening up of uh, the country through the, the road map, the route map rather that we'd set out at the end of May. Uh, we got to a point where we couldn't go to the final phase of that because of the date, the epidemic epidemiology at the time. We then had a period where instead of reimposing uh, measures, we were able to uh, deal with outbreaks. We had some very localised outbreaks. We de dealt with them through uh, specific measures and then the level system was applied. And actually contrary to we didn't do anything to prepare for a, a second wave, we had continued to build up the testing and uh, contact tracing capacity there that was a necessary part of trying to m mitigate and minimise a second wave and deal with that as it happened. As it happened, the, the second... W we, we didn't uh, go into a second lockdown in November uh, 2020 in Scotland. Uh, the second lockdown in Scotland uh, came when the Alpha... Uh, variant came along. So I don't accept that we were, our eye was off the ball. I think we were taking difficult decisions, reaching difficult balances in the best way we possibly could. And I think the evidence overall is that while our response was far from, you know, far from uh, avoiding all of the horrible, horrendous harm that was done. I would say an assessment of the, the outcomes overall suggests that while our uh, approach was far from perfect, it actually managed to uh, mitigate some harm that perhaps wasn't mitigated uh, in some other places. In his uh, statement to this module, Professor Mark Woolhouse states at paragraph 345 that the start of the vaccine uh, rollout vaccine campaign, which you will remember, Mr. Sturgeon, started towards the end of 2020 and into 2021, uh, created a false impression that the pandemic would soon be over and described it as over optimistic. Professor Sridhar, uh, when we looked at your direct messages with her, uh, when I asked her uh, why the messages had stopped at the end of 2020, gave the answer that when the vaccine arrived, input of the nature that I had been providing with regard to fighting the virus was no longer necessary. Was it your view and that of the Scottish Government that the pandemic would soon be over as a result of the arrival of the vaccine? Uh, no. Um, the, the, the pandemic is... We're no longer in a pandemic, but people are dying from COVID every week as we speak. <coughs> Last year, I, I think 2,000 people died of, of COVID. COVID has not gone away. Arguably, COVID will never go away. And I have never believed otherwise. In fact, uh, I, at points, face criticism for almost suggesting the, for suggesting the alternative. I was criticised at points for being the voice of doom um, around COVID. What happened with the vaccine 
uh, was that we entered a different phase. Uh, we entered a phase where, unlike uh, the situation until that point, we had we haven't talked yet. I don't know whether we will about the Scottish Government's four harms approach. We had no way of mitigating harm one, which was the direct health impact of, of COVID. So we had to, albeit trying to minimise harm overall, we had to have a particular focus on reducing harm one and harm two to some extent as well. When the vaccine came along, we had a way of mitigating uh, harm one without restrictions, which allowed us then to rebalance towards harms three and four. So we entered a very different phase of the, the pandemic because of the impact of vaccination. And that's why across all of the four nations, uh, we put such a great emphasis on as fast as possible, a rollout of the vaccination campaign. Could I ask you to have a look please at INQ 00033472? Returning to exchange between um, Mr. Youssef and uh, Professor Leach, this time on the 10th of June 2021, pages 12 to 13. Uh, for, forgive me, I'm, I'm not seeing Sorry, it. yes, we'll just get it up. Yeah. My, my apologies. Uh, So again, um, this is an exchange in June of 2021. You, you may recall, Ms Sturgeon, that one of, which we looked at this with the current First Minister, the, one of the characteristics of um, the fight uh, against the, the virus in 2021 was that there were a number of large events uh, which ran the risk of uh, spreading the virus and decisions need to be taken around whether those should be allowed to go ahead or not. Um, this was a discussion in particular around the decision making with regard to um, the possibility of cancelling a fan zone which had been put together for the Euros in Glasgow, uh, which it was eventually allowed to go ahead. And the exchange says at 11.45, Professor Leach says, and still it goes on, FM wants more advice. Her instinct says cancel fan zone. Her office will write back, which Ken is writing, to ask for more, and then Ken will gather legal, etc., to reply. Mr Yusuf says, yes, yeah, she messaged me this morning, wants more detail from GCC around costs involved if we cancel. Uh, and then there's some discussion around how much it would cost. £6 million pounds is mentioned. Uh, and then at 11.53, Mr Yusuf says, £6 million pounds seems cheap for 31 days. Wonder if that factors in costs of food and beverage suppliers. Uh, would have expected to make over the course of the fan zone may look for compensation. Either way, if FM is going to cancel, needs to be done soon. She could hold the line and see how we get on and what the scenes on Monday look like. If people behave, then that might settle her nerves. Uh, Mr. Professor Leach, yep, I think that's costs, not profit. Uh, and he says she needs to do it before or at FMQs, if at all. And then Mr. Yusuf says, I'll tell you what, from knowing her for 15 years, it is not often her instincts are wrong. Uh, both um, Professor Leach uh, and uh, Mr Youssef, the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, uh, seem to be describing the ultimate decision taken in connection with the possible cancellation of this event uh, as a matter which will be governed by your instincts. That's how you made decisions during the course of the pandemic, wasn't it, Ms Sturge? I, I think had the fan zone been cancelled, that is certainly an accusation that, based on this exchange, could have been uh, made of me. But the fan zone wasn't cancelled, therefore my instinct didn't govern the decision. That was my instinct. I was, you know, the, the Euros delayed by a year were happening. The fan zone did make me very nervous about people coming together in that way, given what we were dealing with. That was my instinct. I asked for further advice and consideration. That advice came back and I was persuaded on the basis of the advice that my instinct was not what we should go with. We should go with the the advice and that is that is the position I, I you know you you have in a man in managing a situation like this you have instincts about what's sensible and what's no, not sensible in a whole host of things had I only if I had made decisions purely on the basis of that then that would have been deeply uh, misguided but I didn't I had an instinct I probed the question I asked for advice through proper channels I considered that advice carefully um, and on the basis of that, agreed that it should go ahead. And as it turns out, I think it was the right decision to allow it to go ahead because it, it, it was, uh, it did not, uh, the risk that I'd been worried about did not materialise. 
Would you agree with the proposition, Ms Sturgeon, that the Scottish Government's pandemic strategy was run on your instincts? No. Decisions were ultimately made not by Cabinet, but by you and a small band of trusted advisers. Um, I, as I have said uh, earlier on, I think the evidence uh, before the inquiry uh, of the Cabinet uh, papers and the Cabinet minutes uh, show that that is not the case. I, I was the First Minister. I had a responsibility to lead to try to see the, the whole picture when Cabinet secretaries, uh, rightly and properly, are, are focused on their own portfolio interests. Um, in any leadership position, you have instincts. You, you learn to, to trust or also to know not when, when not to trust your instincts. But as this exchange, again, I, I, I would say, if this exchange had ended with her instinct is to cancel the fan zone, and at 12 o'clock at First Minister's Questions, I had stood up and announced the cancellation of the fan zone, that would prove, uh, I think, the, the proposition you're putting to me. But it didn't. I had an instinct. I tested it I get, I, with the experts. I asked for advice. I considered that advice. And on the basis of that advice, decided the opposite of what my instinct had started out telling me. Part of your instinct is based on a desire to seek to advance the cause of Scottish independence, isn't it? Uh, not in the management of the pandemic. I've, I, I don't think um, it's any. I don't think I'm breaking any news uh, today to say that I have spent a lifetime campaigning for independence. I will no doubt continue to campaign for independence. I, I, I know I will. But when in a position of leadership and decision making, you are confronted with um, a global pandemic. And as I remember sitting one night in probably February 2020 in Butte House with a set of reasonable worst case scenario figures in front of me and a figure for the potential number of deaths that might unfold, which thankfully didn't unfold at that level, my instincts became something completely different. In, in that moment, my only instinct and the instinct I brought to the management of the pandemic was how do I lead a government that makes the best possible decisions in horrific circumstances to try to minimise the harm that this virus is going to do. And people will make their own judgments um, about me, about my government, about my decisions, but... Um, for as long as I live, I will carry the impact of these decisions. I will carry regret at uh, the decisions and judgments I got wrong. But I will always know in my heart and in my soul that my instincts and my motivation was nothing other than trying to do the best in the face of this pandemic. It was your instinct to seek to create a difference between your approach and that of the UK government despite the obvious need in the face of the virus for a collaborative strategy, wasn't it? Uh, no, it wasn't. It was my instinct to do everything I thought was necessary and appropriate to minimise harm to the people of Scotland. That was my instinct. And where that necessitated being different to the UK government, it was more important to me that we did what we thought in Scotland was right than it was in aligning with decisions we thought were wrong and would potentially increase harm rather than minimise harm. Um, I, I feel to my core that the number of lives lost to this pandemic were far too high. We were never going to be able to get through a pandemic with no loss of life. Um, I think it was far too high. I think the other impacts were, were far too high. And you know, every death is a tragedy that uh, I regret um, and that people in this room and outside across the country are, are living with the grief and trauma of. So we didn't do as well as I wish we, we were able to. Uh, I think I quoted the evidence to the inquiry for, from Serene Diamond. On the age standardised mortality measure, the one that he says is, is legitimate, the, the deaths in Scotland were significantly lower than in other parts of the UK, far, far too high. But that says to me that even if it was only at the margins, our decision making managed to minimise the harm to some extent. And was that your, was my sorry. duty. 
It was your instinct to seek to move away from existing structures uh, which had been designed to try to uh, manage procedures uh, in, in this type of situation like COBRA and SAGE and to form your own. Um, I would have, uh, if, if I can address SAGE and COBRA, it wasn't my decision when COBRA met, how often it met. I wish COBRA had continued to meet. Uh, the Prime Minister at the time decided not to have COBRA meetings. I wasn't able to convene COBRA meetings at my own hand, um, and so I am not responsible for uh, the frequency of, of COBRA meetings. SAGE, I, I thought SAGE did a very good job during the pandemic. At the outset of the pandemic, I thought the quality of advice coming from SAGE was very high. I had two concerns about it, uh, or, or about having that as the sole as a source of advice. One was, understandably, and this is not a criticism, its advice was not necessarily tailored to the demographics, the health profile, the epidemiology in Scotland. And secondly, I had no ability. I didn't even know at the start of the pandemic who was on SAGE. I had no ability as a First Minister to, to speak directly to people on SAGE, to ask them questions, to deepen my understanding. So I asked for an advisory group to be established in Scotland, not to replace SAGE, but to help fill those gaps. SAGE and the advisory group through, uh, and, and put on record my, my deep thanks to Andrew Morris, who chaired the advisory group, it established reciprocity. So Andrew became an, a, a member of SAGE, papers were shared. It was not seeking to replace SAGE, it was augmenting and supplementing uh, SAGE so that I felt the, the, the functions that SAGE wasn't able to perform for the Scottish Government were delivered in that way. It was your instinct to be seen to be following a different path from the UK Government and to seek to get your word in in public first, wasn't it? No. It was your instinct to keep decision-making secret and ultimate, uh, as regards the way that decisions were ultimately reached the process by which they were made, recorded and retained? Uh, no. I, uh, I think, delivered more than 250 uh, public addresses over the course of the pandemic where I answered. Uh, people will judge the quality of my answers uh, in the way that they want, but answered questions. I didn't take one or two questions. I answered every question that came to me. I sought at every stage to be open, to be transparent, to level with the public about the mm. complexity of this, the difficulties, the almost impossible balances we were trying to strike and what we were taking into account in coming to the decisions we were coming to. It was your instinct to think that you knew best, rendering the published strategies of the government and the apparent advisory structures around you nothing more than, to use Mark Woolhouse's words, rhetoric? Uh, absolutely not. Um, we implemented the strategies of the government to the extent that the, the, the virus allowed us to. Uh, we changed and adapted them in line with how the virus was operating. Mm -hmm. I valued, um, I was reviewing uh, some of the minutes of the COVID advisory group last night in preparation for today, and uh, the minutes frequently have the Scottish Government officials reporting about how highly I valued the advice of the group and them saying how much they valued the opportunities through the deep dives for us to uh, speak together and for me to ask them questions and for them to be able to help. Um, I was assisted. I did not know best. That's why I sought to take advice from as broad a range of people as, as I could. That's why I reached out to people like <laughs> Professor Schroeder. That's why I read everything I could get my hands on. Um, I did not know best. Um, and I was assisted at every step by, you know, first-class clinical and medical and scientific advisors, by senior civil servants, principally in the Scottish Government, but let me put on record uh, that that was the case on the part of many people in the UK Government, people like Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance and Jonathan Van Tam, people who were, you know, hugely <laughs> helpful to me and to, to the Scottish Government and, and advisors, and I would not have been able to get through uh, the task I had without their advice and expertise that I benefited from on a daily basis. It was your instinct to seek to portray yourself as open and honest with the public, but at the same time to keep from them uh, important elements of the management, 
such as the Nike conference, care home deaths and the advice around the rugby, uh, which allowed COVID into Scotland in the first place? I, I, I am not sure that that last statement uh, would be established by, by facts, but I stand to be corrected. The health, uh, health, Public Health Scotland sorry, genomic uh, survey that uh, study that was done later in 2020 that looked at the different ways in which uh, COVID came into Scotland. I, I, I don't think it would be reasonable to draw from that, the, the, the statement that the rugby brought uh, the virus into Scotland, but I stand to be corrected on that if, if I am wrong. I, I've tried to be as... Um, I've tried to explain as fully as I can the decision-making around Nike, um, the reasons for that, the legitimate reasons for that, but how I think it is reasonable that people think that was the wrong judgment. Um, I keep saying you know, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages of cabinet papers and cabinet minutes that set out, if that was all that was available on the, the record, sets out a comprehensive uh, full and detailed explanation of the decisions we reached, the choices we faced and the reasons that drove our decision making. Scott, the people of Scotland deserve better than a pandemic strategy run on your instincts, did they not, Ms Sturgeon? I, they did indeed, which is why that they didn't get a pandemic run on my instincts. We started these evidential hearings uh, a couple of weeks ago with oral evidence from Mrs Jane Morrison a representative of the Scottish COVID bereaved group whose wife died of COVID acquired in a hospital in October 2020. Mrs Morrison and her group had sought answers about matters of significant concern to them uh, and about the pandemic in a meeting with you in March 2021. They did not get them. In the statement of the Scottish COVID bereaved to the inquiry, uh, the remaining representatives of many who died, these words appear hubris does not stop a pandemic. The story of COVID in Scotland is the story of the hubris of Nicola Sturgeon, is it not? Uh, no, uh, I do not believe that to be the case. I am in the fortunate position of not having personally lost anyone to COVID. Um, I wish with every fibre of my being that the decisions my government have been able to take could have reduced the number of people in Scotland today who did lose someone uh, to COVID. And I am deeply sorry to each and every bereaved person and each and every person who suffered in other ways. I did my best, my government did our best, and people will judge that. Um, but I know that every day I tried my best and those working with me tried our best to steer this country through the COVID pandemic in the best way we could. Thank you, Ms Sturgeon. I have no further questions. There are some questions uh, from uh, Scottish I think Covid. Mr McCaffrey has some questions. <coughs> Obliged, my lady. Ms Sturgeon, I am instructed by Amar Anwar and company on behalf of Scottish Covid bereaved. Um, with reference to your statement, which is uh, found at INQ 00033933, and your evidence this morning that you wish to deepen your knowledge about the virus, I'd like to take you to paragraph 149, subparagraph B of that uh, statement. And this relates to you inquiring as to the possibility of asymptomatic transmission. You'll see there that it says, whether COVID-19 could be spread person to person asymptomatically, the initial advice I received was that asymptomatic transmission was not possible. My private office replied on my behalf and at my request with the following query. First Minister read information online in the last 24 hours, including references to an article in yesterday's Lancet, suggesting the opposite of this. That is that people may be infectious before being symptomatic what is the very certain statement in paragraph 14 based on? I received further advice from Public Health Scotland on the 25th of January. This included the following extracts. It is likely that person-to-person -person transmission, when it does occur, mostly involves transmission of virus from people with symptoms and infected people with symptoms. For example, someone who is coughing are much more likely to spread virus around 
than someone who is infected but free of symptoms. The evidence and advice on asymptomatic transmission remained uncertain until around April or May 2020, after which there seemed to be more of an acceptance that asymptomatic transmission was an issue. So my question, uh, Ms Sturgeon, is therefore, why then, if by that date you knew that asymptomatic transfer was possible, would you consider that releasing people from hospital to care homes, but only testing if they had symptoms, was any protection at all? And on the basis of this, this advice received from Public Health Scotland that asymptomatic transmission was a possibility, why was it maintained that there was any uncertainty about this issue? Would it therefore not have been prudent to have erred on the side of safety? Uh, th th thank you. Uh, if I can very briefly, um, as you can see from my evidence there and the extracts from advice and my responses to that advice, uh, there, if I can summarise, I, I think, as it can be seen there, the, the issue of uncertainty was not so much a binary one of was there or was there not the possibility of asymptomatic transmission. The uncertainty was the extent to which uh, that was a serious issue. And the, certainly the advice that came to me and I, I think the advice from the WHO until uh, certainly into the, the spring, perhaps early summer of 2020, was that uh, there was uncertainty and disagreement about whether it was uh, a very small risk or a, a much more substantial risk. Um, and that, that was uncertain. At the, However, notwithstanding uh, uncertainty around asymptomatic transmission, what there also was, and certainly an advice that came uh, to the Scottish Government, was an uncertainty about the uh, reliability of testing in people who either were asymptomatic or, or pre-symptomatic. So there was a, a concern, and it wasn't uh, a suggestion that testing was not important, but there was a concern, and this was a concern that was still being expressed to the Scottish Government when, in April when the Cabinet Secretary uh, changed the position to testing of, of all admissions uh, from care homes, uh, from hospitals to care homes. There was a concern that testing on its own uh, could give rise to false assurance. Somebody who tested negative uh, may uh, still have the virus if they were asymptomatic. That is why the early uh, advice around care homes focus very much on isolation um, and keeping people separate. Um, and notwithstanding the, the limited availability of the testing at the time, there was a concern that testing on its own would uh, not be sufficient to guard against those risks. I, you know, on care homes in particular, I think there are very serious issues for all of us to reflect on here. Testing is undoubtedly a significant part of that. Discharges from hospitals in uh, particular are a very serious part of that. And I'm not shying away from that. But I also think there are other issues around care homes, and all of which the Scottish Government has to take responsibility for, that we mustn't lose sight of in a focus only on testing. The report that Public Health Scotland did later in 2020 about discharges from hospital um, showed that almost all care homes in Scotland over that period from March through to May uh, had discharges from hospital. But only a third of those care homes uh, had an outbreak of COVID or had residents who died from COVID. Um, so that suggests that, yes, discharges and the circumstances of discharges must be looked at seriously. But that would suggest, and, and the number of deaths were, were very heavily concentrated in relatively small numbers of care homes. So there are other issues, I think, that we need to probe very, very seriously around the structure and the size of the care home sector, the resources and the regulation in care homes. These are all profoundly important issues. Testing is a significant and important part of that. But my, my view is that there are other aspects of that that we must also make sure we consider in, in the course of a fuller examination around the, the situation in care homes. Well, that just goes back to the, the, the latter part of the, of the question, that w with all that uncertainty and the lack of capacity in testing, would it not have been uh, prudent to err on the side of safety and not discharge to care homes? Um, when we 
we're in the early part of uh, the, the pandemic, and I'm talking here about late February into to March 2020. Uh, the, the objective was where somebody didn't have uh, the need, medical need to be in hospital, it was better for them to be discharged. I mean, that is generally true at all times, but we were watching on television in countries like Italy, hospitals filling up with COVID patients. So yes, we wanted to make sure we had available capacity in our hospitals to deal with people who needed hospital treatment, but there was also a concern that hospitals would not have been safe in terms of the virus for vulnerable people who didn't need to be in hospital. I do not think uh, we got everything right around care homes, and I deeply regret that. But I also know that we, it wasn't the case that we didn't think about the best way to try to protect people in care homes. Uh, the guidance, there were undoubtedly flaws uh, and deficiencies in that guidance, but the advice at that time was that isolation, uh, keeping people as separate as possible, it was the best way to protect people in care homes. Now, clearly, uh, that didn't uh, have the effect that we wanted it to. I, I am, of all of the important issues around this pandemic, the situation in care homes is one of the most important to properly scrutinise and understand. I am, I suppose, simply saying that I think testing is an important part of that. But I think, for me, it raises a lot of other issues about care homes, the care home sector, how we 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 the ways in which we sought to protect people and the uh, the effectiveness of that. And I think it is in the interest and it's, it's a duty to those who are bereaved, um, who have lost people in care homes, that we do understand that in the fullest possible way. Thank you. C could I maybe ask you just to try and keep your responses uh, as, as short as possible? Obviously, we're limited in time and uh, uh, we want to get through as many questions as we can. Um, moving on to uh, document reference INQ 00037-0312, and that should come up on screen uh, at page four of that document. Uh, d didn't your inquiries at the end of January when Public Health Scotland explained that asymptomatic transfer could occur in response to your question about it mean that you did indeed know about asympt asymptomatic transfer at the relevant time? So the phrase quoted there that we see on screen, and we didn't know what we know now about asymptomatic transmission, was in fact incorrect? Um, no, I, I, perhaps it's not as fully expressed there um, as I've had the opportunity to do to you today. I, I, if you go back to the, the statement you showed me a moment ago, it was actually me who first queried a briefing saying, I don't think it is right to say that asymptomatic transmission cannot happen. So it wasn't that we didn't know asymptomatic transmission couldn't happen, but we didn't know uh, at the outset what we came to know that it was potentially a significant driver. <coughs> the, the response that came back to me from uh, Health Protection Scotland, as it was then, still was saying they thought it was um, it was overwhelmingly likely that it was people with symptoms who would transmit. So we didn't know everything we came to know about asymptomatic transmission when I made that statement, but that's not the same thing as saying we didn't know anything about it. Were you aware of any recommendations made by Scottish Care in March 2020 in relation to the need for robust clinical assessment and testing of residents entering care homes, both from the community and acute NHS settings? And if so, how did this affect your decision making? Um, I was aware of uh, comments and recommendations that uh, Scottish Care uh, and other uh, organisations and bodies were making. I, I, I don't know whether I'm, I was aware of the, the specific ones you're, uh, you're, you're quoting to me there. We sought to factor all of that into our decision making. We extended uh, testing uh, to care homes and to a range of other uh, settings as we built up testing capacity. When, however, we, we didn't think that it was ever safe to rely only on testing for the, the reasons that even if we accept asymptomatic transmission happens, there is and was doubt about the reliability of tests to detect the virus in people who were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. When I was preparing for today's session, I, on the, the day 
I think the 21st of April when Jean Freeman made the statement in Parliament <coughs> extending uh, testing to all admissions from hospital to care homes, the advice that was still coming to us at that point was sceptical about uh, testing and a concern that it would take away a focus on isolation and other infection prevention and control uh, means. And so we factored all of this in to our decision making and on this, as on other things, tried to make the best decisions that we could in the circumstances we were in at the time. Were you aware of recommendations made in April 2020 to the Scottish Government in relation to the restriction on visiting care homes being increasingly disproportionate and failing to meet the pastoral needs and care uh, of individuals, care needs of individuals, and the traumatic effect this was having on families? And if so, how did this affect your decision-making process? In, in my experience and recollection, uh, the issue of care home visiting was one of the most uh, difficult um, because I was aware of the increasing uh, distress and trauma both to care home residents and to their loved ones of restrictions on visiting. And that was uh, an issue on which we were always trying to strike a balance between opening up and allowing uh, much more uh, flexibility in terms of visiting, but trying to guard against infection uh, being in homes. I, I don't think we got that right, possibly at all, um, but it was not uh, because we didn't care. It was not because we didn't try to get that right. And I have had in the past, I have at the moment, uh, relatives in care homes myself. I, I understand, or I can, I think I can understand how awful that would have been for any family with a loved one in a care home at that time. And when the United G Kingdom government changed its policy in relation to care home testing on the 15th of April 2020, why did that not cause the Scottish government to consider its position or review it? Uh, we were considering and reviewing our position at that time. I, I, I think I'm getting the, the date right that on the 21st of April, uh, Jean Freeman announced uh, a, 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 a range of different things, including care home testing. So our position uh, was under a, regular, a constant ongoing review and assessment at that time. It is clear from the necessity of setting up the nosocomial review group in May 2020 that the Scottish Government realised that hospital-acquired infection was a particular risk. Can you explain why it was decided to set up this body early in the pandemic? Uh, because we understood, uh, both from the emerging experience in COVID, but also from uh, wider experience around hospital infection, the, the particular risks of nosocomial infection in hospitals. And we were uh, seeking to make sure that on an ongoing basis, there was expert advice and uh, consideration given to how those risks could be reduced in hospitals. Just going back to your statement, uh, which I didn't take, take you to again, uh, we looked at the, at the beginning of questioning. In paragraph 455, you refer to uh, the advice at that time was that the limitations of PCR testing for asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases may result in false assurance, and therefore the focus should be on infection prevention and control measures. Further, that the fact that there was limited availability of testing capacity in March 2020 and the World Health Organization guidance at the time was clear that testing all hospital discharges was not the best use of available capacity while it was still being expanded. And yet very frail people with complex needs were being moved in circumstances where you were aware of the problems of asymptomatic transfer, pre-symptomatic transfer and the problems of false assurance. Why, therefore, was it considered in all these circumstances safer to move them at all? And would you have taken the same decision again, knowing what you know now? And if not, what would you have done differently and why? I would desperately try to find ways of um, managing the situation of elderly people in hospital who had, didn't have a medical need to be in hospital differently that would have... Uh, if not prevented, because in the face of what we were dealing with, I'm not sure prevention uh, absolutely would ever have been possible, but to mitigate and minimise 
uh, beyond uh, what happened in, in reality. I would do everything in my power, and I wish I could turn the clock back and do different things that would have uh, reduced the loss of life in care homes. But it wouldn't have changed a situation where leaving people in hospitals would not have been uh, an option that was without risk. We had, there was no sacromial infection uh, in, in hospital. There were COVID patients in hospital. We didn't, uh, thankfully, uh, face the, the, the overwhelming of hospitals yeah. in the way that had been seen in, in other countries at, at the start of the pandemic. But hospitals would not have been a risk-free environment for uh, vulnerable people either. And, and that's, the, that, that's the context in which these decisions uh, had to be made. And I, I, I desperately wish we could have had uh, the ability to do things in a way that didn't result in the outcome uh, that did materialise. And wouldn't the retention of those patients in hospital have been the best place to meet their medical needs rather than discharging them to care homes where they were putting other vulnerable uh, people in harm's way? Anybody who had a medical need to be in hospital should have been in, in hospital. We were talking um, about discharge of people who didn't have a medical need to be in hospital. Um, and discharge to their own home or, or to a care home uh, was considered to be uh, was, was considered to be better than keeping them in a hospital environment that in itself would not have been without risk of COVID transmission. Um, that was the advice at the time. These were the judgments that were made at, at the time. And yes, I think it would have been. Uh, I would. I wish we had been able to introduce testing earlier, um, more comprehensively. But I don't think that, in and of itself, would have removed the risks of care home admission. And that's why I'm saying I think there are other, a variety of other issues that also need to be properly considered in terms uh, of the the circumstances of discharge. To, to care homes, um, but I, I don't. I, I don't think I can sit here and say that keeping people in hospital would have been without risks, or certainly that at that time would not have seemed to me to be the, the situation. One final question, uh, Ms. Surgeon. Were there any discussions about what would happen if the criminal trial of the former First Minister Alex Salmond was still ongoing at the time of lockdown? And did the fact that it was have any effect of the timing of the lockdown being put in place in Scotland? Uh, no. Thank you, my lady. Those are my questions. <coughs> thank you, Mr McCaffrey. That completes the evidence for today. Yes, thank you, my lady. Uh, thank you very much, Sturgeon. I don't know if I can guarantee that we won't be calling upon you again, but I know we've already called upon you twice, but um, it's probably unlikely. But thank you anyway for your help today. I notice some members of the public gallery are distressed. Please don't forget there is support available if you need it. Very well, 10 o'clock tomorrow, please. Thank you, my lady.